Hey, Andrew. <laughs> hey, Hong. How's it going? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Hey, so this is being live streamed right now. Um, I'm That's just going to cool. update the website with the link. And we're just doing You just it. updated it. Uh, I, I'll do it right now, and maybe you can just okay. take, see if it's working. And then I'm yeah, just doing sure. a few other tech issues. Um, and then I'll, uh, I'm glad to hear that it's working on your end, though. <laughs> oh, screen share right now. Yeah, right yeah, it's. Thanks. Yeah, it works pretty nicely. Great. Yeah, we only have the Zoom link on the website. And that's Zoom link. Oh, sorry, I'll update it a second, Hong. Uh, one, one second. Okay. Yeah, sure. By the way, that Zoom link uh, requires logging. Okay, Hong, uh, the live stream link should be up on the website now. Let, let me know if you're able to access it and it looks okay. <laughs> okay. The one last issue is they haven't given me an adapter I need to use the, the micro, to connect the microphone to Zoom from the room, but I'll let you know when that happens. 
Okay. <clears throat> but for the other presenters, will they be able to connect to their microphone? Yeah. So um, there, we're, we, there's an external microphone here, uh, and if it works, it's just going to constantly be on, so they won't have to set up their microphone. Mm. One thing they'll have to do though is screen share. And uh, if you notice that like there's a problem with screen sharing or somebody didn't share yeah. their sound or something, maybe you can just um, sure. Yeah, especially if there's sound that's playing on their laptop. Great. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, might be potential issues. <laughs> yeah. So if any of those come up, just just um, maybe you could remind them. We'll, we'll be able to hear yeah. you. Okay. Uh, by the way, yeah, I just checked the live stream link and it works pretty oh, nicely. Great. Okay, thanks. So I'm good. I'm done with the uh, the hybrid stuff then. So great. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you for uh, for testing. That. So, uh, Okay, so this this um, microphone doesn't show up on my. Can someone on Zoom talk? Just we want to test the audio here. Anyone on Zoom want to talk? Uh, Z Win, do you want to talk? I see you have your, your video on. Just so we can test something out. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. Did you say something? I can't hear you. Can you go back to the um, Oh, oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, great. This is there now. Okay. Sorry. Can you say something again, C1? Can you hear me? I think we, I thought I heard something. Can you, can, no, you... can you go back, Andrew? I think oh, sorry. Um, the maybe there's some is problem on my side. Oh, okay. Sorry. Can you, can you say one more thing? Uh, test, test. Okay. All right, that's Speakers, that's, yeah. that's not going to that. Sorry, we're just debug. You can't see us. We're debugging some AV issues here. All right. Uh, do you have any kind of audio you have play on there? Uh, oh, actually, he's going to keep. Uh, let me just. Uh, yeah. So, can somebody over Zoom say something? Um, probably external headphones. Oh, oh, microphone. I see. I see. Yeah. Probably Mac. Uh, okay. Anybody on Zoom? Um, can Can you just say something? We want to see if we can hear your voices. Test. Test. Oh, it looks like somebody's trying to talk, but we can't hear them. Where? Can you hear me? Oh, oh, wait. I think I heard something. Can you say that again? Maybe the volume is just down low. Yeah. Oh, great. Yes, can you yes, help can me? You. Yes, we okay. can. Thank you so much. Okay, nice. great.
Me too. Is that? Yeah. Is it right. Me too. No. Is that? Should I? What was that? No, 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 no. Uh, okay. So Emi, just, Emi too is that little box up there. So actually, we can use that. Yeah. It's looking for it. But so, let's let's test it though. Oh, you uh, see you see stuff right there. I do. Yeah. All right. So just can people? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh. Just, uh, just apply for one second. Uh, he said something. Hong, can can you hear us? Yeah, look, it's popping up right Yeah, there. I can hear. Yes, yeah, I can it, hear you. Sounds good. Awesome. Yeah, it's great. Okay, great. Right. So, you got? I I think we do. Thank you. Uh, no but maybe, I think. Okay, I think it's fine. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. The only thing is, I can't make this full screen, right? Because it's Google Drive. Not if so I'm, I'm just going to set up my, my. Do I other... have to share to Zoom? Oh, sorry? Do I have to share to Zoom? I think that's the only way to do it, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, do you want to use my computer? No, it's just okay. anyone who has their presentation on Google Slides will not be able to share to Zoom and get it full screen. But it's okay. It's just the oh, tab see, at the see. top. I think it's fine. Okay. Okay. I'm going to leave okay. now. There should be a wait for you Wait, where did my laptop go? Oh, All right. okay. So, so, okay. So, you. Uh, and then. Okay, so. What? Let's make this slide change. If you wanted to, if you're originally planning to use your slides, but you no longer can, can because of the setup, um, email me your slides and you're going to go first. So, we'll change the order of slide way. So, then we'll, 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 we'll have everybody who uses my computer. Some extra extra work. So if it's possible, that'd be great if you could send me your slides and present on my computer. And then you're gonna go first. I'll just put my computer up and we'll just go through everyone. And then we'll transition to the people who have reports. So um, if you were originally planning to use your own computer, just send me your slides over email and we'll we'll uh, we'll go through with that. Sound okay? <laughs> So we're setting your computer back up. That's that's right. Yep. Let me. Here, I'll get this stuff. Oh, oh yeah. Actually, let me set that up. Here it is. Let's see. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Lucina. I'm professor at the Duke University of Frankfurt and affiliate professor at them. Okay. Okay. Oh, put this here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, try again. IBM Watson AI Lab. And today I want. Okay, that's good. All right. Um, and then I'm just going to download everybody's stuff. Okay. And change the order. Just remember that this is got a plug in. So I think. Well, yeah, you got, you got an old one. Oh, this is a new one. It's a new one. It's a new one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. oh wait. There's there's now feedback with this. Uh, should is it maybe from? Uh, uh, Sorry. Did somebody said they sent me the slides. Communication to the way. No. Uh, you should be all this slide. Anyway, you were also okay. Okay. This is the delay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Just the delay of that. Oh, you okay, just got it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so how many of these? Can I expect? I think it's just two, right? Oh, you, you also? Okay. Yeah, I should 
I got one from Ben. Anybody else? There should be three, I think, total. Okay, great. All right, so in the meantime, all right, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I'm sorry for the technical issues. Uh, as you can see, there's quite you know complicated setup here <laughs> to get sound working. I apologize for that, uh, but I'm really excited to see everyone in person here. Just to give you a quick overview for the day, we're going to have uh, two paper sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, that are covering the different uh, uh, papers that people submitted to the workshop, and in between there will be some invited talks. Uh, in the morning, um, Arsha Negrani and Jeanette Bogue will be speaking. Then after lunch, uh, David Brang Cart and Carl Vondrick will be speaking. After that, we're going to have invited paper talks. These are mostly just you know, papers at CVPR uh, about sight and sound um, that, that are relevant for, for the workshop. Also some other recent work on archive. Um, and then finally, in, in the evening, there'll be two talks. Uh, by uh, Hilda Kuhn and uh, Pedro Morgan. And you know, before we get started, I want to thank all of the, my, the other organizers here. Um, in particular, I want to thank uh, Arsha, Daffy, and Rohan, and, and Hong, who have been dealing with a lot of uh, technical issues and who have been doing a lot of work uh, throughout the conference. You'll, uh, you, you'll see them later on today uh, chairing different sessions. And if you have any sort of technical issues, the person to ping is Hong. He should be over Zoom, and you can just send him a chat. Great. So, um, so as I mentioned, there's a slight change of plans. If you were originally planning to use your laptop, send me an email. And I still only have one. I still have one from Ben. So. I need the uh, that's is it just a, if it's just a Google slide, you could also just send send me the link. Oh, you sent me a link, okay. Okay, yeah, that's weird. And the um the location of the posters should be near the catering area. I think it's the DE area in the in the lobby. Yeah, the, the lobby of the DE area. Um you can uh you we will we'll have Throughout the day, uh, you're welcome to present your poster during any of the breaks, and in particular during the lunch session. Again, this is, uh, the poster session is also optional. Um, the, the, the main event will be the, the talks. Oh, thank, thank you, Gloria. I just got yours as well. Okay, I think there's a third one that I haven't gotten. Yet. I, I sent it to you. You sent it to me? Okay. Oh, Google Drive. Oh, I just got yours. Okay, perfect. Okay, so in this first session of the uh, of the paper presentations, we're going to, to have a slight change of plans. The people who emailed me, you're going to go first, and then we're going to have a Q and A session after that, and then we'll transition to the other people who submitted their the presentation over CMT.
Okay, so first up is going to be. Oh, and I, I should say, by the way, it's a, a five minute presentation. Um, and there will be no questions afterwards. Uh, the, all the questions will come up uh, during the Q&A sessions, and there'll be several that will be presenting at once. Uh, finally, also, I want to check uh, the people who are over Zoom um, who are presenting at this session. Is anyone doing a live Zoom presentation of their, uh, of, of their during the 9 a.m. session? Who all is doing that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's get started then. Uh, first up will be learning sound localization better from semantically similar samples. I'm sorry, did you want, actually, did you want to do it over PowerPoint or? or... Uh, just like representation. I mean, okay. Presenter, presenter. Okay. Sorry, excuse me. Could you share the screen? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm just, we're just getting it set up right now. Okay, thanks. Sorry for that. I'll, I'll let you know, and then um, Hong, maybe you can you can let us know if there are any issues. That yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. okay. And uh, uh, the next up will be Ben and then Gloria. Uh, okay, I don't here you go. <laughs> there you go. Oh, good, good, okay, good. Uh, uh, oh, wait, so, uh, oh, oh, I need to do the screen share on this one, sorry. Uh, one second. Yeah, sorry, one second. So does mic works? Okay, good. Let's start. Okay. Yeah. Hello everyone. Um hey, today I will present our work learning sound localization better from semantically similar samples. Um this was like published in ICAST 2022. My name is Jun Sik. Um this work was done in equal contribution with Arda Senosa, I'm going to you and the professor is a fun. So the goal in sound localization is to design a model that predicts sounding sources in a visual scene. To answer this question, audiovisual sound localization field is like recently growing fast with lots of important works. But among these works, most of recent deep learning based approaches use contrastive learning. So, Existing audiovisual works use contrast learning by assigning corresponding audio visual signals from the same video source as positive pairs, while randomly selected mismatched pairs as negatives. Ideally, this is possible because the audio and the image that comes from the same source are likely to be corresponding to each other, while the audio and image from different sources are likely to be less relevant. So, however, in practice, this random selection can cause first negative pairing that contains semantically similar samples to the negative pairs. Therefore, like these false negatives have a harmful effect on the model training. We also make another important interesting observation about the response maps of semantically similar samples. So semantically similar samples can give similar response maps to the corresponding audiovisual pairs. So let's look at some examples. We will keep the image same. Uh, like fixed and then pair it with different audios. So this attention map is obtained with using an audio visual pair from the same source. And here the core image is like same and it is paired with symmetrically similar audio but from different video source. So the obtained localization response is very similar to the original pairs. And as expected, pairing with unrelated audio gives random results. 
So from this observation, our idea in this work is to explicitly mine symmetrically similar samples to a query audio visual pair. And using their multiple response maps directly in the contrast of learning with multiple positives rather than single positive item. So now let's see um, how we solve the, these positive samples. Like as a first step, we obtain a set of unlabeled features from training set for each modality by using um, some pre trained models, let's say pre trained um, self supervised sound localization model, or it can be pre trained ResNet trained on the internet or VGG sound network trained on audio modality. So after that second, for every sample of the training set, we compute the just um, K nearest neighborhood by using feature distance, in our case, for sense similarity. And next, we select positive samples randomly within that neighborhood. This process is repeated for both audio and visual modalities. Therefore, we obtain positive samples from each modality for the query pair. So note that existing self-supervised method in computer vision constructs positive pairs from a single instance by applying data augmentation. In our case, we use semantically similar but different instances as positives. So this figure illustrates our model architecture. After selecting hard positive samples, we construct four different positive pairs and multiple way more number of different negative pairs. So because of these additional positive pairs, our model is learned with like um, four times more supervisions, oh, three times more supervisions. So these computed response maps are directly used in contrastive learning formula. So these are some qualitative results on VGG SS data set and like the, the computing method. And these are results on weaker test data set. So the middle one is the proposed method. And the proposed method like achieve competitive performance on both VGSS and sound weaker test data set. So in our previous um, ICAS submission, um, we used pre-trained self-supervised sound localization network to find nearest neighborhood for audio and visual modalities. So this was originally referred to numbers. And we, we just replaced this network with pre-trained ImageNet and VG Sound Network. And we just um, recently renewed the new experiment with a significantly higher performance. So I'm just introducing the numbers here. Yeah. So in this paper, we observed that semantically similar samples can give similar response maps to the corresponding pairs. So from this observation, we propose how to find semantically similar samples and incorporate them into contrastive learning. And this is different from widely used of supervised contrast learning, where augmentation plays a major role in constructing positive pairs. And the proposed method achieved um, state of the art performance on the standard benchmark. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, Ben. And just to check, is everything going smooth over Zoom? If you're able to hear it. Okay, I think that is a yes. Okay, so. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Ben. Um, this uh, overwork is entitled Audio Visual Event Localization, a well recursive joint co attention. Uh, this is a joint work by. Uh, uh, in Noitech and Cisco, uh, my advisor is here. So for a short introduction, so what is an AVE? So if uh, the, if the definition of AVE is given a video sequence, an AVE is defined as an event that can both be heard and seen. So our task is trying to use both audio and visual information to predict whether an input video has an AVE and what is that AVE event? For this particular uh, purpose, we propose an approach using recursive fusion with joint co-attention mechanism to tangle different uh, re uh, representations from different modalities, i.e. here is uh, audio and visual. 
So for our motivation, um, first of all, in, multi, uh, in multi-model learning, fusion is one key challenge. Uh, and second one is uh, the core attention mechanism uh, allows for mutually attending of feature from different modalities. Uh, such uh, in, by intuition, we could uh, draw like a more robust representation for the later later uh, task. And here comes the question. So will our uh, recursive representation fusion help a model to learn uh, this robust uh, uh, re representation uh, by our intuition? Uh, here comes our uh, methodology. This is our general architecture. If you look at the middle part, uh, our joint co-attention layer allows uh, allows uh, two different modalities to uh, to attending to each other uh, by multiple times, of course. So uh, uh, technically, we can repeat this process like uh, 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 multiple times, but um, here we are using more like uh, um, we are for each, for each different different layer. We are not reusing the we are not reusing the uh, uh, the encoder. So basically, uh, the the memory usage will will grow. Uh, but if we haven't explored the if we are reusing the encoder, uh, what is the performance? That's part of the uh, future work, though. So for quantitative results. Uh, we test uh, only on the on the on one data set that is called I think is it, it is proposed in ECCV 2018, but we uh, compare with different uh, methods here. So among of all of them, our method reaches reach to uh, to the state of the art. And here are, and here are some qualitative results. As we can see. Uh, uh, both different uh, different representations allows to better uh, capture what is what is the AVD inside the video. If you can uh, see the attention map in the in the third line, so basically we can we can even do we can even capture uh, two different uh, I mean two different locations within the within the uh, within the video um, that 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 has have the same uh, AVE event. If you look at the uh, uh, top of uh, the, the bottom right, there are two uh, locations that indicate a uh, playing guitar. And here are some more qualitative results. Uh, we show uh, the attention map that is drawn, that are drawn from uh, both uh, representations. So if you can see there are different uh, AV events like a baby crying, you, you can see the our model really uh, pays attention to the to the location that that, that is both heard, that is can be both heard and both and, and can be seen. So so this is a kind of like a proof of uh, the our our joint co-attention mechanism really works. And here comes our conclusion. So uh, first of all, all, we propose a recursive fusion method. And also uh, the intensive experiments demonstrate the effectiveness. And uh, thank you. And you had a Google slide, right? Okay, good, good. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't. Oh, oh, I should. Okay, I'll do that. Great. Hello. Uh, this is a joint work with Nika Tesca Dandan, who was not able to come, and Juan Montesinos, who is here as well. So, first, let me define the problem we want to address. Given a video with a human face, and a voice. Our aim is to estimate if the frames and the voice are synchronized or not. And for that, we train a model in a self supervised way by using positive and negative pairs. This is the model we propose. It is basically a multimodal transformer which ingests both audio and visual features. 
The audio features are extracted from male spectrogram by using 2D convolutions with the skip connections. Then the visual features are extracted from frames crop along, around the lips and using 3D convolutions and skip connections. Then the core of our model is the multimodal transformer that we denote as vocalist for vocal lip sync transformer. And it's formed by three cross modal attention blocks. The first one, yellow, uh, the, there the role of the source and target modalities are swapped between them. And we address two different domains, speech and singing voice. So first, let me show you with an example, what are the differences between both? We will listen to the same content, first spoken and then sung by the same person. Oops, sorry. So. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Oh, 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 Il va, il va, Have noticed, yeah. have noticed. The baseline methods. And we have considered different context window sizes. We can notice across all methods that the results improve when we increase the, the context. And in all cases, we get the, the best results. Here, for some, some results on singing voice with the Acapella data set. Again, we consider different context sizes. Here, we can notice that the uh, results on the accuracy are worse than in the case of a speech. This happens because synchronization, the synchronization task is harder in singing because of these sustained phonemes. And here we can also notice that the margin improvement when we increase the context size is larger than in a speech. And finally, we show how the visual features learned for this supervised task in synchronization are useful for the task of singing voice separation. So here we have, a, we have a mixture with different voices. There is some audio here as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
I think I think it should work. I think I fixed it, but yeah. Um, I think I think you should try playing it. Oh, it was playing. It was playing. Oh, oh, you were. But okay. it, we didn't hear it. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Um, Okay, okay, try, okay, I think, ah, okay, let's do that again. It's the board corresponding to the target rate. Okay, there are three more. Okay, okay, <laughs> coming. And for that, we have taken uh, the Ynet, which is basically a unit conditioned on visual features. First, I will play two results with the Ynet using two different subnetworks, visual subnetworks that have been trained from scratch in order to, to solve the source separation task. One more. <laughs> now I will show the results using the, the same unit, but now with the pre trained visual features from the synchronization task. It's better in the last one, especially in the silence part where we get less interferences. So for quantitative results on source separation, please refer to our paper or our poster. And you have more demos and very soon the code as well in our project webpage. Thank you. Great. Well, guys, for the technical issue there, I'll, I'll, do, I'll continue with this, this setup for the morning session, but then hopefully the afternoon session will have a different solution.
like I kind of like did in paper some in paper um, experiments and like indeed somehow like heuristic filtering of those data sets do help training model. But um, in general, when you train in really large scale, um, I think like proper loss design with some regularization would be enough to handle those cases. But yeah, it really depends on the data distribution. But from my previous experiences, like so far, um, the models are dealing it with implicitly, but explicitly dealing with those problems would definitely improve the performance. He said that. Other questions? Uh, thanks so much. I, I, any other questions? Yeah, if not, I, I had a question. Um, I was wondering what, what you think the, there is a, on the, in the second paper. Um, uh, or, or uh, yeah, <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the use of, of semantics for um, sound localization. I, I was kind of curious to what extent you think you can get by with just semantics alone and how much you need sound. Yes, for you, yes. So, so, um, so I, I'll try to restate your uh, question. Yes. So your question probably be, how much uh, does the network training re rely on the uh, semantics of the sound and the uh, and, uh, images? Is that the question? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so, um, so our, our, intu our, our intuition is actually drawn from like the correspondence uh, between uh, the audio, uh, audio representation and uh, image of a representation but from our experiments um uh this uh this correspondence sometimes can be rely uh, unreliable so so that's uh if you look at the numbers of the experiments so that's why the the uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the accuracy of predicting the category can be uh around like uh, 60 ish so basically I think there are still uh, some room for improving the improving the uh, correspondence uh, of these two uh, of these two modalities. That there is definitely uh, definitely room for that. Uh, we haven't figured out a way to do that um, for now. So yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are there any questions for the speakers? Well, if not, let's thank them again. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the normal schedule. Um, all the people who submitted their presentations to CMT um, are now going to be, be covered here by Daphne. And there's one little wrinkle we found here, which is that um, uh, if, if you're present, if you're playing sound, there seems to be a lot of feedback. The way this setup is, is working, so just tell Daphne when that happens, and he's going to I'm just going to mute, mute the... this. Soon. And he's yeah. going to turn the volume up on this simultaneously and then the other way around. So just like, just let us know when you're going to play. Sound. I know that's not a great setup. We'll have something else in the afternoon to try to deal with that. I apologize for the, for the inconvenience. So yeah, great. I guess the first one is quantized. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So uh, first paper is quantized uh, gun for complex music generation from dance videos uh, presented by uh, Yeju. So, uh, good morning, everyone. So, I was first want to thank the efforts from our organizers and um, hope that every one of us can have a great time uh, in the in the following week after three years of online meetings. So, sorry, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Right. Can you yeah, you need to just share. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> um. Just find the. Oh, yeah. Exactly. We can. Oh, oh here. Uh, you can just unshare while you go through the Slack. So, uh, um, It 
Good, good. Yep. And then just do it from here. Should be the right link. I, I think it was just some Zoom thing. Okay. Yeah. That, okay, good, good. That good. Do it. Great. Yeah, you need to share audio. Recording and comment. And when you do the screen share, share audio. Click the, the checkbox. Yep, great. Awesome. Thanks, can you show me through? Is this? This looks okay. Uh, yep. Yep. You're doing. Oh, yep. Just to plug that in. You're doing the features. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. Um. Keep your volume up, and then when somebody plays sound, because you need to be so good. Thank you. So uh, my name is Ye Chu. I'm a PhD student from Illinois Institute of Technology. So today I'm going to present our work Quantize Again for Complex Music Generation from Dance Videos, which is a collaborative work with Snapchart and Princeton University. And uh, you can also refer to the uh, link here uh, for more code and uh, samples. Um, oh, so sorry, where's... Uh, we can. Uh, we are seeing your presenter's view. Are you able to swap the displays? Can you share the other screen? Oh, is it good? Yeah, now it works. Okay. So in this work, uh, our. Uh, in this work, our goal is to generate music from dance video input.
So we start by invest, investigating different user implementations. So as we mentioned here, most ex existing works that use symbolic music representations, such as 1D piano roll or 2D MIDI events, they can be used for synthesizing high audio quality signals. However, uh, it is limited that we have to specify a predefined instrument type and they are using the predefined standard music synthesizer for decoding back to uh, the raw audio domain. So in this end, we uh, aim to use a different music representation, with, which is a learning-based quantized vectors. So in this way, we can find a unified representation with relatively high compression ability as an intermediate way to uh, learn this kind of uh, uh, motion and visual as well as the audio mappings. So um, we propose a dance to music and framework which takes the motion input and also the video frames as input. And then we uh, fuse the, these two information uh, which is used later for generate the quantized event. And then we uh, uh, quantize, the vector, quantize the vectors. And then we perform a code, uh, code, book, code, code book lookup process and then use a learning based synthesizer to decode such music representations back to the all raw audio domain. So our uh, experiments are performed on two data sets. The first data set is AIST++, which is a subset of the AIST dance data set that are input dance videos filmed in a, a clean a studio environment. And also in addition to the uh, existing AIST++, we also collect our own TikTok dance music data set, which uh, includes the dance videos uh, uh, annotated and collected from in the wild uh, environment. And also as evaluations, because music is something that is relatively difficult to perform evaluations, so we try to uh, assess our uh, generated quality uh, from different musical aspects, in, including uh, the beats coverage and the beats heat, which measures the rhythm feature, and also the general accuracy in terms of the music type and diversity, as well as the uh, dance music coherence and also the overall music quality from both objective and subjective points of view. And here we show some qualitative examples of the generative music. And also as follow-ups, we actually also explore the proposed the dance to music generative task via the recent diffusion probabilistic models. Uh, so please also check our conditional discrete uh, contrastive diffusion project, which is a uh, relatively general uh, conditional framework that not only works for dance to music generation, but also uh, that can be used for text into image and other conditional generation tasks. And that's all for my presentation today. Thank you. And I think we, I think that's the, the very helpful AV tech. I think we finally fixed the audio issues. Fingers crossed. So you shouldn't need to do anything too funny when you play sound. So it should just work. All right, so let's separate a moment in here for the notification of the products. Let's uh, remark. Yes. Okay, so 
Hi everyone, I'm Roman Oiseau and I present the work we did with colleagues from uh, IRCAM, Imagine, and uh, my advisor, entitled The Model You Can See. Uh, well, it's, it's uh, running. Uh, maybe a Entitled The Model You Can Hear, Audio Classification with Stable Prospect. In this work, we propose to learn a classification model that relies on the reconstruction of input sounds by a very few prototypes. To this end, we assign to each class of the dataset a prototype that will be learned alongside gain and pitch transformations to reconstruct samples of this given class. Our goal in this paper is to classify large audio collections while relying on an easily hearable summary of them. Indeed, many recent methods rely on, on, only on high dimensional light and representation of the, of the inputs. And even though uh, those methods perform, often perform well, they are very difficult to interpret. In this paper, we adapted the transformation invariant clustering paradigm for audio in, an, in a supervised setting. We provide an audio classification model based on learned prototypical sounds that can be heard directly. Our model produces state of the art results for speaker and instrument classification while remaining easily interpretable. For each uh, input audio clip characterized by its log main spectrogram, each prototype provides a reconstruction of the input by being adapted in amplitude and pitch shifted. At training time, each prototype is assigned to a specific class, while at test time, we assign the input to the prototype that best reconstructs it. The reconstruction model is the following. Each learned prototype produces a reconstruction of an input at time t by being shifted in amplitude and in, and in pitch. In our model, both values of the prototypes and deformation networks are learned, uh, are learned parameters. So we train the model by supervising, by supervising jointly the reconstruction error of the code class and the cross entropy on the reconstruction so that each prototype specializes to its assigned class. After training, we can hear and look at the prototypes to get the essence, the timber of each instrument or speaker. We train our model on both the SOL and Negri speech dataset. And here you can uh, see five of the prototypes learned on those dataset. Learning those prototypes only for reconstruction, we get very good results at classifying audio clips compared to a simple convolutional uh, classifier, here denoted as a direct classification, and also compared to a network that compares the latent representations from a auto encoder to a learned latent prototype. To conclude, we adapted the transformation invariant clustering paradigm for audio in a supervised setting. And we provide an audio classification model based on learned prototypical sounds that can be heard directly. Our model will choose the state of the art results for audio classification tasks while remaining easily interpretable. And uh, you can see uh, on the website there are, there are learned prototypes that you can uh, go to uh, here, uh, here and look at them. I might take think of time, but maybe, uh, maybe we can wait to learn them. Uh, it works. Sure. Yes, perfect. So as I said, I can, I can uh, deform every prototype uh, using a, a, a gain and a pitch shift uh, profile. So we can learn, for example, for the clarinet, uh, the three deformed versions of the prototype. So here, so you just have the, the whole prototype without deformation. So it gets the essence of the, of the, of the instrument. And then you can, uh, and then you can apply any uh, deformation you want to uh, to, to look to hear at the uh, learn the prototype. And you can uh, you can play Mario CM before. So basically each prototype reconstructs uh, an, audio, an audio sample and you, you then uh, learn the essence of each uh, instrument. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> So next paper is uh, Audiovisual Logic Localization in uh, Hypercentric Areas, so Child Funk. Yeah. Uh, I have to extend my slides if you want to pull down or do you want me to do uh, okay. Do you want to visual up? No. Uh, okay. Uh, you might not want it. Okay. Yeah. Can, we, can we do next?
minutes, maybe in the yeah, how we skip you for that? Yeah, you, you might think you can just do it. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, uh, in that case, let's do uh, our next QA session. So, it's basically just like for those uh, two last papers. So, uh, are there any questions? Or if you do have a question, please come up to the mic. Yeah, so I had a question about the first paper. Uh, I was curious what cues you think the model is using to synchronize the music with the dance. So thank you for your question. Uh, so in terms of the uh, uh, like which attributes contribute to, uh, I think there is a difference. So in terms of the regions such as beats, which in correspondence between the dance and music, uh, we think the motion that the input plays a more important role compared to the visual part. However, in terms of the music genres in, uh, instead, I think uh, for that part, the visual uh, frames uh, could also be very helpful. Oh, does that answer? The yes, question? thank you. Thank you. Uh, very much. Just for this This is fun. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, cool paper. But also quick question. So I noticed in the example you played of the generated music that I was mostly hearing the beat being generated. So so I was wondering if you have had a chance to do any analysis or any thoughts about whether your model is also capturing harmonic components, you know, instruments and chords, or is it mostly generating uh, beat patterns? It's a, uh, so thank you for the question. It's a very insightful. Uh, actually, uh, in the preliminary results, we show that these are more easily to be captured, especially given the strong motion representation data as input. However, um, there may be the sound problem, but there's also the actually the least, uh, in, in addition to the reasons, but also the musical part that is along, uh, generated along with the beats, but which is kind of uh, uh, more difficult to hear in this case. So uh, we could invite you to look at our like, more samples and also uh, which kind of shows the other side. But uh, we agree that uh, in this case, especially given the, uh, the, the input from motion and dance, we think the motion part um, plays more important roles in the beat generation but the other can also uh, it's, it's also an interesting aspect to look at that picture thank you um are there any more questions so shall we go we're planning to be passive so we'll make them uh go to the next paper okay so the next uh presentation is a video one um it's uh, the paper is called the sound of motion, uh, multi model post motion destination from video models. Um, and I'll just play the video. Hi, my name is Tsi. Today I present the sound of motion, multi modal host motion estimation from videos and audio. Sound occurred everywhere. When we hear some sound, we can imagine the pose or the motion. For example, this is rooster crowing. And wolf howling. For horse trotting, we can imagine how the foot is stepping on the ground. But we may not imagine the appearance of the subject, like color or size, or the accurate location, or the tail movement of the subject. So this is why we also need visual information. Human experience the world through multiple sensory channels like vision, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. Image and videos are often used for 3D human shape and pose estimation. 
Many work studies the correlation between sound and motion. Much research stimulates the integration about videos and sound. However, there are few studies for animals. Our goal is to investigate multisensory integration to recover the 3D motion of horses. Our hypothesis is that audios can help to estimate more accurate poses. Because horses have half hoofs and strong bodies, and they can produce characteristic and significant sounds when moving. Our method is to use the Edge Small Model, a parameterized articulated 3D shape model that uses beta and theta for shape and pose estimation. We also propose two regression architectures for exploring audios as an additional information for regressing the edge small parameters. We have two blocks, one for visual input and another one for all modalities. We assume that during training, the network learns the correlation between main modality and auxiliary modality. We have text to fusion networks here to handle multi-modalities, the model fusion network and the early fusion network. The difference is that during testing, early fusion network needs both modality input, while the model fusion network can handle missing audio data. We also provide two baselines. One is image-only network, removing the audio channel. Another one is audio-only network, removing the image channel for pose estimation. The dataset we use contains videos, audio, and 3D motion capture data, recording horse subjects trotting on a tried mule. During training, we randomly pick three horses in dark colors. And during testing, we have two separate testing data sets. Test data 1 for the other three horses in dark colors, and test data 2 for a white horse. To show the network really learns from audio, we test the audio's only network with original audio and white noise. Capturing. From the table and the visualization results, we see that original audio outperforms the noise audio. The white noise will result in very rigid pose. We show a video example in test data 1 with all networks. We can observe that all networks perform similarly. We we'll show another video examples in test data 2. We we'll see that the image only and the early fusion network predict rigid legs, and the audios only network and the model fusion network can still predict reasonable poses. Here is the table of quantitative results, which shows that the fusion models for two modalities outperforms the single modality, implying that the audios benefit the 3D reconstruction. More discussion can be found in the paper. To summarize, we utilize the edge small model and propose two regression networks for multiple sensory integration. And we show that the complementary use of audios and videos help to improve the 3D poses estimation from videos. Thank you. So, uh, did you do this already? You have done this. Okay, so next paper is allowing sound utilization better from some other sample samples. So, yeah, so let's go. scalable videos to synthesis.
Uh, okay, so good morning, everybody. I uh, hope everybody is uh, doing well. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be presenting SDPS, which stands for Scalable Video to Speech Synthesis. Uh, my name is Rodrigo, and um, this is a recent uh, research project from our research group at Imperial College London. Um, yeah, so video to speech, as the name indicates, is basically going from video of a speaker's facial movements into the corresponding audio of what that person is actually saying from the silent video only, so no auxiliary uh, audio. Uh, as one can expect, this is a pretty hard task. Uh, it can be seen as like a step forward from lip reading, which is a task I think most should be familiar with. Uh, so instead of predicting just the text from the lip movements, we want to actually predict the, the audio, which means that we need to model uh, emotion, intonation, and all of these things that are not present in text. Uh, there are two, uh, in my view, really exciting things about this task. Firstly, is the fact that it can be trained on raw audiovisual data without any additional labels. This is unlike lip reading or text to speech, which require ground truth manual labels that have to be done by humans, and this is expensive, whereas we can just train on any uh, video of speakers that we find. Uh, and the second exciting thing is that there's a variety of uh, applications. Such as, for example, in video conferencing, if the audio is either absent, corrupted, or way too noisy, we can just um, replace it with the audio that we predict directly from the video. Or even this even has medical applications for people who can't produce voice speech. Uh, so we can use uh, this model to produce speech for them based on their lip movements. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of the current like uh, state of the art in video to speech. Um, so these are two works that came out in 2021. Actually, the one on the left is from us as well, and the one on the right came a few months later. And these were state of the art at the time when they were uh, presented. Um, so as you can see, the common trend here is that these training procedures are pretty common, complicated. Both of them have multiple losses. On the left, we have a bunch of comparative losses and an adversarial loss. On the right, we have an AV synchronization loss, multiple discriminators. We even have multiple generators. And this trend towards complex training procedures has been pretty consistent in video to speech literature in the, in the previous years. Um, obviously, this is in an attempt to produce better and better quality of audio. Uh, the problem with this uh, additional complexity that actually we experience ourselves in, in our work on the left is that it becomes harder and harder to scale this training procedure because we suffer, first of all, from slowness of training compared to a normal feed forward network because we've got all, all, all this fancy stuff. And secondly, um, we can experience a lot of training instability when having this complex training procedure, uh, training for a long time on lots of uh, data, especially in unconstrained settings. Um, so these works actually, and most video to speech works focus on small data sets such, such as grid. Uh, and although they produce uh, good results for that nowadays, um, this is a, it's a shame that they focus on small data sets because as I said in the previous slide, one of the most exciting things about video to speech is that it can be extended to any audio visual data so we can extend to really large data sets. Um, so our new work aims to uh, counter these shortcomings by presenting a simple architecture that we can easily scale to larger audiovisual data sets. So it's pretty simple. Basically, we train a video to spectrogram predictor uh, based on a ResNet plus conformer architecture, which is common in lip reading, for example. And then we use a linear projection layer to uh, project those encoded features into a spectrogram. Uh, so this is our end-to-end -end training. And during inference, we use a pre-trained vocoder to synthesize the waveform from the predicted spectrogram. And actually, one thing in our training procedure that I didn't mention is that we use a speaker encoder to model the voice characteristics that obviously can't be accurately derived from the video alone. Um, so by using the simpler architecture, we can much more easily scale, for example, to LRW, which have been approached before in video to speech, but we get uh, much better results than all previous approaches. So it's a, it's a substantial step forward. For example, in word error rate, we get less than half of any other of the previous approaches. And actually, we are the first work to extend uh, to uh, scale our method to LRS3, which is a substantial step forward in terms of, in terms of uh, scale uh, and in terms of uh, the constraints in the data set. Uh, and we actually experiment even by adding training data to LRS3 from Voxelet2 in a total of more than 1,500 hours of training data, 
just to see if our model continues to scale its performance with even more data. And we find that this extra training data still improves the performance on the same LRS3 test set, indicating that our model is keep scaling. Uh, but at the same time, we don't compromise. So on grid, we still achieve state of the art performance, meaning that we can be good on both smaller data sets and very big data sets by scaling our model accordingly. So I wanted to show a quick demo of our performance on, um, yeah, on bridge. If it doesn't work, we can try another link. Oh, is that it? Yeah. Okay, it looks like bin red R zero now. Bin red R zero now. Bin red R zero now. Bin red at L zero now. Bin red with K nine, please. Oh yeah. On the normal slides, I think it might be. Oh. R zero now. R zero now. Bin red R zero now. Bin red R zero now. Bin red at L zero now. Bin red with K nine, please. 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 Lay white at J one again. Lay white at J one again. Lay white in J one again. Lay white at J one again. Place green by U5 now. 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 Okay, so hopefully you could hear uh, those samples. There were some audiovisual uh, synchronization issues that had to do with the technical setup, not, not in the original video. So actually, you can check those samples on um, on our, our website, and we got a, a lot more samples where those came from. Uh, hopefully, you can tell that uh, in our model, the amount of artifacts and the is, is reduced, and the clarity of the audio is clearly improved. And uh, our full paper, uh, which was actually recently accepted to your speech, is also available on iPad now. And uh, yeah, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for watching my presentation. Thanks so much. No, I think it was pretty clear. Uh, like the, the, the last one sounded pretty good, but uh, yeah, sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Okay, uh, so the next paper uh, that is quantifying predictive uncertainty for stochastic feature synthesis from audio. Um, yeah, uh, go for it. Hello, everyone. Uh, um, Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chiran, I'm a researcher at Merle, and uh, um, today I'm going to talk about quantifying predictive uncertainty for stochastic video synthesis from audio. This is joint work with my intern, uh, Moitreya Chaturji, and uh, Professor Narendra Puja. Um, so in, in this uh, talk, I'm going to uh, present this uh, problem of uh, audiovisual imagination, where uh, it's, uh, it's an in the wild setting of uh, video generation from audio. So to set the context, we assume that there is uh, a set of initial frames that you you have seen, and that there is the whole sequence of the whole video, the audio of the of the video available to you. And the whole the problem is to synthesize in a in the wild setting the missing frames from the video by listening to the audio and uh, some initial frames to set the context. 
it's an extremely challenging problem uh, because there is no restriction on the setting that we assume. Um, but in, in the experiments, there are there is a limited thing because it's a, it's a very hard problem to solve. But uh, but in, we, in in general, we don't assume any restrictions with this uh, with the proofs that we we are going to present. And this is a problem which uh, has a lot of potential if it is solved properly. For example, in occlusion reasoning, you can hear some sounds from some from somewhere, and you want to make some decision on whether there is some catastrophe happening somewhere that you have to attend to immediately. So you have to imagine in your head what, what is happening by just listening to the sound and the context. And that's the kind of thing that we are trying to address. Um, so uh, we base our, our framework on our earlier work, which was published in uh, ECCB, which is called Sound to Sight. And there uh, we proposed these data sets for evaluating this task, and uh, as well as proposed a, 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 a model, a variational auto encoder sort of model, which learns a prior um, and of, from which you, you sample a latent variable, which is then used in a predictive prediction net network to synthesize a future frame uh, from a, a, a past seen frame. And uh, the key thing is that um, that predicted frame is is matched against a ground truth frame using a mean squared error um, uh, to, to train the whole model. And, um, and now we started asking ourselves, is a mean squared error the right kind of a model to, to, to train this network? If you have, if you assume that there is a lot of diversity in your uh, generation process. So here we show two examples. So there is a ground truth, which is in the first row. And then there is a possibility one of synthesis and the possibility two. And both of these are plausible, given the context of, uh, of the synthesis. Uh, but uh, if you use mean squared error for training the model, then possibility one will have a low loss and then low gradient. There is possibility two, which is also plausible, but uh, it will have a high gradient. And if you don't have too much data to train the model, then uh, the possibility two can actually uh, destabilize the training process. And um, uh, the model trained would not be generalizable because it poses the, the loss. The loss poses the learned model to always predict uh, things that are that are in the training set. So that uh, affects generalizability. So so we started thinking what exactly could be a solution to this. And uh, one option is to actually scale the MSA loss by uh, a factor which is corresponding to the diversity of the model. And what if you actually have a mechanism to predict the diversity by looking at uh, those initial frames? And so that's the approach. And the idea is to pr produce a, 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 a weight on the predictive ones, uh, of, uh, on the MSC loss. Um, so the, the, the contributions of the work are like a, a, a predictive uncertainty quantifier, which estimates the predictive uncertainty of the stochastic video synthesis model from audio. And PU, uh, the PUQ, which is the predictive uncertainty quantifier, is derived using a hierarchical variation equation setup. Uh, model, uh, we show experiments on the two data sets uh, that we use to solve the site uh, and show good results. Uh, so, um, essentially, we built on the uh, sound to site model and uh, have the, the prior and the posterior variation log encoder using where the, the prior is also learned along the, alongside the model. And um, the key contribution is this uh, top block called variance or encoder decoder, um, which takes as input the variances predicted by the prior and the posterior. That is a those sigma though there and produces an empty variable. Empty is a scalar that is going to scale uh, the MSC for uh, the predictive process. And looking inside this uh, yellow block, you we have another autoencoder that takes these of these variant variances and uh, that's an encoding decoding process. Uh, to, and so the encoder takes the, the covariances and produces a set of variables which are then used in a decoder and produces this empty, which is a scaling. Um, Mathematically, it looks like this. It, it's a complicated thing, but let's decompose it. So the idea is uh, to predict, produce this empty variable, which is a scaling which uh, which works on the x t, x t hat minus x t, which is the the, the MSC loss. And empty is derived from a, a, a variational on encoder that takes in a latent vector and produces empty. And this latent vector comes from the the prior, the learned prior, and um, and so the idea is essentially to, to learn to predict the uncertainty in the model and then use it to, uh, to scale MSC. And uh, the remaining parts of, the, of, the, of, the, of this math is, is similar to previous works where you have the AT, A, A1 to T, which is audio, and then the predicted video frames, and which produces a latent variable. And then that latent variable is then used to generate the future frames. And uh, we, we experimented with two data sets. MPSO is, uh, is a synthetic data set. With where a digit moves around, and then at some point in the in this uh, moving around process, there is a block introduced somewhere, which is unknown to the to the method, 
and uh, the idea is that when the when the digit hits the block, it produces a different sound. And uh, the, the, uh, the the problem is to synthesize where the, the block was introduced by just listening to the sound, and also uh, reconstruct the trajectory of the of the of the moving digit. And then the future plating is just to listen to the audio and then generate the the future plate. Um, and here anything? Uh, okay. I don't know. The videos are will be online, so it should be fine. Um, so the idea is to actually predict uh, the, the audio, the video from the audio, uh, and and we compare against uh, two other methods, one sound to sight, uh, which is S to S, and that doesn't have any variance prediction prediction on it. Um, and G and F is without any audio, and Q Q is the method that we propose. And we can see that the other methods are kind of saturate without the regularization from the audio and uh, and the variance. Um, and uh, we did some quantitative analysis as well, and uh, we see that uh, with, even with low, low data settings for training, this uh, method converges more faster than with previous methods. Um, and uh, this is the, the accuracy on the test set, um, and even on uh, the other data set, uh, it converges very fast and uh, gives better results. Um, that's pretty much it, and uh, the, 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 the data and the code are available. And, uh, you know, here we go. Okay, we'll do one more paper and then we'll do the next one. Uh, so the next one is also going to be the simulation. Paper title is Exploring Probabilistic Approach to Vehicle Sound Source Localization in Other uh, Scenes. And the presenter is Julia Wilkins. Hi, my name is Julia Wilkins, and today I'm going to be presenting Exploring a Probabilistic Approach to Vehicle Sound Source Localization in Urban Scenes. This work is a collaboration between New York University's Music and Audio Research Lab and Bosch Research. Automatic audiovisual scene understanding is a challenging problem space that explores questions such as how can we intelligently use audio and or visual data to train a system to interpret videos in the complex ways that humans do. Let's take a quick look at an example. These scenes can get complicated. We have multiple vehicles moving at once and even overlapping vehicles, which can be challenging in the context of sound source localization. Our work here builds upon the recent release of the Urbansis dataset and the proposed baseline method for localization in that work, which uses a binary representation of bounding boxes as the ground truth data, as we see here. When multiple overlapping vehicles are present in a scene, this method loses important information about the density of vehicles at a given position in the scene. Our goal is to estimate the location and density of sounding vehicles in videos of urban scenes, using stereo audio only as input to our model. We focus on predicting a Gaussian representation of bounding boxes of vehicles in the data. So why would a probabilistic representation of bounding boxes be advantageous? One advantage here is that a probabilistic representation allows us to retain information about the scene when multiple overlapping vehicles are present, something that can be lost in both vision methods alone and in methods when bounding boxes are mapped to regions. Additionally, we no longer attempt to map vehicle sound to a box or a quantized region and explore perhaps a more realistic representation of vehicle sound production. 
To tackle this problem, we introduce probability density localization, or PDLoc. The input to our system is stereo audio from videos in the Urbansis dataset, which contains over a thousand videos of urban traffic scenes containing bounding box annotations and corresponding audio. We extract logmail spectrograms and GCC FAT features from the audio, and then pass those features to a three-layer CNN, followed by a single recurrent layer. The model is then trained to predict a Gaussian representation of vehicles in the video over time. As shown in the output image here, we first map bounding boxes to individual Gaussian distributions, using the center horizontal point of each bounding box as the mean of the distribution, and fixing the standard deviation. We sum the Gaussian curves in a given frame, and normalize such that the final distribution is still a true probability density function, as shown in the black curve here. We stack the frames of a video over time, such that the model can predict the frame-by-frame -frame location and density approximation of vehicles in each video. Now I'll show some results and analysis. We chose to compare our method with a traditional signal processing approach, beamforming, as a baseline. In terms of detection, our method outperforms beamforming across the board. This is likely because our model is trained to discriminate traffic sounds from non-traffic sounds, while beamforming does not have any prior knowledge of types of sound sources. On the task of localization, we also outperform beamforming. These results show promise in that learning-based methods, where the model has access to not only audio information, but also a mapping to an intelligent representation of visual data, offers advantages over traditional signal processing approaches. In the future, we plan to provide additional baseline comparisons to our proposed approach. However, this has proved quite challenging, as there are not prior works that predict a probabilistic representation of sound source position. And because of this, the output of either our method or of a comparative method typically would need to be boiled down in a way that such a comparison is possible. Let's take a quick look at a qualitative example that highlights some successes and challenges in our proposed model. Focusing on the ground truth ga Gaussian representation in white and our predicted model output shown in blue. We notice that overall, our model is conserved in, in predicting peak height. Recall that we constrain each distribution to a PDF, so when more vehicles are present, peak height is naturally lower. For example, in frames 3 and 5, we're able to localize a single vehicle very accurately, but struggle while pre when predicting a taller, single peak. In frames 2, 6, and 7, when two vehicles are present at the same time and slightly overlapping, we lose some fine grain localization but capture peak height with more success. We believe the challenge in accurately predicting peak height is due to a high presence of frames without vehicles in our training data. We also constrain these distributions to a true PDF, resulting in a uniform distribution and likely influencing model output, especially in moments of uncertainty. Overall, we've shown here that training a model to predict a probabilistic representation of bounding boxes can produce intriguing results in both sound source localization and in density approximation. This work also highlighted difficulties of working with a small data set, which only amplified our challenges with the high presence of MB frames in the data. In the future, we hope to apply the proposed method to additional urban scene data sets. Additionally, as future work, we would like to explore a multi-test modeling setup, splitting detection and localization to address the bias towards empty frames, or perhaps experimenting with a fully parametric approach. Lastly, we plan to work on further interpreting our model output such that it could be used for something like car, car counting in the future. Thank you. So uh, that's a pretty nice session for the last uh, four papers. Uh, so are there any questions? So I have a question about the synthesis. I was wondering how to the results of the work and the so I was wondering that if it's about the expressiveness and the expressiveness of the network to more of any uh, speaker or, or any learning that you get to do the body, or if it's more about the quality of the data set properly, which is way more than
So uh, the next paper is also a video presentation. Oh, sorry. So the next paper uh, is called uh, Semi, Semi Supervised Exploration via Multi Sensory Group. Efficient exploration is a long standing problem in reinforcement learning, especially when extrinsic rewards are used or missing. A popular solution to this issue is to fit an agent with novelty signals. Efficient exploration. Oh, I did. Uh, here I did. Oh, is that not what you're Who is speaking? What speaker? That one? What, what's, what's not working? It's a long standing problem in sharing. reinforcement learning, especially when extrinsic rewards oh, are usually yeah, sparse. Or... I, I switched the computers. Oh, so people can okay. If people can hear our voices, can they hear? Wait, so this is here. Missing. Intuitively, each multi-sensory agent in the world should acquire multiple sensory information at the same time. Under the reinforcement learning framework, the agents should find some relation between multi-sensory inputs in the same time step. To maximize a new novelty signal, multi sensory incongruity and learning, okay. especially when extreme. Wait, so, what is this? What is this? Hmm? Was it? Oh, yeah, can you go to the website? And yeah, this one is the issue with the video. Okay, yes, yeah, so maybe it's just the video. Let's just go and do that. Yeah, let's let's skip that video then for now. So we can let's email them. Great. So every, everyone can hear did everyone hear that sound over Zoom? Uh yeah, we'll, we'll yes we can. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry about that. Let's just go to the next paper. Um uh, for the data type of the sound of the stereo or the visual navigation. Um uh, Is that okay? Uh, I see? That wasn't working. I tried. Yeah, just uh, they should be able to hear through the. Uh, yeah, it's picking up so right now. Next uh, stage, uh, that is the case. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you later. Thank you. Okay, we can hear the video. Just make sure. All right, just make sure. All right. Okay. Good. Uh, hi, my name is Yamoling, and today I would like to present our work to clear efficient and long range video retrieval using time sound. And this is the joint work with JLA on long differential and get us the type. So what makes the long range video retrieval so important? So uh, as we mentioned, uh, human action usually so complex and uh, the video uh, spending time on it. So for example, as you want to assume you want to know how to make a friend pot for breakfast, the video is quite very long. So that is hard to understand such the uh, long content in the video. So also you may search the such the content. So like a uh, uh, preferred part in YouTube, you can see a lot of uh, a lot of the video uh, resource. So that is very important to understand the the information in the long range video. 
So in this case, uh, we if given a uh, given a text description, we want to the model to uh, retrieve the corresponding video. So for the prior work, uh, they almost uh, work on the short range video. It's like uh, maybe one to ten second in duration. So almost imagine that because the uh, video usually very expensive to process. So that is because the uh, uh that is because as you can see here, there are a lot of uh, redundant content that between turn and turn. So as you can see here, the the video the image content are pretty similar. So if you want to process so all this information, it's very expensive to process. So so that is the output benefit behind it. We want to use the uh, audio signal to 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 content this control uh, video dynamic. And also audio is much more efficient in the process uh, this information. So in this case, the uh, as you can see here, the, the conventional long range video have to like sample a lot of video. But if you plus audio, you can just uh, sample fewer video events plus audio signal that that can uh, capture the the temporal information. So all uh, all method is uh, adapt from the recent clip model, and we we adapt the clip model into an audio video one to process the the long range video test. And in our model, we have the three kind of main components: is the text, video, and the audio encoder. And the text encoder encodes the the texture uh global information of it. And for the audio and video encoder, it takes takes the video input and the audio input here. So so we can compute the uh comparative loss uh, between audio visual representation and the text text representation. And in our extreme model, we uh, let, we propose the uh, uh, A to B module and B to A module. So for the A to, A to B module here, we use the audio information to support the visual information. And then for the video to B to A module, we use the uh, visual, visual information to refine the audio information. So we evaluate our uh, approach on the Activity capture data set and the data set it has a long range video, it's about like three minutes, and also it has uh, the corresponding uh, text description. So we evaluate another method in the standard uh, text, text to video uh, metric and the video to text metric. So, so as you can see here, yeah, all methods are uh, based the uh, recent days of sales ground method for the book list. And uh, we only use the half the video number of a uh, video. And also, we we uh, verify our our method on the several different data sets here. The first is the QB highlight, and the the, the video rendering point long is like a minute, and for the demo, and YouTube two and the array. And also, in the inference time, we have a lower Q plus compared to uh play for play model here. So uh that is the quantitative re uh resource here. So in the text text uh, input here, uh they are described by uh the a person playing piano near near the window. So our model because our model takes the audio as input so we can merely recognize the the probably uh someone playing violin. But for the baseline, because the, it's a vision only model, so we can only like uh, capture the the contents of a window, but it cannot uh, capture the the sound, so it gives the wrong resource resource here. So that is conclusion here. So our model can leverage the audio as a complementary information that can reduce the redundancy of the video. And also, our, our, our method can generalize on several diverse long range video benchmarks. And there is more detail for our web. You can find more detail on our project page. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, and let's move to the last uh, 
favor of the session. Um, Okay, so uh, the website is all the video of the organization and the simple videos. Once again, please come on. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Carlos, and today I am very glad to present our work on audio visual optimization in the implementation video. So, this work is collaborating with Yahoo Chan and Rag and NFC. So, uh, let me first introduce the task here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So our task here is to localize the sound objects in the Egocentric uh, video by giving a video and synchronized audio frame. And you can find that in this example, the sound object is the fine tank. However, compared to the audio visual localization in certain certain videos, it would be more difficult to localize sound objects in Egocentric one since we may encounter some real problem. So first, uh, the viewpoint is usually fixed in several different videos. Can I have to add some content? In the equal thing for one, the viewpoints are usually changed as the map. So, with the variable device, I usually just go around in the thing, and that would cause a lot of people movement there, which may attempt the learning of audio localization. And also, due to the fragment viewpoint change and the limited field of view, some of the people sometimes may shift their attention from one kind of to another, which creates the out of view audio noise here. For example, Okay. Yeah, so as the, as the people took their attention from one to the other, the brain the sound and the audio noise to be example. So uh, to effectively learn what the original localization model, we need to address these two problems. One is the ego motion and another one is the audio noise. To achieve this goal, we propose a number of frameworks here. First, we extract key brands from an original audio from the video one. And to create the uh, noisy audio input, we sample another audio from a random uh, video two to compose the audio input. And then we fit them into the video platform and the audio platform that works with the feature. And since we want to uh, Disentangled audio noise, so we uh, have uh, this audio brand which we take the visual feature and the audio feature as input. And by by taking the mass prediction as the process, we can enforce the network to learn to disentangle the visually related or audio representation. And we then fit, fit the disentangled representation back to the visual, uh, video brand, and we apply a top localization to highlight the communications here. Then we fit the features to into uh, our geometry aware temporal modeling modules to tackle the uh, viewpoint change here. Finally, we have a 
a localization loss to guide the learning and also we obtain the final localization results here. And here, here are two steps in our draw draw material. We are draw modeling. The first one is that despite despite the huge emotions in the emotions video, we can still leverage the rich draw material information from the uh, because from the friends. And for example, we can estimate the homographic transformation between these two adjacent friends, and then we apply the homographic transformation at the feature stage and we can perform the alignment here. And then after the feature align, we can just uh, aggregate, aggregate them uh, temporarily to get a final visual uh, representation. So more details are shown here. Our localization objective is a uh, contrastive law, which we use the synchronized audio visual content as a positive signal and a synchronized one as a negative signal. Yeah, we train our network on the two data set. One is the heavy features and another one is the ego body. So to show some video demos here. That our methods can localize the kind of object with the emotion, and also we try our method can try to those multiple kind of objects at the same time. And to quantitatively relate, evaluate our methods, we adopt three metrics one the F4, and another one is the CIOU, and also the AUC with the threshold of 0.3, and compare with other uh, state of our localization methods, and you can find that our method gives the new total here. And also our ablation shows that uh, each of, of, of our components contribute to the final localization performance. Yeah, and here's another visual comparison with other methods. And also um, our method can surpass the others in the qualitative way. And thank you. That's all for my presentation today. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe we can take uh, one question. Yes, yeah, so, so let's simultaneously do the QA session simultaneously with a break. So, if you want to ask questions for the previous speakers, tell us the right to ask them. Uh, if not, we'll take a, a five minute break. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. So on uh, those are posters, I the topic change for location. So it's it's much higher if you can put it where it is, it's updated on the website. It's in the D and E section and then um the certain numbers there. So you can present your poster at any time um during the break, especially in the one break. There's no designated poster at the time. And we're going to do this hour long talk for the later in the afternoon. Um, then we're going to get you to have a couple of weeks to know in terms of strength. Yes, 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 please do. <laughs> Thank you also. <laughs>
Do you want to talk and make sure they can join you? Uh, maybe you have to talk into the microphone. Sorry, you might, I, I didn't see it. Um, maybe you could just speak into the microphone and we can see if they can hear you. Were, were you able to hear that, Hong? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Good. Do you have any other audio now being played? No, no, we're not saying audio. We're just speaking. Okay, you can hear. Um, are you are you able? So, are you able to hear? I can hear you. Okay, good, good. But but do you want to play some audio for us or? I'll play for you now. This is a glow big plant. It's a small one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good, good. It works. This is a glow big plant. It's a small one. There's one that I This is a glow big plant. It's a small. One. This is a glow big plant.
It's a small one. This is a glow big plant. What is this? Okay. This. Yeah. Come on. It's a small one. Yeah, I'm just trying to. This is a glow big plant. It's a small one. So we're going to keep switching computers to set up. This is a glow big plant. It's a small one. <laughs> It's these little boxes, man, they've been giving us problems all day and it's causing a bunch of other little problems. No, uh, but I think we will probably need to yeah. go on to, um, copy. Yeah. As long as I think it's okay because we don't get to the space now, right? But if we're able to at least get the material, it's the actual space. Okay. In the meantime, I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, very excited to have Marcia Negrani speaking today. Uh, ever since her PhD at, at Oxford, uh, Arsha has been a real leader in the audiovisual area. Uh, she was responsible for perhaps the most widely used speech data set, the Vox Lab and Vox Lab 2, as well as a whole bunch of other work in audiovisual speech understanding, uh, cross modal biometrics, and so on. And since graduating, Arsha has a lot of really interesting work on uh, multimodal. Fusion, uh, work on transformers, and among her other other accomplishments is dealing with some of the tech issues this morning and the earlier session. So um, very excited to hear what you have to say. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, thanks. So I love these science and sound workshops. Um, I've been doing a fantastic job of organizing them. It's great to see how the field has grown. Um, and I'll just be speaking uh, about some of the recent work that we've done in this space. Um, just a brief intro. So I've been lucky to live in many different countries. I grew up in Hong Kong, Singapore. I then studied in the UK, uh, did my PhD in Oxford, and now um, I'm at Google Research. Um, so just an overview of what this talk will be. Um, first, I guess we all know what multimodal learning is, but why do we really need it? Um, so just 
from both the human and the machine perspective. Um, and then I'll dive into some recent work that we've done um, at Google and also collaborations um, with many other people. So what is multimodal learning? I think everybody in the room knows that. Um, learning with more than one kind of data type. So we can be now with text, with images, with videos, with sound and speech. And um, why do we even need um, to use all these different modalities? So if we begin, we can look at a really useful prototype that we have, which is us, humans. Um, we perceive the world with so many different sensory streams. Um, we interact with the world in vision, uh, sound, touch, smell. And one of the major reasons is um, for degeneracy or redundancy. And that's so that um, if one of our systems isn't working, then uh, we can still function. Um, we can still move around in the world. Um, and there are a lot of studies that show this, uh, particular in um, the vision impaired where um, even though they can't see the world, they develop a sense of um, space and uh, you know, the world around them um, using touch. So um, that's one, one good reason. But another great reason is also that the different sensory systems can actually educate each other. And there's a lot of studies that show that this is actually how humans learn or babies learn, um, not just by looking at things, but also picking objects up, touching them in their hands, feeding them. Um, and a really great study on this actually is um, a study on transparency. So I think that transparency is a really difficult um, kind of concept to learn. You know, this is, you know, birds flying straight into windows and um, so on. So there was this really great study where they uh, had eight month old infants. Um, they gave them these transparent boxes and then they put these like objects inside the boxes and they asked the infants to retrieve the objects. Um, it, the infants who weren't allowed to play with the boxes were just not able to retrieve the balls because they kept putting their hands in through the actual um, glass. Whereas um, infants who could actually play around with the objects before, they realized that, okay, this three sides are transparent, but they're physical, and one side is open, and then they would put their hand in and take out the ball. Um, so this really shows us that um, how we, the way we touch and the way we feel actually also uh, changes the way we see um, and perceive the world. And um, a final reason why we as humans perceive the world from these senses is also because um, this fusion actually helps us with robustness. So if you can use multiple signals to come to one conclusion, um, then you can just end up with a better um, you know, hypothesis at the end. So that's, I mean, from a human perspective. There's lots of studies in this area, that are very interesting. Um, but now if we move to a machine learning perspective, um, a lot of the rationale is actually the same. So we want robustness. We know that the content around us is becoming multimodal. Um, videos are online, have captions, they have titles, they have descriptions. Why should we only limit ourselves to one modality? Um, the second reason is just like humans, we can also use self supervision. And so we can actually use the redundancy between different modalities to help us learn to be fewer labels. Um, and then finally, some applications in machine learning are just inherently multimodal. So, for example, video captioning, we're going from video to generate text, um, automatic speech recognition, we're also again going from um, generating text, but in this case, we're starting with audio. And so, if we have these applications that are fundamentally multi multimodal, um, we need better architectures that can learn to process uh, input and output different modalities. Um, so, I like to kind of divide the space into two, uh, two areas. So one area is uh, cross-modal supervision, where we basically use one modality to help us learn in another modality. Um, and this is there's lots of works on cross-modal supervision, self-supervision using multiple modalities, and this helps us um, because labeling data management is tough. Um, and in this case, we're actually using what is redundant between different modalities. Um, and the second kind of idea, the second space. Um, of works in this area are actually multimodal fusion works where we actually combine different modalities for robustness. And in this case, we exploit what's complementary between the modalities or um, you know, what you can get from one that you can't get from another. So I'm just going to dive into some um, recent work that we've had, um, go to our Google and also collaborations. Um, I'll be focusing mostly on audiovisual fusion. Um, so first diving into um, some architectures, then uh, how we can actually get data to form these models, and then finally um, a new application that we have for ASR. So um, yeah, so the first um, first work is actually from work that we had at um, Europe last year. And um, so as you know, videos and multimodal, um, we want to find a good way to combine all these different 
um, these different modalities. So we want a single model that survives, that's efficient, scalable, and also that can take in very well and uh, But if we look at um, these, these areas, different um, communities have tended to function differently. So you have the computer vision community that had a lot of great architecture for video and images. You then have the audio community um, and you have the NLP community. And what's, tend to, what's actually been happening is that you then get these specialized architectures, you get different data sets, you get different benchmarks. And so the dominant paradigm which was used in for a long time is actually late fusion, which is where you have these different um, state-of-the-art models for each modality. You extract the representations, and then you just combine the scores or the representations right at the end. And this is actually in contrast to how we humans perceive the world. Um, there's a lot of um, work that actually shows that humans have very early fusion process going on. Um, and so that's kind of what we want to see. Um, and so when you were looking around for architectures, I think everybody knows now that there's this big transformer wave. Um, some of the good things about transformers is that um, they break more many contexts. Um, unlike RNNs uh, or LFTM sequences, they can actually have access to all of the tokens in the sequence. Um, the other great thing about transformers is they seem to be now um, being toyed as a generic architecture um, because they can operate on any input that can be tokenized, and we know that all inputs can be tokenized. Um, people actually think that like universal perception models, um, the attention mechanism of transform transformers are also extremely parallelizable and they're actually shown to transform excellently at scale. So uh, we ran out of the transformers and um, we've seen that they're now actually putting the state of the art on many different modalities. So not only text, but also images, um, videos, and also audio with the um, recent audio cycle that so um, to begin with, we just take a simple transformer. This is the simplest idea where we take an all the modalities we have. So they have our different frames and spectrogram. We basically tokenize um, these frames and spectrogram patches. We get one long sequence of tokens, both RGB tokens and spectrogram tokens. And then we just feed them to the another transformer. So we're doing nothing over here. It's just one transformer. And we have full pairwise comprehension between all the tokens. Um, and this is very simple, it's a nice idea, but unfortunately, we know that the self attention mechanism scales quadratically with sequence length, and this seems a bit unnecessary given that we know video has so much redundancy. So, what we do is we actually introduce a very small number of bottleneck tokens. Um, in this case, we have thousands of video and audio tokens and only four bottleneck tokens, so this is really a small bottleneck. Um, we then allow full pairwise attention within a modality, um, but all cross-modal cross connections are limited to be via these bottleneck tokens. Um, so really, we reduce the complexity of the model of the um, The other kind of um, innovation that we make is we also realize that we don't actually need these bottlenecks at every single layer of our model. Um, we actually introduce them only midway, and we call this the AD layer. Um, and we find that this actually allows earlier layers to specialize in new model patterns. And then we can introduce the um, cross metal interactions after the fusion layer. Um, so, what we find is that the fusion actually outperforms early and late fusion on most data sets. Um, and in this case, we're testing on action recognition and sound classification data sets. Um, and the other thing we find is that our original motivation for the bottlenecks was that we actually just wanted to reduce computational costs. Um, but what we found was kind of surprisingly is that using the bottlenecks actually reduce performance at all the layers. So you can see on the left, um, the red graph is with bottlenecks at different fusion layers, and the blue graph is without bottlenecks. And uh, we test we test um, our model on two types of tasks: so action recognition data sets like kinetics, application moment in time, and also sound event classification data sets like audio sound, DVD sound, and sound. Um, and then more details in the paper, but um, biology is very common. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, and then, so one thing that I kind of like about this framework is that it's very general. Um, it can be used for any modality that can be tokenized. Um, we tested it with optical flow, which is we tested it with text. Um, and these, these bottlenecks are kind of just like global tokens that can be used to, you know, form correlations between any, any input modality. Um, and then we kind of wanted to see what was going on, so we visualized, um, so we backpacked 
use attention rollout to basically see the, the effect of the CBS looking right down to the images. And we found that with MDT, our model is actually focusing on more narrow regions in the images. So, for example, you can see that the baseline, the model is focusing more on the mouth, um, but the piano is focusing more on the face rates. And this kind of confirms the intuition that these bottlenecks make the model share only what it really needs to share and what's necessary between the different modalities. So, um, yeah, so the model is available online. We produce the code and um, the, the models, and um, yeah, you can take a look. Um, are there any questions just before I go on to the next, next part of the talk? Oh, you can take Yeah. Oh, I have one question. Uh, how can you uh, measure the time for those sweet and for example, what? Swing. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And the thing I like is that the idea of the bottlenecks can really be applied to any other architecture. Um, it's very flexible. So it's just, we just, they're just like CLS tokens that we append at the start of the sequence. Um, so yeah, they can be applied in conjunction with these other different architectures as well. You mentioned that you know, the model is Late stage fusion, the platforms early stage and late stage fusion. Do you have any intuition why that is? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we so the fusion layer is kind of like the hyperparameter. Um, we found that you know in some on some data sets the best fusion is like eight or seven or six. We did find that it was better than um late fusion in all cases, and that that's because I think it just gives the model more flexibility and that it can have some interactions earlier on. Um why it outperforms early fusion is not clear to us. I mean, it's clear that the complexity is less, but why it should be better is something that, you know, it's like early fusion, whatever thing it early fusion, whatever thing it made, it can do it early, right? It can like ignore the first view. So it's a good question, but it, I think it's just like something to the regularization um, of the network. Thank you. Um, wait, Andrew, do you want me to? Stop at 25 or go on? I think the volume is fine. Uh, so I think we can go ahead and. Uh, okay. Um, okay, I'll keep going with the rest of them and then I'll come back to the other questions. Sorry. Um, yeah, so, the, so this is um, another kind of work that we've been doing at Google that's still in, in progress. And um, so we don't really like, so we can have these great architectures, but we, we really struggle to find good audio visual data between our models. Um, and we don't really want labels anymore. We don't want application labels. We want natural language descriptions. Um, and this is because captions um, are way more flexible than we are detailed or supposed to be like. Um, they're great for so many more applications like video captioning, video retrieval, touch answering. And also from an AI perspective, um, language is a way to communicate. Um, videos are how we perceive the world. So if we can, you know, bridge this gap, um, then that's also really nice. So we we really want some good audio visual data sets with captioning integration. Um, but if you look at existing data sets, um, for video text data sets, we have manually labeled ones that are not very big. Clothing moments in time is a very decent introduction, but other than that, they're all very small. Um, we have then semi-automatic ones like captioning ingredients, like video text, uh, hatchbacks. But these are very noisy. Um, and then if you look at audio and text, it's even fewer data sets. The manually labeled ones are only things like audio caps and proco. And um, uh, on the other hand, image captioning data sets, such as conceptual captions, are really big. You know, we have millions. Um, and this is because we can really scrape the internet and we can get loads of images with text revision um, and pretty really good localized text. So, um, our goal here was to see whether we could actually use these image captions in a way to get free supervision for audio and video modalities. Um, and so what we did was we started with a seed image captioning data set. We then took the frame from this image captioning data set. We went to um, a big corpus of videos online, uh, which Google has access to and um, And we basically tried to find frames that match with these seed images. Um, in the captioning data sets. We then took the video frame, video clips that match the frame, and we transfer the captions from the image captioning data set to the video clips. Um, so for example, we have an image caption to see the image uh, from this data set, like a pop artist performed at a festival, we then take this image, we know the context that looks similar, 
you take the audio and you take the video code and you can review the same thing. Um, so we've done this with a number of data sets, but just as an example, we start with the conceptual maps and the data set, um, and we go and get um, we go and get the three. Um, so the last data set we create is this uh, video CC3 minion. Um, so it consists of video sets from YouTube uh, that are matched to captions from um, uh, the conceptual captions data set. And we actually compare this data set to how to this minion, because that was the other video data set we had at the time. And we find that it's actually um, a more diverse data set, it's not local. Um, it's we sort of some best pipelines, and we also found that. Uh, unlike how to engineer, which is just focused on instructional videos, um, our video data set consists of uh, various different data sets. Um, and the other thing is that we also have multiple captions per clip and multiple clips per caption, um, which is unlike my education data sets that have a one to one. Um, so you can see some examples over here from my data set. Uh, on the left, we have the same image from conceptual captions. Um, streaming and data set on, on the right, you can see some mind videos. Um, the last two columns are actually two frames from one video, so you can see that there's some mind motion, both actual motion and camera motion. Um, and some more examples, the thing I like is that you can also get videos and audios that are like animated and have different styles. Um, um, and then we also had a little bit of a number of noise. Um, we've done a lot of the same tasks since then. Um, Obviously, the audio is uh, not as uh, high quality as the video, but um, even in the video, we do find that there is some amount of noise. Sometimes the model does make mistakes. So you can see at the bottom, um, the last video clip that's retrieved is actually of a car wash, but our model thinks that, thinks that it's broken glass, and that's because it looks very similar um, to the image of the car and the broken glass. Um, so training on this data set, we actually evaluated on three tasks. Um, we evaluated on video retrieval, we evaluated on video captioning, um, and then we also did audio retrieval. Um, and if you just look at the video captioning, the thing I like about um, this data set is that we actually get some pretty good zero shot um, video captioning results. So most video captioning works till now have had to pre train on how to move the but then always fine tune on a target data set. Um, but we find that because you already have a huge captioning data set, um, we can actually get some zero shot results. Um, we also get some results on audio retrieval, and this is kind of nice because we use no audio supervision. So we start off with image captioning data sets. And I think the reason why this works is, is that often image captioning data sets are actually hallucinating audio sounds. So in the conceptual captions data set, we found captions like these on the left, um, like person performs by the blues artist, or man is singing, or man is, you know, these are these captions are hallucinating audio that's obviously not there. Um, and so if you can find audio from clips, then you can use these captions. Um, okay, I can take some questions now and ask you what. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So you're saying instead of starting with image captioning data sets, you start with existing video captioning data sets. That's a great idea, but we really wanted to do this at scale. And um, the image captioning data sets that we have are like millions, whereas video existing video captioning data sets are so small. Um, but no, but it's a good idea, definitely. And we want to do something similar with audio as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would suggest that I do a way to be able to capture the whole Yeah, that's a great question. So, there is actually a work um, from Jonathan Israel, who was on the book. He created the WBT data set. And I think there's some other papers as well that where they use um, YouTube titles and YouTube descriptions. Um, and that's uh, those models actually perform really well, but those data sets haven't been used. Um, so, yeah, we found that this, this works as better than that data set because we want to localize captions, and the title for the video is for the whole video. Um, so. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Um, so just I just wanted to talk about this recent work as well that we had 
on audiovisual speech recognition, and this is just been on our side. Next slide. Um, so our goal here was actually we wanted to do um, uh, ASR, so speech recognition, um, but we want this to work when the audio is really noisy, interrupted. Um, and when the previous audiovisual ASR works, they actually focus on lip motion. Um, and this is the strongest cue you can get for ASR. However, we want to see if we could do this when um, the speaker could fly away, when the lip cannot really hear, when you have occlusions like face masks. Um, and also, you guys have the viewpoint um, and many structures videos on YouTube where you can't really see the limits. Um, and so, we wanted to see if we could actually learn from other objects in the scene, the background, and so on. Um, so, we introduced this new model, which is called Avatar. Um, it consists of this end to end um, technical transformer with early features. We actually used the MPT model that I had described in the first part of the talk. Um, we do early fusion of the uh, audio spectrograms and the audio frames, and then we just added the decoder to generate um, the text. And uh, what we found is that if you just train this model straight away for ASR, it will just ignore the video stream. The model has no incentive to look at the video because it's audio is just the strongest cue for ASR. And so um, we have actually have to force the model to look at the video. And the way we do this is by um, different masking schemes. So we mask out random parts of the audio, we mask out um, entire words either randomly, or we mask out content words that are basically non stop words. Um, and for non stop words, the model really has to then look at the vision to be a result of that. Um, so we evaluate um, with both artificial and real noise. Um, for artificial noise, we randomly mask the chunk of the audio signal. Real noise, we added audio signals from the audio set noise category. Um, and we find that across all these cases, um, vision actually helps and the masking strategy is still the same. Um, but you know, evaluating with this artificial noise isn't very satisfying. So what we did was we went to YouTube and we actually found videos where they automatically use ASR API settings. So these are samples where um, audio and ASR doesn't work. And a lot of these are actually different accents. Um, the YouTube ASR API is really good at American accents in English and not much else. Um, and so we found that on these cases, actually vision is a great tool. Um, and it improves the performance. I do have some, um, okay, these are just results, but I do have some videos I want to play, and I'm going to try to end them and we'll see if we can hear them. This is a gold big plan. It's a small one. So the audio model predicts this is the zero big time, and then the vision model corrects it to this is the zero big time. Okay. okay, so the plan is completed. Yeah, so I'm sure you can see though, but the audio is instead dependent permissive and it corrects it to the plane. So that's completely. This is a glow big plane. Okay, so it's a small one. And then just some more examples. This deserves, definitely deserves a happy dance. And I absolutely love this shake. The thumb reaches for the coin. So um, we have lots more examples um, on our website and this data set, we have it, um, the big piece data set is also publicly released. So um, as well as the video piece data set that I put down in the second half. So go check it out. And then I just wanted to briefly touch on some more application fusion that we've been working on. Um, so audio is really useful um, in the egocentric domain because the microphone is maybe close to the person and maybe of course now that are out of the use of camera. So um, there's a whole workshop, obviously the ego for the workshop and the application workshop and some great audio visual works there. Um, we also um, are doing a collaboration with the anthropology department at Oxford. And we actually found that um, for action recognition of chimpanzees, audio is also a really great um, signal and this case the chimpanzees are tapping nuts and they're dropping on trees uh, and the sound is really very indicated. And I actually really like working with these data sets because um, unlike human actors in human cases, um, we don't have the same privacy issues um, and also these um, these works actually help with conservation efforts. So that's another nice um, um, and then just in general, um, the training with Martin Robert data, I feel like some of the biggest challenges are different modalities of computer learning and 
We have very different implementations. The text is symbolic. Sound is usually one way form. Image is really the um, We also have very different noise technologies um, to deal with. And then obviously, when we, the more modalities we combine, um, the more expensive our models become, and so we need um, more efficient output. Yeah, and that's that's all I have. Get set up for you. Oh, yes. yeah, that's okay. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. I know we can do more about temporal aspects. Um, but I think it's probably going to be really Sorry, I can't. Just talk to me to come to me. Sorry. I, you said temporal aspects. Yeah. But that might be wrong. All right. Don't worry. Yes, I was. Curious about uh, hearing more about the four aspects of different modalities. So you mentioned this two aspects, how it's defined by like different modalities are in a different ways. Yeah. Also, they can offer different findings and mm -hmm. yeah, how do I go to the relationship to find all those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, and also one of the biggest challenges. So um, because sound is a 1D uh, waveform, the way we represent it is our spectrograms, and you have time on one axis, frequency on the other axis. Obviously, this is different to images where you have multiple images per second and you have this huge amount of redundancy. Um, so, what we found actually that the MPC work, we found asynchronous sampling actually helps just as a data augmentation technique. Um, but in most other worlds, I think uh, we found that synchronous sampling is better because you want to align up. The audio and the vision. Um, so I think it's a great question. It's definitely an open problem. Um, and I think it depends on how we represent yeah. <laughs> uh, how we represent the image. Um, but definitely something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, I think um so for example, um in the egocentric domain, um if you have like uh washing the difference between like washing something or frying something, you can have the sounds that are really strong with the microphone. Um, you can also have if the microphone is close to the person and they are making a sound, then that's not going to be captured in the viewpoint, uh, the camera view, because the camera is looking away. So in those cases, sound is useful. Um, and there is actually a challenge. Um, yeah, there is actually a challenge in the Eagle 4D um, where they have, uh, which is I think speaker recognition, speaker diarization and in those cases, um, they want you to transcribe the speech of the speaker, but the speaker just like you know you can't see the lips, you can't see the face, and that which is the you know out. So I just think the ego centric domain is so interesting for audio and audio visual applications in the models. Um, yeah, yeah, you want to go? Oh yeah, so uh, I talked to you about the audio models, so I found that the audio visual model and the audio visual model. So, that, so I think um, when image CNNs were so good, the audio field um, took spectrograms and then just wanted to reuse these great image models and then just apply new spectrograms as images. And you're right, the spectrograms are not like images, right? Spectrograms in sound, we have when we add noise, it's always additive. In vision, you have an occlusion, the pixels behind are lost. Um, objects in images are, you know, they're opaque pixels in sound. You can have multiple objects in the same location because they're transparent. Um, so there's definitely different statistical properties between spectrum and images, and that's why I think I actually like the MPC work because um, 
we basically have a tension between every single patch in the transformer, right? So even though we have one patch, it can attend to all the other patches. We can also try different sizes of patches, um, which we did, which we did do, and it didn't make much of a difference. But I think we, that's a very valid point that we shouldn't treat striking and images the same. Um, so yeah, okay. Yes. Um, Sorry, I think so sorry. Um, yeah, so I was really interesting what you mentioned where even by using like image data sets and captions, there were some descriptions that were hallucinating all of you had mentioned that you were able to kind of find those audio kind of yeah. events because of that. Uh, I was wondering if you explored that and then what are the limits of that? What type of sounds people might describe and what other types of sounds yeah, are never in there? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of it was music and singing. Um, uh, that was like baby crying, that kind of stuff. But I do think that the biggest challenge is actually with the distribution of YouTube videos, and that for this to work, we need the sound to be correlated with the frame, visual frames of the video. And then on YouTube, people edit their videos a lot, so you have irrelevant music, you know, like irrelevant like voiceover, and that actually was the biggest challenge for this. So we're cleaning, we're in the process of cleaning that up. Okay, so let's make the speaker again. And I, I'm very excited to, uh, to have our next speaker here, uh, Jeanette Bowe. Uh, Jeanette is an assistant professor at Stanford, uh, where she works on robotics. And prior to that, she was a group leader at MPI. And prior to that, she got her PhD um, from, from KPH. And Jeanette's work deals with, uh, in part, deals with multimodal perception in robots, where she's done some really interesting and creative work um, that really spans the whole spectrum from both uh, work on, on the sensor level to learning algorithms that robots use to use multiple modalities. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Sorry, Ooh, I can hear myself. Sorry. Um, I don't know. Can you try again? <laughs> one, two, one, two. How's that? Oh, no, no. Okay, now we can't, we can't hear you now. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, I think we can unplug the mic. Do you want to say that? I mean, I don't know. No? Can you, um, Can, can you try presenting it again? I'm so sorry, there's just some feedback on our end. Oh, I don't know. Do you oh, want me to? Tessa. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And then thank you for <laughs> dealing with this audio setup in this hybrid workshop. I've been to my first conference at ICRA in Philadelphia, um, and it was a joy to uh, organize a hybrid workshop. So I can't really see the audience, but I hope um, this uh, what I'm going to talk about is interesting to you. Um, yeah, so my uh, research is driven by the question of why people are so incredible at manipulation and at the same time why it's so hard to make robots do the same and show the kind of 
dexterity that people show in the robustness when executing and learning these manipulation skills. And as you are, uh, as the previous, like the first speaker already said, right, like people really make uh, a lot of um, use of uh, all the modality, modalities that we have access to. So just think about this game, Jenga. Um, uh, if you've played it before, you know, you don't only need vision and physical intuition, but you also need a sense of touch to actually figure out which block to remove next. Um, and so there's a lot of there are a lot of uh, scientific studies on how people actually exploit multiple modalities for perception that are more rigorous than playing Jenga. And so here's a very old study from JJ Gibson, uh, who yes, the affordance guy, um, and he presented the study in his books, the sensors, the sensors considered as a perceptual system. And here subjects were supposed to find a reference object among the set of irregularly shaped objects. And these subjects were most successful if they could actually touch and rotate the objects instead of just passively looking at them or visually rotating them. And really, this uh, is some evidence that humans exploit multi multimodality that is only available through physical uh, interaction. And um, maybe some, some other evidence there, are also people exploit uh, signals over time. So here you see like a black and white image. And only if you actually consider the signal over time horizon, you actually can figure out what is going on. In this case, it's a bunch of dogs. And uh, there are small experiments like this very old from one from 63 from Heldon Hein, um, where they present evidence that in biological systems, um, there, it's really important to understand the concurrency between your own motion um, and the sensing to develop meaningful behavior. And uh, maybe in the interest of time, I'm not gonna uh, um, actually explain this. The point is that the kitten that actually uh, is in this contraption and has control over its own motion um, and sees how the visual input changes in response to its own motion can actually develop visually guided behavior while the other one that is just being kind of floated around in the space without control cannot or is worse at it. So feel free to read this paper. It's very interesting actually. Um, but my main point is basically that uh, people have this ability uh, by, to exploit multiple modalities and often they use their own body to uh, get this kind of signal, either uh, vision, but most importantly touch and sound as well, or even smell as the previous speaker mentioned as well. And robots can't do this, but they do have all these sensors in their body. Uh, we just uh, don't have a good sense yet on how to exploit them really super well. And so I personally have done a lot of work on actually exploiting the sense of touch. Uh, so tactile sensing, voice stroke sensing, and uh, sensing in the, uh, of the joints. Um, uh, but there's more and more work on actually exploiting sound as well in robotic manipulation. And here are just some examples from the literature to give you an idea of what's going on in the robotics field. So this is a bit older work from uh, Sinapov et al. Uh, from ICRA um, 2009 where they try to uh, basically interact with different objects, collect data uh, in all the different senses that a robot has access to, and then understand what the properties of these different household objects are. Um, um, sound sensing is also used in uh, hardware to actually, for example, in these super interesting new uh, soft hands, uh, and they are used to understand uh, where contact is being made on these soft um, uh, hands that are otherwise very difficult to sensorize and to sense actually. Uh, there's also even more recent work um, where the sense of touch is used, uh, sorry, the sense of sound is used to actually find specific objects, uh, in this case, a keychain. Um, and sound is also used to understand uh, how an, uh, a, a ball is actually bouncing, what material is made of in order to play with it. Uh, even in the blind, uh, when you're blind and you don't have uh, um, access to vision. So these are all some really cool examples of how sound has been used uh, specifically in robotic manipulation. And today, uh, let's see how far I get, but I wanted to talk about some of our recent work on how we uh, use sound models to identify object materials, specifically for impact sounds. And I also, uh, I hopefully managed to at least mention, is gonna talk about 
um, and a data set of uh, virtual or virtual objects um, that allow us to do contact localization, shape reconstruction, and gas grass stability estimation from these multiple modalities that also include sound. So this is work that is actually uh, that last one is actually being presented at CDPR this year. Um, and uh, in case I won't get to this one, I know that Rohan uh, Gan, uh, who's uh, the first author of this paper, is in the audience. Maybe you can just quickly wave. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if people have questions to this and we don't have time at the end of my talk, uh, please feel free to ask him or bombard him with more questions. Cool. So uh, let me first talk about this first work uh, that was presented at Qual this year. So let me, so I hope this actually works. I think I shared uh, sound. Uh, so let's see if you hear this. Um, so I want to start off by trying to illustrate to, your, uh, to you your own mental intuition about impact sounds. And so here I show an adversarial example from throwing materials from vision only. Uh, so in fact, only one of the glasses here is plastic, uh, is, is glass. Uh, the other one is plastic, and one of the seemingly steel forks is plastic as well. Um, so now I'm going to play this clip, and if you listen carefully, you'll hopefully be able to classify the materials of these cups. Um, and if you listen especially carefully, you may even be able to classify the materials of the fork. Okay, so listen carefully. I hope this works well. Okay, so I hope you heard this um, and probably you were able to understand which one is plastic, which one is glass uh, for both of these uh, objects. Uh, probably the dropping the fork on the table also helped a little bit. Um, but so what you just mentally did is called source separation. So when the glasses were each struck with a fork, you had never heard the impact sound of the glass by itself, but rather heard the combination of the sound of both the glass and the fork. Uh, and yet you were still able to mentally attend to the sound of the glass to classify it. Um, and perhaps you could have even done this if there was a conversation going on in the background or uh, some noise um, otherwise, okay? So uh, people are, um, really good at this. Uh, they have a powerful intuition for mentally reasoning over forward and backward problems relevant to impact sounds. Um, so how can we give this ability to robots? Um, so first off, uh, let's look at prior work. And honestly, all you need to know is that there are two camps, like as always, in, you know, uh, especially in robotics, there is the model-based camp, um, that actually fits physically interpretable parameters. And then there's the deep learning camp that you know, just fits a lot of data um, uh, in a non-interpretable way. And that works really well. You can learn from data in the wild, uh, but the parameters are uninterpretable, right? As opposed to these methods where you actually physically understand what these parameters mean. Cool, and then uh, and this is a more recent work uh, from 2020. Uh, from the Magenta team at Google, they, they proposed its DDSP model, uh, which is a differentiable audio renderer that is kind of in the middle of these two camps. Um, and it's specifically designed for musical instrument sounds. Um, and they can learn interpretable parameters from data in the wild. Uh, so again, these are though relevant to music. Okay, so we wanted to also basically combine the best of both worlds, model-based and deep learning-based methods. Uh, and propose diff impact. Um, and um, yeah, and so hopefully uh, using these techniques, we can uh, get interpretable and transferable parameters, uh, yet by, uh, by being fully differentiable, we can learn from data in the wild uh, with these learning-based methods. Okay, so uh, at this point, you may be wondering, why do we care about physics-based models with interpretable parameters? Um, and so uh, the reason for this is that uh, if we can extract physically interpretable parameters about objects, tools, contexts, environments, and so on, we can actually easily reuse these parameters to extrapolate and simulate new impact sounds using new combinations of parameters of contact conditions, objects, environments, and so on. Um, so this uh, is maybe also going to be useful for any kind of simulation um, that you want to fine tune in the, um, 
for to learn uh, at a larger scale form, right? I'm gonna come to be, uh, this. I'm gonna come back to this later uh, with the second work. Okay, so uh, to see how we can extract these physically interpretable parameters from uncontrolled recordings, uh, let's consider the physics of impact vibrations first. Uh, and it turns out that an impact sound can be broken down into two main components. Uh, the intrinsic contact forces acting on an object or the impact force profile um, and the intrinsic acoustic model of an object, that is its impulse response. And so basically the convolution of these two components is the most fundamental aspect of an impact sound. And other components such as background noise and reverberations of a room and so on are also big contributors. So our model also models these. Uh, but I want to focus basically on these two points here uh, for the sake of brevity. Um, so, uh, so we focus on these forces and the impact, impact, impulse response here. So if we can decompose an impact sound into each of these two components, into each of these components, we can infer important properties of objects and how they were contacted. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we could even specifically swap out the impact or the object parameters to simulate a new sound in a new acoustic environment. Um, but the problem is decomposing an impact sound into these constituent contributions is an ill-posed problem since we're essentially trying to solve deconvolution. And so the key idea behind this impact is that we can bias the decomposition of impact sounds uh, by using physics-based models to both provide a helpful model bias and extract physically interpretable parameters. So I start by focusing on how we parameterize the impact force profile with a physics-based model. And the first thing you should know about impact forces is that they are generally not ideal impulses. They have different sharpnesses to them, depending on the velocity, shapes, hardness of the colliding objects and so on. So we use a Hertzian half sign model of contact forces, which can be parameterized with the timing of the contact, uh, the scale of the magnitude uh, and the time constant tau, which represents the, the sharpness of the impact. And more specifically, uh, we use a Gaussian approximation of this model, which has the same parameters, but has smooth derivatives, which then allows us to make, make all of this differentiable. So we model an impact force as a linear combination of M impact events, each parameterized by these three parameters. Uh, and to create a time sequence of multiple uh, impact events, basically. So next I'll explain the physical model behind the object impulse response. So rigid object vibrations are well modeled by modal vibration models uh, based on a spring damper model of a network of particles within the object. Um, so as shown here, each object has multiple modes of vibrations occurring simultaneously with each mode vibrating with a different frequency, initial gain and damping. So an object's impulse response can be expressed as a sum of exponentially decaying sinusoids. Uh, and this is shown here, um, you know, with all of the different uh, parameters that are already mentioned. Um, and so I've explained the physical models we use for the impact force profiles uh, and the object impulse response, which we convolve together to get an impact sound waveform. Uh, so the main thing that's left to explain is the loss we are optimizing against. And so for our loss, we compute the magnitude and log magnitude spectrograms of the, our, um, um, of the original ground truth audio, and then compute the same for the audio synthesized by our model. And then we take the L1 difference between the two. Uh, and so now let's see how this all plays out on an example of a studio recording of striking a ceramic mark multiple times. So here's the original recording. And so to model and extract parameters from this real recording, we start by initializing a random series of uh, impact forces uh, and a random impulse response uh, shown here. And these are uh, convolved to get our running estimate of the synthesized waveform. Um, and we take the spectrogram of this and then compute the L1 loss against the ground truth spectrogram to adjust the parameters of the upstream models during the gradient descent optimization. So this is how this looks like. Um, 
And here we have estimates of the extrinsic impact forces and intrinsic object impulse response, which results um, then in the following synthesized clip. Sounds pretty good, I would say, in comparison to the ground truth that you heard earlier. Um, and the full model actually has more to it, uh, um, you know, to uh, look at all of these different um, things that impact a impact force sound. Um, so uh, let me skip over this though. So we evaluated basically this model in different uh, applications. Um, so first we showed that we can learn from these controlled recordings in the studio, uh, just like existing model-based method. Uh, we next show a passive learning use case where diff impact can outperform existing uh, deep learning methods to enable a robot to learn acoustic models uh, of objects passively from data in the wild. And finally, we show an interactive learning example where diff impact can equip a robot to learn separated acoustic models from impact sound recording collected in a noisy robotics lab. Okay. So here are some examples from the experiments on the controlled recordings. Um, so basically the goal here is to show that diff impact can match real impact sounds and that because of its physics-based model bias, it can infer physically meaningful quantities about the impact as well. Um, so this is again like hitting these objects with an impact hammer that records both audio and ground truth impact forces. Um, and then we fit, um, oh yeah, sorry, there's this, and then we fit a modal re impulse response for each object it makes make an estimate of, of all of this. Um, so here uh, are some examples uh, from the ceramic Mac ground truth and the synthesized waveform. Um, and you know, that sounds pretty good, but what we really want is to uh, show how diff impact can enable a robot to passively learn acoustic models from in the wild impact sound data with many imperfect impacts through an end to end learning task. So we curated a data set of audio from ASMR videos where the creator is finger tapping different everyday objects and doesn't actually say uh, anything. So it's perfect uh, for the purpose that we have in mind. Uh, and then we use diff impact as a rendering layer and an autoencoder for impact sounds. Uh, our model and all baselines uh, were given uh, the ground truth magnitude only spectrograms input. Uh, then we're trained to reproduce the sound from the spectrogram using ground truth audio supervision. And we compare our autoencoder based uh, on diff impact to other autoencoding baseline frameworks, which were designed for musical instruments or human speech. Um, so here's how this looks like. Um, this is again ground truth. This is the synthesized sound using this model, uh, this uh, baseline that is actually um, uh, um, essentially made for musical instruments. We did add some tweaks to it to make it a fair comparison as well, but you can hear it's not uh, exactly great. It sounds very washed out. Waveclaw does sound better, but it's actually optimized for speech and it needs a lot of data as well. And this was our approach and we show actually in the paper in human studies um, that uh, people mostly prefer, prefer our model. It, it seems to them that it explains best what's actually happening in the video. And here you have an interesting uh, experiment with a robot that does the same what you have done uh, at the beginning of this talk, namely sound source operation, right? So we want uh, a robot to understand uh, what's the material of the tool and what's the material of the object from actually dinging things against it. So remember, this was the task you did at the very beginning. Um, and now with our model, we can actually separate these uh, sources. Um, so here again is the recording from the actual robotic lab. Which you may have heard, it, it has quite some noise. For example, the motors of the robot uh, are actually making noise. This is from the microphone directly recorded, then synthesized and denoised. And now you will hear the fork and then the mug. 
separated. Um, and we can do this for all the other objects as well. So you, you will actually be able to hear what the, the material is quite distinct. So for the objects themselves, the separation that the structure of diff impact allows us to do works pretty well, I would say. It works less well for the tool. And uh, we use this separated sound to actually do classification of materials. And basically, uh, our model in blue is basically performing best, but you do see for uh, that actually for the tool, it works less well. We also looked at Young's model loss, which is like a different kind of um, parameter that determines sound. Cool, so the key takeaways is um, we, uh, diff impact uses models to extract physically interpretable parameters, which can be used for simulation and extrapolation. It is differentiable, so it can learn from recordings in the wild, and it can solve many dual forward and backward problems with just one framework. And uh, we use these results for important downstream tasks in robotics, such as material classification and stiffness estimation. Cool. So unfortunately, I'm totally out of time right now. <laughs> I actually have to run. Um, and I can't talk about uh, this work that we did on um, creating a virtual multimodal data set that we show uh, works actually for applications like contact localization, shape reconstruction, grass stability estimation for vision, touch, and sound, which is actually going to be presented at uh, CVPR. And again, Rohan is in the audience. If you can, wave again, Rohan. <laughs> Ask him about all of this. This is basically how the model uh, looks like. Um, it's basically intrinsic uh, object models where we combine nerves, uh, a cool new uh, tacta sensor and this audio model that you just heard about. Um, and uh, just to conclude, uh, from, for robots that manipulate objects, the sense of touch, vision, and sound uh, really augment decision making. And uh, it is still an active area of inquiry how to fuse these multiple modalities with many open questions. Uh, there's always this question whether you prefer interpretable parameters versus actually having a non-interpretable representation of this, and then how can you scale to many different tasks. And with that, I thank you for again for the invitation and uh, for the attention, and I thank all my students, funding sources, and of course, all my great collaborators. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I think it's well given that Rohan is a, is a collaborator on the future, so welcome to come up there and ask some questions. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. So now is the, the lunch break. Um, if, if you have yeah, I'm I'm really sorry. I, I would love to answer some question. I'm gonna uh, hear how Ruan is answering all these questions later. I catch up with him. Thank you again. Yes, now one break. Thank you. This is all the amazing people with us to go to technical issues. At one p.m., we'll be back. Uh, and, and there'll be a second round of um, presentations. If you're one of the, or, uh, second round of presentations. If you're one of those presenters, please come 15 minutes early just so we can you know, double check the
What is the black thing? Oh, oh, I think it's just. Oh, it's like okay. it's my my. That's okay. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Hong, can you hear us? Okay. Oh, thank you. Yes, we, we were having problems right before the the lunch break. It'd be great if you could if you could help us out. I think right now, I don't know. I don't know if the problems are happening. Did you you want to try the other spot? Oh, yeah. Okay. Can somebody, can somebody over Zoom try saying something? I think. But I, I think we wanted to play sound from here and have it go on that on that speaker. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a there's this will have to be plugged into that phone for it to be a... Yeah, that was what it used to be. Yeah. Okay. But I, I don't know. Do you want to try playing something out of there right now? Yeah, I'll try. Yeah, um, that won't be whatever comes out of your laptop, but it won't be associated with coming out of that phone. So if you want to wait, wait, so, so what are we <laughs> what you do? do? Uh can I can you play something from there on share? Wait, um, what if you share from the share show it? Wait, the, the issue is like uh, the audio coming in through Zoom, right? Um can you oh, yeah, sure. and say something? So now now this is connected. Oh that's right, that's right. Um oh so what do you mean like play it on that computer over Zoom? And I mean oh yeah, that's good. that yeah. computer already has the audio plugged in here. So we want to maybe well, I can try it on, on my phone and just go outside. Oh, we actually don't we want it on this one so you can hear it through that big. Through no, but so this works. But like if somebody if somebody's presenting, so what if somebody uh, what we want was like if somebody's presenting through Zoom, yeah, we want a sound to come here, which we haven't tried. Yeah, I thought that, that would I thought that you'd want to do no, are you doing a screen share? Okay, okay, so I'll, 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 I'll I think I'll, I think we'll see still have a computer. I don't think we should use this on our Oh, for the poster here? I see at any break or the lunch break, you're welcome to, to set up your, your poster and do the presentation. In particular, I mean, hour long lunch break or hour long coffee break later, where it would be a good time to do the posters. Oh, it's on the website. Okay. Or it should, it should be. Um, Okay, so on the website I can find. Yeah, it should be at the top. Let me just. Okay, so they changed it, so it, it's. I, I yeah, to, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's see. So just when the this will be. Oh, uh, this is where it is. So the, um, uh, 60, 65 through okay. 85. So oh, during, uh, recording is not planned. Yes, yes, you can do it right now. We're even doing. I want to try it again. Yeah, let's try See, it. The thing is that if you're you're playing that too, it's going to get that. that yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, okay, well um, Fine, if you can mute that, it should be still working. Okay, yeah. it's still working. It's still working. Okay, but if somebody wants to play, so if somebody presents again, oh, do we all have other figures that are presenting? Yes, yes, we have one. So uh, for yeah. them, we need their audio to come through here. That's right. How does this work? Uh, what, what if you, I mean, this one's already able to play sound for that. What if we play? Okay, let's go outside and I'll Okay. Let's see. Sure. Okay.
Great. Thank you. You need the sound from this one as well? Yes, yeah, so sound okay. has to come from because we, we have. Let's make sure that's uh, uh, We'll have to set up another uh, input in just before. Uh, we have uh, the XLR anywhere. Uh, uh, right. yeah. We got to run earlier. Oh, that was yeah, it was working earlier because we had a DI set up to that, but we also need it for this if you need sound from here. Yeah, this is a workshop on sound, so it'd be great if people could play sound. <laughs> okay. Them. Yeah, let me uh, let me get another DI and we'll set that up too. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm just uh, muting this. Hello, Andrew. Can you share that? Hey, I. Can... Wait. Hey, so can is... you can you share can you share the sound properly? We 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 can hear you, but we're gonna we're gonna test out the speaker setup. So keep maybe you can keep talking, and we'll um we'll hear you. Okay, wait. So you can you can share me well through the speakers of the room then. No, no, we can't. So we're we're testing that out though. <laughs> can you just maybe you can keep talking, and we'll we'll keep we'll let you know yeah. when it works. Yeah. So. Okay, yeah, feel free to, to do your thing. And, yeah, uh, I can count or something like one, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. Yeah, yeah. I can, eight, I can let you ten. know when we do it again. One, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You can, you can stop. Yeah, you can hear us. <laughs> Wait, does it? Is it okay now? Andrew. Yeah, let me know when to start talking again. Kathy, can you talk to me? Yeah, yeah. Can you guys hear me now? Hello? Oh, wait. I think he should be talking if we can't hear him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me know when to try again. Hey, hey, Daddy, can you talk again? Hello, yes. guys. Oh hey, I want to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've met. Like, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, it's a nice very Yeah, it's very, very. Uh, I, 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 Hey, Daffy, can you talk again? Hello, Andre, can you hear me? Is it okay now? Ah, uh, okay. We can uh, we can hear you, but it's not coming. Oh, you right need place. to select it on here. I'm sorry. Okay. So go to your. Uh, okay, let me let me know when uh, try again. Yeah, that's right. Okay, wait. Can, can you do it again? Uh, Daffy, can you say something? Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. But there's one one thing we need. Uh, one thing is, can we can we play sound from this computer successfully? Yes. Now, now we can. Let's try it. Okay. Make... 
I, I think we're good on your end, Daphne. You can come in. Thanks. Can you you can hear us? Okay. We'll, we'll find out. Okay, so now I should play some kind of oh, music here or something. Okay, this is the computer. Oh, oh, good, good. Yeah, can you can you play yours? Is this uh, version? You're gonna have like five cleats. I, I, oh, uh, excuse me. The sound still on here still isn't working. Can I turn off the volume here? It's still this is not, now this the one thing it's not working is this. Oh, is that volume? Can I turn off the volume here? Or? Yes, it is. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, turn that on. This should be our volume for this. Yeah, make sure that uh, still your volume on the computer is almost It's up. It's up. It's up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wait. So let's let's try it again. Oh wait. Now now we're getting an echo. Now we're getting an echo. That's good. Um, oh, we need to take uh, we need to take the audio from here, right? Yeah. And the chat. Yeah. That okay. one's that one's coming into that, and then Daisy's changing out of that. Um, uh, everything that everything. Okay. The one issue here is the uh, echo with the. Um, That's not the only place. It's the first one. Um, no, I think with that, wait, I think it's when I talk. Just so maybe I talk here. Yeah, I didn't get it. Uh, it's under the denominator system. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, like, five years, I have things like every single time this location is still used to. And now we have time to as well. It's just. Yeah, it seems now like the one issue is my. Let's see. But I'm, this seems to have an echo. I think that's the one issue. Yeah. Wait, is this still me? Is this still echoing? Uh, or, 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 is my going to think the it's, it's only when he's talking through it, right? That it's echoing. Just make sure this is set. I mean, it's set to this, right? I'm pretty sure. E need. Okay. Uh, uh okay let me try something here oh good yes yes what time do you use? Now. Right now. Oh, so yeah. 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 I'm, I'm it was working this morning for a few minutes, but I think this yeah. was plugged into that. That was yeah, so the problem is I've got two different systems going. Um, let me try to set up another one. Thank you. I really appreciate all that. We're going to set up another one. Another one. These pods. Yeah, these pods. But like the the patients were like. Yeah. So I'm sorry to delay everyone. We're setting up another another sound system. So be a little bit of a delay. I'm sorry about that. Wait, it's not. Can you set it up over here on this computer? Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to go down and go quick and deliver yeah. something to the wheel. Here you go. So, so okay. there's no feedback on the Zoom, at least. And we just want to let you know. I'll meet you back over. Yeah, Jay, sorry. I think there's still echo in the voice. Wait, oh, yeah, actually, is that? I don't Ask him to talk. Can you, can you talk in my trail? Uh, hey, Andrew, how are you? I, I don't know the feedback on the Zoom, at least. It's quite good on the Zoom. Oh, sorry. I can't hear you. I don't know if it's, if it's your end or if it's just. I don't, I don't hello, know hello, that. hello. Test, test, test. One, two, three. Uh, is it good? I think it's okay. Uh, hi, hi, hello, hello, hello. Yes, yes, yes. Is it yes. working? Like, <laughs> did it start working? <laughs> like, when we come up to, to uh, somebody giving a talk to multi, can we just like switch off the rest? I think it's time when there's like a QA, but that, I, I think that'd be probably. <laughs> no, I mean, the thing you did with the microphone was fine, I think. So, uh, wait, is it possible? Yeah. So, Oh, that wasn't very. I think that wasn't very. No, but it's not that it was fine. Just that we just need to switch off the microphone. Is it possible to switch off the microphone? To what? Switch so off the microphone. Point, at some point, I think our issue was that like the speaker from um from Zoom 
uh-huh. when they, they would speak, there would yeah. be echo, and I think it was everything was fine, but they would just also hear themselves in the microphone. Okay. I think there was other stuff going on. Uh, I don't know. Wait, this is pretty helpful for debug. Yeah. <laughs> you don't mind, yeah. Thank you. Okay, ask them the talk. Oh, wait, we're getting feedback from the system. Also, if I was getting rid of whatever you think would be helpful, basically. I know, man. I'm No. <laughs> uh, Maybe you can make me Go ahead and ask them to speak again and see if they can hear. I want to see if. What's that? What's that? Go ahead and ask them to speak. Hey, um, my Trey, any chance you can speak again? We're trying to see if we can. Hello, can't... hey, this, this, this. Oh, yeah, I can hear yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's good. good. Yeah. yeah. That's, 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 kind of that's coming on. That's, that's pretty good. Right. That's not right. Oh, it's not? <laughs> right. So we don't want I'm to okay with that. It's not. Uh, tell them to go. Plug it in the microphone. Yeah. Tell yeah. them to, to go again. I think we're getting there something. Like, All right. So, yeah, there, there's no feedback now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Wait, so this was coming from here? Yeah. Maybe we can just use the mic. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. Hopefully, this will be solved shortly. Uh, Moitria, can you talk again? I'm sorry to make you do this. Uh, no, 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 hey, hey, Andrew. Hello, hi, everyone. Test, test, test. Working? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we can hear him, but it's not very loud. Hi, hi, hi. Yes. Hello. Better? We, we can hear you. It's just not very loud. No, not loud. Okay. I guess my voice is echoing. But the tech people are here debugging stuff, which is why we're asking you about this. Thank you for uh, that. No, 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 it's yeah. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Oh, wait, is it? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, you can hear him well. He's true, just let you go. Yeah, now I hear feedback on Zoom as well. Wait. Actually, now can you speak again? I think that's hi, hi, test, test, hello, hi, test. <laughs> uh, I think the last one was pretty good. Uh, it was, it was still open to the system, so turning this thing off. And I'm plugging this into here. And this is going to here. Okay. Um, Whatever it was in the morning was working pretty well for a while. Yeah. And, uh, go ahead and. Uh, is this is this full? Uh, it looks like we're still getting an echo. But Moitria, can you say hi again? Hi everyone. Welcome to the Site and Sound Workshop. Thank you, thank you. I think that worked well. I think the issue is my echo. Yeah, I do hear the feedback on Zoom.
Unmuted. Do you hear that? Okay, great. I'm going to unplug this and we'll get back to you soon. That's so okay. Oh, so we need this one. So, yeah, you can throw one like that.
I think we ran out of. Can we have somebody talk on the other end? Oh. Can see if it's working or Excuse me, can somebody uh, say something on Zoom, please? Uh, say something? I could play something. Yeah. Oh, that's, good. that's good. Wait, so does the sound come from here now? It's coming from here and it's also coming out into. So we can also share from. Okay, yeah, perfect. Sure. I think we said. Great. So everything, everything's working, I think. Hopefully Wait, can we, we try playing a sound on the. Yeah, let's do that as well. The final. Test. The violin test. He just holds the microphone. Wait, can you show okay. it from the. It's just coming through the speakers on this. So we're going to have to set your output, whatever, wherever you get into that, to, uh, to this device that you need. There we go. Thank you. Let's do a round of applause for the. Great. So I'm sorry. So sorry for the delay. Uh, we're going to proceed as usual and uh, do our second paper session for the day, and it's going to be chaired by Daphne. <clears throat> okay. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, we'll start with uh, two papers that we didn't have time to um, to show in the morning. Uh, so and they're like uh, both uh, pre-recorded. So the first one uh, title is Sound Adversarial Audiovisual Navigation, and I'll play the video now. Thank you. 
next to the <clears throat> the next paper that's also from the previous session um title is um semi semi supervised exploration via multisensory ecogruity definitely the zoom screen is not shared i think sorry i think the zoom screen is not shared oh Sorry. Is it okay now? Yeah, it works. Okay.
Great. <clears throat> so moving on to the next paper. Um, Who was the first one? So uh, the title of this paper is How to Listen, Rethinking Visual Sound Localization. And I uh, will present it by Magdalena Fuentes. Hello, you hear me well? Yes, okay. So I'm gonna be presenting this work that was led by Ho Jiang Wu and my other colleagues at uh, New York University and the script. So the object of this work was uh, in the context of like, what is, uh, what object is making that sound in an image? So if it's the, or a video of a violin, the goal is to find that is the object that's producing sound. If the video is on vehicles, the object is to find a vehicle in, in that image, given the sound. So the study was focused on three main things that we wanted to do. We wanted to understand the design choices be, behind visual sound localization methods, so the ones that existed before as well. We wanted to understand a little bit better what are the models actually learning from the data, from this audiovisual data, and we wanted to understand what insights the evaluation benchmarks, and by that I mean the data sets are providing for this task. That's the part of like rethinking. So a little bit of context um, of how this is typically done. When you, like a lot of previous work, what they do is you have an image of, uh, and, and the corresponding audio of, of the object that, that's standing there. And what you do is to train uh, an audio, an image encoder with some sort of distance, like contrastive loss, for instance, and project them into the same space. And for the localization part, typically uh, what people do is divide the image into patches, so just small, smaller images, and then the, get the embedding, the image embedding for those patches, get the audio embedding from the corresponding, let's say, second of audio, and then compute the distance of the patches with respect to the audio and those that have the, the violin should be closer to the audio than those that don't have it. That's what typically is done. And that means that you, as I said, uh, get the, the grid and then you get a bunch of embeddings and you train your model like that. We took a little bit of a different perspective to this. What we did, we use uh, explainability methods from like uh, that are typically used in, for instance, computer vision to understand where the model is attending for a given label. Instead of doing that for labels, what we did was to get the audio embedding from the audio encoder. So I get the sound of the violin, I get the embedding for that sound. And then I use that as a query for the image encoder instead of a label. So that will give me hopefully uh, the, the image encoder attending to where in the image that sound was produced. That's an alternative um, way of, of doing localization that we, we explore in this work. So the study, basically we looked at three things. Different types of encoders. Uh, basically, in summary, don't, don't worry too much about that. That's very loaded table, but in summary, what we saw in the encoders was ResNet versus transformers. Uh, the localization strategy, so these patches, dividing the image in patches versus explainability. And then for the loss function, typically people use contrastive loss, this, this idea of bringing the two embeddings together. And there are some previous work that do uh, negative mining, which is you get negative examples, not only from other videos, shuffling things as, as uh, is typically done, but also getting patches from the same image. So those are the three things that we wanted to compare. So architecture, localization strategy, and the loss function. So a little word on test data sets before. We looked at four data sets for this study. And these three rows show the different statistics of those data sets. The data sets are Flickr SoundNet, at the first column, BGG sound sources, music synthesis. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I made more. 
That's okay. Yeah, thank you. So the first column is Flickr Soundnet. The second one is BGG Sound Sources. Those two are typically uh, benchmarks used for, for localization, audiovisual localization, then music synthesis and urban sets, which I'm gonna talk a little bit later. The first row is showing the number of simultaneous bounding boxes in those uh, in those images, in the, in the videos. So for instance, Flickr all, always has one at a time. BGG Sound Sources mostly has one, but also has some videos with two and three and so on. Music Synthesis always has two. Urbanses has a distribution that's like a little bit uh, less concentrated. The second row, which is interesting, is the distribution of the position of bounding boxes for the different data sets. So you can see certain concentration for Flickr and BGG Sound Sources in the middle of the image. And Music synthesis is four videos of different instruments. That's why you have these four things. And Urbanses is a traffic data set, so it's a little bit more spread out because vehicles are moving around. The last row is um, the it's showing the number of the percentage of frames and percentage of area of these boundary boxes, which is roughly the the first one has like uh, mostly uh, the boundary boxes are occupying forty percent. The second one same tendency and for music synthesis and urban sets, bounding boxes are smaller. Why is it important to look at these things in, in my opinion? Because for instance, based on these statistics, we use as baseline a bounding box in the middle of the image without any prediction of any model at all. Just to know what happens if we don't do anything, it's just put a bounding box there, how do we score in, in intersection over units? For music synthesis, Instead, we put four bounding boxes. And for one it was a little bit more difficult, so we put like a bounding box trying to, that was it, the one that scored the best. So here are uh, some of the results of the study. I'm gonna try to walk you through them. So basically the table is divided by data set. So Flickr, PGG, Music, and Urbanzas. The baselines are the ones that I just mentioned. LDS is a um, state-of-the-art um, localization method that was published in CPR last year. Diesel is only a baseline for music synthesis, and the three la latest methods are ours. The first one is the RC grad is ResNet-based, and the other two are transformers, and also uh, a benchmark with text. So the image in the left, this one that, like, well, base, first of all, one interesting thing that we observed with the baselines, for instance, for BGG, SS, and for Flickr, only with the bounding box in the middle of the image, we scored really high. Compare even to the, the other of the methods and previous baselines, which was a surprising and not so surprising uh, result, which uh, we think is interesting for moving forward in these methods. And the other interesting trend is like, for instance, for the, baseline, the LDS baseline, we noticed that it tended to predict uh, the, bound, the heat maps in the middle of the image independently of the data set. So here is like the output of the model on the left and on the right, the distribution, the actual distribution of the data set. And we think that has to do with biases of the data that was used to train and also the patches that tend to, to concentrate or be coarser and concentrate to the patches that are in the middle in its training. And then for RC grad, which is our ResNet based um, model, we saw that it can adapt quite nicely to the different distributions of the data set. And it can, it, it is quite versatile in that sense. And for the transformers, we thought initially that the transformers will do better than ResNet because that's uh, what typically happens. It scored pretty bad. And what we notice is that is because of the way that we are evaluating these models. Typically, if you are gonna, let's say, uh, identify a bird that's sounding, the bounding box is around the bird. And what the transformer tend to do is to focus on a specific, like the peak where the sound was actually being produced. So, or the head of the bird. And that scored really badly in, because the bounding box is, is much bigger than that. 
So there is also like a matter of like maybe with the actual literacy that we have right now at, at the level of the, the course bonding books we have, it's very difficult to, to evaluate these models. And just a qualitative example here. Um, this is what I'm talking about. This, the, the left um, square is all BGG sound sources examples. The right is Urbanzas. This is one of the examples that like, if you see, I don't know if I can. Here, this is where this is the prediction and the volume of effects are the whole word. And then the score rates are saying like this is where the sound is being produced. And that's of course going to, to score bad, but it doesn't mean that necessarily the model is wrong. And these are the type of differences that we saw between ResNet and this responder. And yeah, things like Another thing that like these models are typically use one image and a portion of sound. So they are don't do don't, don't use any dynamics. And for examples such as this one, in which this vehicle is parked, this vehicle is moving, this one is producing sound, the model doesn't know and it will say like, oh, the bigger car is the one that's producing sound because of this lack of dynamics. Just uh, one demo of uh, the output of RC grad, the ResNet model in on the urban data set. And this one you saw in the <laughs> test sound. So just a couple of words on, on future work on that. As I said, there is a lot of room for improvement of audiovisual visualization uh, localization models. If we add dynamics, for instance, flow or multiple frames, if we add multi-channel audio, all of these models are based in mono audio and even stereo will pr produce uh, or give a lot of information about the, the spatial information about the sources. And also uh, moving from like all videos in third person to egocentric will be super cool to do. And that's it for our secret. Uh, thank you so much for. Is the sound still coming through? Somebody said they're having trouble. Um, the dust, the sound is still going through. No, they can't. Okay, they. Oh, no. Okay, so. I think the Zoom sound is not shared. Sorry? Oh, I think uh, the, the Zoom sound audio sharing was not enabled. Like we could hear the speaker, but not the uh, sound from oh, the computer. Okay. So, so sorry about that. Can you, no, sorry. Can you hear the, sorry, the examples? <laughs> um, say one moment. Can you hear it now? Uh, yeah. Thanks. Oh, yeah, yeah. So sorry about that. That should be fixed. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, thanks so much for this presentation. Uh, we'll uh, move on to the next one uh, with the same presenter. So the title of this paper is uh, Urban SAS, like the data set we saw about um, urban sound inside data set and benchmark. So. Take this. All right. Hopefully, this doesn't annoy you like before. Yeah. So, hi again. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about uh, another piece of work that's very related. Basically, is that data set that uh, one of the data sets I mentioned just now. And this work was done in collaboration with people from New York University, Universidad Pompeu Fabra, the MTG. Uh, Bosch Research and Universidad de la República. So the context of this uh, data set is that, uh, as you all know in this workshop, we uh, use to navigate the world, we use the location of sound sources. When we cross the street, we pay attention to cars are coming or a siren and we make space and stuff like that. So uh, being able to make machines to recognize sounds and navigate as we do will have 
many uh, applications in uh, self-driving cars or even for people that are hard of hearing to as assertive devices and, and, and so on. So we looked into uh, this a little bit and we, well, what do we want to do to for, for making machines able to do that? Well, understanding a real scene is determining what is sounding, but also where it's sounding and how it's moving. And in particular in urban settings, this is super interesting, but because it will allow to do, for instance, low cost privacy serving mobility systems if we do only audio, awareness devices for the hard hearing and so on. So when we start looking at this, um, I come from the more the audio side of things. Uh, I'm a machine listening researcher. The way that this is done in machine listening, so machine learning for audio, is typically that data sets are uh, synthetic or in, done in unrealistic conditions because localizing a source for audio people, uh, for us, means typically having multi-channel audio, so multi-arrays for five channels, and then knowing where the sound source is located, the distance to the microphone, the elevation, and uh, and the angle with respect to, to the microphone. And doing that in the wild, in like urban settings or real world applications is really complicated. So what we did is to look at what computer vision people are doing and like trying to bridge thinking about that. And we got inspiration from a paper that was looking at inferring the position of vehicles but instead of knowing all of these details about the location of the vehicle, they were using bounding boxes as a proxy for the position from the video. So that's why we curated this data set that's called Urban Sound and Sight or Urbansas that has uh, 5,000, more than uh, 5,000 clips uh, spanning 50 locations in different countries. And the reason why we do this is because when we start looking at it, uh, at this problem, there was no available uh, data set for it. And we wanted to be able to do not only audio, but audio visual research. So we went all in, in annotating the data set and we annotated not only the audio, but the video. The data set has a video at 24 frames per second, which we annotated at two frames per second with bounding boxes of the different vehicles that appear in the in the data set, we annotated occlusions, we annotated uh, the audio uh, with strong labels, meaning the beginning and end of each audio event with classes, with off-screen sounds. And the idea is that at the interaction of these two things, we can understand better how things uh, happen in urban sounds. Because sometimes, like you can see here, sometimes you hear something before you see it, or you see something before you, you can actually hear it. So we annotated both audio and video to understand these things. We paid particular attention and having a diversity of conditions in the data set. So both active and inactive scenes. So not all of the scenes have vehicles. They are like their videos of actual urban scenes. Sometimes there's a vehicle passing, sometimes there's nothing. And that adds a really extra challenge for modeling. Um, different amount of vehicles per, per frame. So they are really complex scenes or like just only, only one vehicle, different classes of vehicles, different camera angles, different scene compositions, et cetera. And we also included uh, the lighting. So night and day uh, um, labels. And we provide uh, as part of the release of the data set a benchmark that does only audio localization, but it does only audio localization again in the video. It's just um, a standard audio uh, model that uses not only the log spectrogram um, that you might be familiar with, but also the difference in phase of the audio signal. The, yeah, yeah, hold on a minute. Yeah, I'll see that. Uh, and produces basically it, uh, where in the image is the vehicle located and uh, what class is it. So, and we um, quantize the image in different uh, regions to, to make that localization. So it will look like this. 
just to speed up. This is how the model looks like. The output is in the middle, the ground truth is in the right. And the nice thing is that we evaluated this with the intersection over union that can be compared to the audiovisual data sets, the audiovisual models, sorry. I'm not gonna go through the results, but basically the random baselines work really, really bad. And it's a challenging problem that we hope this data set, uh, we, we managed to get some good results, but it was it, it presents really interesting challenges that we hope that are useful for the audio visual community as well. And some of the directions that are exploring is one of the papers that was presented in the previous uh, session. So audio only localization with this uh, probability distributions, the visual sun localization, and more than that. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for those presentations. They're very interesting. Um, the next uh, paper uh, should be this one. Uh, just, uh, on the slide. Slide show. Here you go. Okay. So the title of this paper is on, on negative sampling for audiovisual contrastive learning from movies. Um, and the uh, presenter is, uh, sorry, like uh, Mari Kala. 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 Take away. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mahdi, and I'm going to talk about negative sampling for contrastive learning from movies. This is a joint work with my colleagues, uh, Shervin, Lingi, Nagendra, and Ashok uh, at Networks Research. So um, let's quickly review how does contrastive uh, cross-modal contrastive learning works. Given a bunch of videos that you have, uh, we define a, a two-stream network, one for video, one for audio and um, use those in order to extract embedding for video and audio. And the objective is that the audio embedding for an instance I is closer to its own video embedding than any other video embedding coming from other instances. And of course, you can swap the places for video and audio. So that's the gist of cross-modal. And if you, you know, compare it, for instance, with the SimCLR objective that you give one instance and augment it two ways, think about augmentation as switching modality. You switch from video to audio or the other way around. So that's the same idea. Um, but of course, like we are Netflix and we want to do this on movies. So uh, we very soon realized that applying it very naively doesn't work. So we start dig deeper into what's happening. So the first thing is the, the data regime is different. Uh, usually when you look at the data sets that are used for self-supervised learning in literature, these are like kinetics, audio set. These are, uh, I would call it large catalogs of short videos. You have hundreds of thousands of 10 second videos. In our case, we have a small catalog of long videos, a couple of thousand movies, but each one is one hour and a half. Uh, on the top of that, um, we, re we realize that the distribution of, of the data is also very important. So uh, I'm using uh, this example, for instance, uh, the first row is some random frames from Titanic. The, uh, the second row is from Matrix. And uh, if you just uniformly sample uh, your mini batch, you would realize that oops, you would realize that you would have a lot of examples that come. Uh, we call it cross content. One is from movie one, the other one is from movie B, and these are uh, legit negative pairs, but they are extremely easy for a model. And uh, we actually did a very uh, funny experiment. Just did average RGB values of frames for show, and we just plot them. It's perfect for separation of movies. And these, uh, and there are many more things like this, such as the face of the main character, the scenes, the, the, the thematic music that the director uses, all th those things, we call it uh, artifacts, content exclusive artifacts, that if you don't use them properly, you would end up a uh, having a contrastive model that is, it's a very easy objective. So the training goes down, you're happy, you do generalization, nothing else. So, uh, it's important to do negative sampling within the show. Uh, and for instance, if you uh, pick in this one, the red and red, first these are like objects that appear in the show, let's say face of the main character, it's likely this happens. It's uh, not very probable because you have the diversity within the show. Um, so pretty much what we did in this work was to start 
extremely sampling negatives from one movie. So we even got to a case which the entire batch at each training, uh, each step of training was coming from one single movie. Uh, the other thing which uh, is different for uh, training from movies versus like kinetics or um, audio set is that these are uncurated uh, data sources. If you look at kinetics, these are like Veltrum videos. There's a single action starting from there and ending. So yes, while we are not using labels, uh, it's a still a Veltrum data set. So your supervision is through the clean data set. While in, in movies, there's nothing like this. So we have artistic curation. There's no blurry frames. They're like perfectly shot, but there's no semantic curation. So with that said, um, here is, I'm going to quickly move through the modeling. We have like N movies. We clip them into three seconds. We have audio and video for each one, pass them to backbones for video and audio, projection head to get to some uh, common latent embedding, and then uh, compare it. Um, in order to create the batch, one thing we make sure, and this is like regular NCE loss, uh, one thing that we make sure is to, to sample a lot of uh, clips from the single show. And pretty much the idea is this, if you just pull all the clips of all movies together, you do IA uh, random sampling uniform, it's a very low probability that you end up two clips from the same movie in your batch. Hence, most of your negatives in an NCE formulation are going to be extremely easy. So we force it to at least pick K samples from each movie. And the, the one thing that we want to measure is uh, we calculate the similarity of negatives, just negatives, and we put it in two sets, uh, similar and dissimilar. And the ideal goal is these two should not be different. Otherwise, the model would cheat because it knows this negative come from the same show. Let me just quickly reduce. So that's a metric we, uh, we track. So quickly to the experiments. Um, here you can see that as we increase the K means more uh, negative sampling from the same show, the training becomes harder as expected, but generalization becomes also better on, uh, on uh, three action recognition uh, and two audio classification. This is linear evaluation and these are gains uh, on the top. I don't have more in time in five minutes to go over these, more than happy to answer uh, afterwards. Uh, we also wanted to see that the fact that we are doing this sort of sampling, does it actually deliver what we intended? We want to get rid of the content exclusive artifacts. Um, so the plot on the left actually shows the KL divergence between the distribution of the negatives when you sample within a show or just uniformly. And as you can see, if you don't do that, you just the regular sampling, the uh, IID sampling, not only the difference is, more, is larger, but the model continues to cheating even more and more as you continue training. That's why it goes up. But as you increase K, uh, you, you have a way to, to control this, this thing and do not let the model to, to exploit these artifacts which are not semantically useful. Another way to measure it is we define a movie clip, a movie like clip-based movie classification. Pick every three seconds and assign the label of the movie and try to do classification. It should not be able to do that unless there's some uh, artifacts there. And the, again, we see by doing this, we can reduce. I'm not going to go through the state of the art. Uh, you can just refer to the, the full papers on archive, but uh, we are not beating the state of the art. So do not uh, expect to see beating state of the art when referring there. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, okay, so moving on to the next paper, uh, which is actually this one. So this one uh, is from the University of uh, uh, it has sound. Uh, sorry? It has sound. So it I should be all right. Hopefully we work. Okay, and uh, so the title is Audiovisual Voice Operation Transformer. Uh, we are presented to you by uh, Juan uh, Montesinos. Yes. Okay. Yeah? Yes. Okay, awesome. So take away a moment. Let's go. Just... Okay. No, no. Sure. Enable Matthew. Okay. So hello everyone, glad to be here to present this work in audiovisual voice separation. Uh, first of all, let me a bit uh, introduce what audiovisual voice separation is. And the idea would be, uh, we have a mixture of sounds and we would like to isolate the voices present in that mixture of sounds by leveraging the visual information. So we can see a very simple example. So 
here we have five voices, three instruments. Our goal could be to recover the voice of the guy inside the box. Um, basically, the main advantages of this audiovisual versus audio only is that uh, we leverage with motion, so the algorithm, the performance is usually better, and it works well in noisy scenarios. Also, uh, we can deal easily with variable amount of voices, but the major drawback is the additional computational cost to process the video stream. To alleviate this, uh, we propose to use space landmarks, which are what is inside the box. Uh, so those are key points that keeps or summarize the structure and the motion of the face. So we can get rid of some preprocessing steps compared to uh, using raw video. And there are some other advantages. So we can reduce the storage cost that for people like me, in smaller universities is very good. Uh, so for example, working with video, even in a poor resolution of 200 by 200, that implies terabytes of data and millions of data points, while Larmax are thousands of points. So as well, the fewer data points, probably the fewer model parameters we need to solve the problem. And it's also less prone to overfit so that we can end up training end-to-end -end in both large scale and small scale data sets as we will show later. And also using face armaxes is good from a privacy concern perspective because we don't exploit the ethnicity or the accent accents of people and we don't need to keep track of the identity for example we can extract uh, extract the face max on an edge device and send that plus the mixture to a cloud server keeping the privacy of the user more or less intact um, so to have a good trade-off latency versus uh, performance which was our main goal we proposed this model which is a transformer based model where we process the face max with a graph convolutional network so we extract from the audio um, the spectrum via short time Fourier transform. We downsample it for efficiency, and we use this encoder that keeps the temporal dimension. And we can construct this uh, audiovisual signal that is fed into a transformer that process uh, the signal both uh, from the temporal perspective and the frequential perspective to obtain a complex mask. So basically this mask, if we multiply that by the input spectrum, we're gonna get a very good uh, estimation of the isolated voice. However, we realize that there are some interferences that are really attenuated, but still present and they can be a little bit annoying. And we show that if we use a second smaller stage, so this encoder decoder, it has very few 10 times less parameters on the transformer. And we solve a different optimization problem. So at the beginning, we were solving an L1 uh, over a complex, um, map, a complex mask. And in the second one, we have some binary masks uh, and we use binary cross entropy. So if we solve a different optimization process with a, this small network, we can boost the results and save training time, uh, power, resources, and et cetera. So we test this in a large scale data set per speech. It's Voxelab has 2000 hours in different languages. And we compare mainly against visual voice, which is a very good paper using raw video and the appearance of the people. And we basically perform quite similar, although we have less interferences and you will, call, you will observe that qualitatively. Um, so this is an example. We have these two guys from a show from a show in the U.S. Ah, I'm just glad that Later I've been able to remember they were Mexican. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And they didn't know that I didn't know that. And basically, this uh, this is the estimated uh, landmarks as well as the prediction. Uh, the model is not trying to remove people laughing, so that will not be filtered out. <laughs> they found out they were Mexican. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And they didn't know that I didn't know. And if you compare to Visual Voice, which was a state of the art paper, uh, you will see that there are less interferences and that we model better the situations in which the, uh, the person speaking is seen from a side view. Uh, I'm just glad that later I on I found out they were Mexican. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And they didn't know that I didn't know. And that's so, in short, yeah, we can reduce the interferences and uh, improve that the scenario were from the side views. Um, we also tried this uh, on singing voice. The main conclusion here, despite the papers, is that we cannot, as you can see here, if we train our model in a speech, it cannot extrapolate well uh, to um, singing voice. So just a quick example. It failed, but... Yeah, so 
So this is filter out. Yeah, baby. Um, this is a previous paper where you can see there are some corals and so on. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank you so much. Very interesting results. Um, yeah, uh, let's go to the next server. Oh, could the presenters please? We, we've been we're running a bit out of work, so please try to keep it within the five minutes. Also, like look at Andrew and me. We'll let you know if you're like running out of time. Uh, so the next paper is um, called Everything at Once, Multimodal Fusion Transformer for Video Retrieval. <clears throat> and the presenter is Nina. Nina Shvetsova. Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Thank you for introduction. Uh, this is joint work with the following authors. Um, our world is multimodal and humans capture their world uh, combining multiple sensory signals such as vision, sound, or touch. And video data approximate this kind of input combining video and audio information. And this information can be further enhanced with text description. So coherence of multiple modalities can be used to learn multimodal representations multimodal embedding space. In such embedding space, uh, the input from one modality such as text can be um, matched to other modalities such as video, audio, or combined video audio representations. And available such as video retrieval. So how we can learn multimodal embedding space in self supervised space? One of the standard solutions can be to utilize pairwise contrast laws. For example, in case of video, audio, and text, we can extract uh, uh, features by modality specific encoders, then we can pull features over time and then project them uh, into multimodal embedding space by modality specific projection. And in multimodal embedding space, uh, we can apply pairwise contrast laws, such as contrast laws between video and audio modality, contrast laws between video and text modality, and text and audio modality. So in this case, we have a multimodal embedding space where we can match one modality to another modality. But is it good enough to represent multiple modalities at once? For example, if we want to create a representation for video and audio modality together, we can separately extract embeddings for each modality and then average them to obtain video audio representation. But in this case, um, embeddings were extracted independently and they do not utilize clues from other modalities. So how we can obtain a huge representation for such input? So for this, we propose to use the fusion transformer. So uh, let's consider the case where we create a representation for all three modalities together. So our architecture stays the same with uh, extracting tokens with modality specific encoders. And then we combine them to a joint set of tokens um, and apply fusion transformer where uh, we allow tokens from modality stand to choose them. And output tokens that are enhanced with the information from other modalities, then uh, combined into final representation in a similar way. But how we can train such a fusion transformer in tell supervised ways that can uh, utilize correlations for all modality combinations? So for this, we propose to train a fusion transformer with a combinatorial input on all possible modalities combination. So we apply fusion transformer to uh, obtain video representation alone only for video, for video and audio together, for audio alone, and all other combinations. And uh, we apply contrast loss not only between single modalities, but also between all possible combinations of modalities. So, in terms of performance, we related our method in zero shot text video retrieval task, and we compare it to the methods that do not use audio information at all and to the methods that use uh, average video and audio embeddings and, as video representation. And we show that a fused video audio representation from our method increased performance in 6% and you cooked, in, you cooked two data sets. We also evaluated our method in zero section localization task and show that um, fused video audio representation also improved performance in both considered data sets. Um, 
We also analyzed fusion capability of fusion transformer. Here I'm showing uh, average attention for query keys tokens from different modalities. And we observed that some uh, had uh, have strong um, um, have strong attention inside for, for single modality fusion. And in the, between there is some head that are responsible for cross modal attention. And here are some results for uh, text video retrieval. I'm showing top three retrieved videos for a given text query. And we found that even um, if a correct video does not occur in top three results, uh, retrieved videos are still semantically relevant for the query. So is it all? Uh, our code models are available. Uh, I invite you to try it out. And you can find uh, more information about our method in the paper or in the poster session. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's very interesting. Um, let's uh, go move on to the next. By the way, uh, we're running out of time, so we won't do uh, a Q&A session, but we'll have the, the pretty long poster session afterwards and feel free to uh, find the speakers there and like uh, have discussions about the papers. So uh, next uh, presentation is um, uh, the paper title is Leveraging Real Talking Faces via Cell Supervision for Robust uh, Forage Detection. And uh, the presenter is Alexandros Haliasos. Sorry. Um, Hi, I'm Alex, I'm a PhD student at Imperial College London, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about our CVPR paper, Leveraging Real-Time Faces via Self-Supervision for Bus Forgery Detection. So two main types of face forgery include identity swapping and expression swapping. So given a source and a target video, identity swapping uh, maps the identity from the source onto the target, while expression swapping transfers the expression, keeping the identity unchanged. So there has been a lot of uh, recent interest in detecting such facial forgeries due to the potential social harm. And although deep learning based detectors uh, work very well on samples generated by forgery types that has seen during training, they tend to underperform on novel types. There have been recent works uh, that address this cross manipulation generalization problem but they often focus on low level cues that are easily destroyed by common operations such as compression. So uh, to address both cross manipulation generalization and robustness to common corruptions, uh, previous work Lip Forensics forces the network to focus on high level cues around the mouth region by pre-training the network to perform lip reading. However, it focuses exclusively on the mouth region, uh, ignoring potentially salient cues in other facial regions, and also requires costly text transcriptions in the pre-training phase. So for this work, we ask ourselves, can we force a detector to focus on high level cues related to facial appearance and behavior by leveraging real and unlabeled talking face videos, which uh, are abundant online? So to that end, uh, we propose a two-stage approach, dubbed real forensics. Um, and in, in the first stage, we leverage the correspondence between the auditory and visual modalities in talking face videos. So in particular, uh, we learn temporally dense representations in a self-supervised way that capture the information shared by the two modalities. So this is a factor associated with lexical content, identity, or emotion. In the second stage, we use these learned representations as targets to be predicted by a forgery detector in a multitask fashion in order to force the detector to focus on these high level cues. So in more detail, um, in the first stage, we, we use a cross-modal student teacher framework whereby students ingest real video and audio and are tasked with predicting targets generated by the momentum-based teacher uh, from the other modality. Uh, the students uh, contain additional predictors on top to uh, prevent the so-called representation collapse. And uh, the students are updated via usual gradient-based method like Adam, and the teachers uh, via an exponential moving average operation like in the, in the method bio, which this is uh, inspired by. 
And in the second stage, we use the video teacher, which is now kept frozen, to produce uh, these targets to be predicted. So uh, to assess cross manipulation generalization, we follow the protocol of training on three of the face forensics plus plus data sets, the manipulation types, and then testing an unseen type. And we do this for all four types in data set. And we see that uh, we perform on par with the state of the art in this setting. Further, uh, for cross data set generalization, we train on the full face forensics plus plus data set, and then we test on unseen challenging data sets. And we see that um, it performs it performs well, and it, and it shows that the detector can perform well even when it is exposed to uh, more challenging forgeries than originally trained on. Uh, finally, uh, to test robustness to common corruptions, uh, we train on clean samples, and then we test on samples that have been corrupted by various corruptions, common corruptions, uh, and we see that relative uh, to other methods. Uh, our method is more resilient uh, to, uh, it tends to be more resilient to, to corruptions, especially those that uh, corrupt low level content, such as um, compression. And this suggests that it indeed focuses more on, on high level cues. And uh, yeah, for more uh, experiments, the ablation study, you can check out our poster session Thursday or check out the full paper on archive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, okay, I think we have two more papers. So um, actually, okay, um, this one is a video. Okay, let's do this one and then have one more presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Ping Chuan Ma, a fourth year PhD student at Imperial College London. In this presentation, I will talk about visual speech recognition for multiple languages. This is a collaboration work with Stavros Petridis and Maya Pante. Visual speech recognition, also known as lip reading, allows machines to transcribe videos directly into text without any audio signals input. Today, to achieve better VSR performance, researchers focus on using large training sets. However, in this work, we demonstrate that designing better models is equally important to using large training sets. We propose a new architecture based on auxiliary tasks, where the VSR model also predicts audio and visual representations from pre-trained ASR and VSR models. And we show our approach outperforms all existing VSR works trained on public available datasets in English, Spanish, and Mandarin by a large margin. For English, we use public available datasets, such as LS2 and LS3, which are the two largest public available lip reading datasets. For Mandarin, we use a CMLR dataset. For Spanish, we use not only the CMU models, but also TED Talks in Spanish. Apart from this, we include unlabeled datasets like VoxLab2 and AV Speech for training. Next, let's move on to the models. The left image shows a baseline VSR models. The baseline VSR models is trained with cross-entropy loss and CCC loss, which are the typical two losses for speech recognition. The right side shows a VSR model with auxiliary tasks. The proposed auxiliary tasks are able to provide additional supervision to the intermediate layers of the VSR models. The training pipeline includes two steps. First of all, we train baseline ASR and VSR models. Then, at the second step, we freeze the weights of the pre-trained ASR and VSR models and train a new VSR model with auxiliary tasks. In the auxiliary tasks, 
we try to map the prediction from the intermediate layer of the new VSR model to the targets from the frozen ASR and VSR models. We present the results of LS3 on this slide. Firstly, we show that our model achieves SOTA performance without using extra datasets. Secondly, we show that our, the VSR performance goes much better by including more training data. For example, it includes at least to 17% absolute improvement in word error rate compared with the current sort of performance. This confirms the recent trend in the literature where using large training sets results in better performance. We also present results for other languages, like Mandarin and Spanish, and we show that our model also achieves sort of performance on these two languages. In any case, once this technology really becomes mature and we can truly do face and facial expression analysis in the wild, Muchos vecinos habían pasado la noche entera recortando sus propios papelitos porque también habían descubierto. Oh, I think this was it. Okay, let's thank this video. Okay. And we have one last presentation. Um, right. So, Um, okay, so the name of this paper is Top to, Top to the Beat Cross Model Music Beat, Lo Beat Localization for Dancing Videos. Will it be presented by you? You. <laughs> you. Okay, fantastic. Uh, great. Okay. Should we? Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Yu from Princeton University. I'm glad to be here to present our talk about um, top, uh, uh, Type to the Beat. Uh, it's a cross model generation of uh, music beat, uh, music beat based on the dance, dance music. So we propose a new task that is to, look, to locate the music beat based on the dance movement. So the only input here is the visual, visual part, and we want to uh, find the the music beat with the from the dance moves. So the motivation here is people can naturally feel the rhythm and the beats when watching when when watching the dance videos. So as shown in the figure, we can see uh, there are strong correlation between the dance movement and the, the music and the music beats. So uh, if we can successfully predict the vision uh, to pre predict the dance beat from the vision input, it may be, maybe we can generate uh, potentially better temporal alignment between the visual part and the audio part. So uh, this is, uh, so here becomes the problem formulation. Given the video, uh, given the video frames, we first uh, extract uh, the uh, 3D, 3D skeleton points for each uh, frame. And uh, then we can formulate the, uh, the dance moves by uh, using all the other key points. And in addition, we also calculate the 
uh, acceleration of uh, um, of each point. And so it, it is calculated by the difference between two frames. And so here we found this uh, speed difference may be better for for the for the model to capture the beats. Uh, this is a target of uh, this is a target of this, this problem. So we have uh, we have a lot of uh, body body movements, and we can uh, find the ground truth of uh, the the over each beat based on the music part, and we use that as the ground truth label for the vision prediction. Um, so this is our uh, our proposed uh, transformer for this task. In general, it contains two 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 sub uh, two subset, um, and uh, we we can leverage both of the uh, three of the three D body mo uh, motion and also the speed difference between the key points. So, given the dance movement skeleton as input, we first uh, leverage the skeleton feature of each joints and input them to a transformer encoder um, to leverage the video information and uh, meanwhile we also calculated the, the acceleration of um, of each joint so uh, we also input the, the, the speed difference to, to another transformer and then we, we field their feature um, by a joint cross model cross model of, uh, transformer encoder and the out uh, and then we take the output to a decoder and and generate the uh, final prediction using a uh, uh, um, MLP and the qualification layer. So, to better leverage the supervision signal in this task, we also propose to um, use a voting system, uh, a voting mechanism uh, for the inference. So, actually, it transfers the prediction from a binary qualification to a sequence to a sequence prediction. So uh, uh, here, the training target for each frame is uh, is a step uh, is a remaining step to the next speed. So in this way, uh, the model can can get uh, can be clearly um, confident at the predict the predicted uh, labels, which means um, how many how many frames to be the next uh, speed. And in this way, we uh, this is some video demo. Uh, maybe we cannot uh, we cannot play the, the sound here. Okay, um, it's okay. So the finally is the uh, this is our result as it, as it, as it, as it can be seen. We have two kind of uh, evaluation here. Um, ACCB means the background accuracy. Uh, it means the beat accuracy, and the ACC means the non-beat accuracy. So our model can achieve the trade-off between these two kind of uh, okay, the, the two kind of uh, um, uh, prediction, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, like we said, sorry about running a bit late, so uh, we're gonna skip the Q and A session. And yeah, we encourage everybody to to uh, discuss about the papers we present here during the coffee break. Uh, so let's thank the speakers again once more. Oh, hey, David. Great. Okay. Can you, you want to do a screen share? Yeah. Uh, once I screen share, I think I'll lose sight of you. You can hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. You won't see anything here anyway. So. <laughs> Great. Looks good. Perfect. So uh, I'm really excited to, to welcome David Brang uh, to speak here today. David is an associate professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. And we've seen a lot of computational work today talking about multi-sensory fusion, cross-modal learning. And David studies those topics too, but from a psych psychology standpoint. He studies how the human brain uh, integrates information from vision, sound and touch. So I'm really excited to hear uh, what David has to say. 
Perfect. Thanks so much, Andrew. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for having me at this workshop. So very broadly, my lab studies the neuroscience of auditory visual interactions. Um, and if at any point you can't hear any of the things that I'm presenting on the screens, kind of flag me down. I can still see video up, fortunately. So broadly, the goals of my research are to try to understand what information is shared across the senses. So in general, neuroscience has typically focused on the sensory systems in isolation, this idea that we have an auditory system and a visual system. But by integrating information across the senses, the brain can actually generate better models of the world. These are computationally more efficient. They enable um, better perceptual processing, faster responses, better detection. And in the context of noisy environments or after brain damage, one sense can support processing in another modality. And so a lot of people have already given the great examples of how lip reading can facilitate speech perception. And so my lab studies how the human brain can enable these auditory visual interactions and the statistical properties of the environment that they pick up on. Um, and then we apply these multisensory enhancements in a clinical context. So in this talk, I'll focus on how sounds benefit visual processing and conversely some of our other work on how vision benefits speech. So two sides of the same coin. And so one tenet in our work is that information is transferred across the senses to really optimize our experience of the world. And so there are different levels at which information is shared and different neurological mechanisms through which one modality can affect another. And I think a lot of these things can be useful when building computational models of how the senses interact. Because sensory interaction is not a unitary phenomenon, there's very different types of mechanisms and types of information. So one of the most common effects that we see is that when you have any type of co-occurring stimulus, so this can be a sound and a visual image appearing at the same time and at the same space, uh, position in space, then this will actually increase neural activity, increase the spatial, uh, the neural processing to that specific auditory and visual stimulus. And this information is transferred directly across the modalities. You don't need any secondary systems to coordinate this transfer of information. It's incredibly fast and robust. Alternatively, other rep rep cross-modal representations are much more conceptual. So these can be a modal representations, the idea that a large object is going to be associated with a loud sound or a high pitch. And these are all based on intensity mapping, such that you have this high level of each of these representations versus a small object will be associated with a quiet sound and even a low pitch or a dim flash of light. And so these are more amodal or higher conceptual representations. And further, there's some representations that are cross-modal, but a little bit more ambiguous, and we don't have a perfect understand understanding of what causes these sorts of representations. Sound symbolism, or the buikiki effect, is a popular version of this. And so this is cross-linguistic. Majority of languages across the planet have this association for wanting to associate the sharpish object with kiki and uh, the roundish object with the word booba. We think this happens because of the statistical mapping of the shapes that our mouth, mouth actually makes when producing these sounds. And so you think that these roundish shapes should be associated with more of a curvature of the, the sound and the text. And so there are a lot of different ways that perception benefits from multisensory signals. One already alluded to is this idea if you have a simultaneous auditory and a visual sim stimulus that's located in the same region of space, it's going to enhance neuroactivity to that specific stimulus. And so this would be greater than if you just presented either the auditory or the visual signal in isolation. We use this as a cue because if an object is present in the environment to both modalities, it's likely that it's an, it's an incredibly salient cue and we want it to attend to that stimulus. And so we have this super additivity of response to that specific stimulus. And this also plays in the idea that across the modalities, you have uncorrelated noise, but a correlated signal. So the easy way I like to think about this is you can see better with two eyes versus one eye. Even though the image to both your eyes is almost the same, you have less correlation of the noise across the two eyes. And so you have better vision when you add in this second redundant signal. And so a lot of the um, redundancy across the modalities can enhance perception, even though it's not exactly adding new information. The other way that the senses can help one another is each can have different expertise. Within the auditory domain, you have great temporal precision for the onset and offset of specific sounds, and you have spatial precision around your entire body, whereas you have limited line of sight within the visual modality. Conversely, within the visual frame, you have great spatial precision for anything you can see in front of you. And finally, each of the senses receives different information at different times. And so as I'm speaking, 
you get preparatory lip movements that can actually precede the onsets of sounds, particularly gestural cues, if you can see anything on the video, can precede the onsets of different beats and help segmentation of words um, but, or words within a sentence. And so the timing of the modalities can be asynchronous, and that asynchrony can actually help you provide um, or help you process information as it comes into your field of view. So today I want to look at a couple different ways that we think that the brain supports our ability. Oh, is everything okay? Oh, yes, it is. We're, you're, uh, we, I, it's fine. Keep going. <laughs> um, different ways that the brain supports auditory and visual processing. First, starting how the visual system benefits from auditory information, and then conversely, how the visual system supports auditory speech perception. And so behaviorally, we know there are a lot of different benefits of auditory processing on vision. If you present a sound at the same time as any type of visual stimulus, if you're trying to localize an object in space or respond as fast as you can as a race car driver to respond to that flash of light, a sound is going to increase cortical excitability within the visual system, speed up reaction time, and enhance detection thresholds. And if we look in the brain of humans, we can actually see that there are direct connections connecting up the auditory and the visual systems. But it's unclear what the exact information that's transmitted across these different modalities. My lab uses a technique um, called intracranial EEG to answer a lot of these questions in addition to other neuroimaging approaches. And so the reason why we want to use this approach is because it leverages high temporal and spatial resolution in in allowing us to track neural activity as it moves the brain. So physically what we do is we implant electrodes in the brains of patients with either epilepsy or brain tumor. So it's a clinical tool that doubles as a research tool within neuroscience. It's the only way that you can really acquire direct neurophysiological information from humans and it's a relatively rare clinical tool. And so it's a unique opportunity that we have access to to be able to do psychology and neuroscience studies with human populations and measure electrical activity generated in the human brain. And just as a side to orient people a little bit, this is going to be a raw voltage signal that we're acquiring from the surface of the brain as individuals are watching or listening to different types of stimuli. And then we can break down this raw voltage signal into its spectral components to be able to try to have some resolution of different types of information. In the low frequency domain of these um, neural signals, we can look at kind of a feedback or these um, top-down modulations of neural responses in this low frequency oscillation. Conversely, high frequency activity in the spectral power reflects a bottom up or this feed forward response. And this is analogous to any type of processing within a recurrent uh, neural network where you want both of these feed forward and feedback responses to be able to modulate neural activity. This is on the right is an examination of what some of this looks like if you just have somebody move their hand while you're measuring both the high frequency um, and the low frequency activity. You can have this very small response, neurons responsive to the hand moving, and then top-down feedback that's going to modulate neural activity much more broadly, such that if you had, had them attend to a region of their body, you're going to have much more of a broadband response throughout their uh, motor system. And so looking at auditory visual interactions with this technique, we can start to examine the type of information and the processing that happens when sound it enters into the visual system. So the first thing we found is that sounds activate visual cortex incredibly quickly within about 30 to 50 milliseconds. After a sound is presented, you get activity evoked within the visual system. And so this is an electrode on this lower left plot implanted within early visual areas, primary visual cortex of the human subject. And then we would have a sound presented at this time point and then activity evoked in, visual, in the visual system. Again, there's no visual stimulus. This is just the neural activity evoked to a visual response or to an auditory response, sorry. And for context, the visual system actually processes visual stimuli quite slowly. You don't usually respond to a visual stimulus until about 50 milliseconds. So sounds can actually modulate neural activity more quickly to sounds than to visual stimulus, which feels a bit counterintuitive. And it's not just um, a white noise burst, any type of auditory stimulus and any type of task will evoke this activity within the visual system. So even if your eyes are closed, you're relaxing, sounds are modulating activity in the visual system at all times, even if there's no visual stimulus to attend to. We see this effect broadly across the brain within the visual system. So this is all different regions of the visual system here. Any non-black electrode is regions that are responsive to sounds in addition to visual stimuli. And so the majority of visual areas actually are very sensitive to sounds. 
And then we can also compare the types of responses in this low frequency or high frequency activity. And there's a big difference in why um, or the physiological response of a sound in the visual system once we break it down into its spectral components. Because even though sounds are modulating activity within this low frequency domain, we don't tend to find that sounds modulate high frequency activity. So this driving of neural activity, these feed forward um, bottom up responses in the visual system. So this is a sound onset and the low frequency domain, a visual onset 400 milliseconds later produces a similar type of low frequency response but a very different pattern when we look at high gamma power, this measure of um, how much action potentials are being generated within the visual system. The visual response generates action potentials here, but we don't tend to see action potentials generated by the sound. And so one possible consequence of this is that sounds are acti activating visual cortex in general without relaying any content. And so one of the important things that we want to be able to understand is what is the information that's actually being relayed across the senses? What statistical features of the environment is the visual system picking up on because the auditory system it has some relevant information there? And so one of the first things we wanted to understand is because the visual system has great spatial perception, we wanted to see whether auditory spatial perception actually biases spatial perception within the visual modality as well. And so basic perceptual neuroscience, if you look at the left side of your visual field, that's going to be processed by the right hemisphere of your visual cortex. And conversely, the left hemisphere processes the right side of your visual field. And so we can use this um, hemispatial bias to present subject sounds that are either left lateralized or right lateralized and see whether each of these sounds has preferential activity into what we call this contralateral region of visual cortex. So effectively, does a left sound bias the same types of visual neurons that are sensitive to visual neurons that care about the left region of visual space? And that is what we find, that left sounds tend to bias the same neurons that, um, that would be responsive to a left target in the visual space. So the spatial alignment of auditory and visual stimuli is responsive within these early regions of visual cortex, again, responding within about 30 to 50 milliseconds after sound onset. So sounds presented in space actually bias early spatial processing within the visual system, which makes sense because if you have a sound presented out in space and you see a target in that same region of space, you'll be faster and better able to detect that something is there in your environment. Or even more importantly, if you hear something over on the left, you can saccade over to that object extremely quickly, and you'll prime up those visual neurons to be um, waiting and ready to see whatever that object is in space. We've replicated in this in many different patients, and even with different types of stimuli in different visual regions, but always find the same pattern where you have stronger inputs in the same region of visual space for different types of sounds. But that isn't the only type of information we think is being transmitted. A lot of auditory neurons don't only care about the onset of a sound, but if you have a uh, continuous uh, auditory stimulus, like uh, me speaking here, I have an onset of a speech stimulus, and then eventually an offset of that sentence, auditory neurons tend to care about these event representations, so the onset and the discrete offset of a sound, to help parse an event in space. And so we can look within the auditory and the visual system to see how each of these areas care about these onset offset responses as well. This is a spectral breakdown of auditory, auditory electrodes, both to the onset of a sound and an offset with the responses here, a quiet period while the sound is playing, and then a second offset response here, different electrodes replicating that effect. We can see onset responses, offset responses, all within the auditory system, showing that there's this event segmented representation. Visual electrodes show the same pattern. You have an onset response and then an offset response once the sound stops. So the visual system is tagging the onset and offset of the visual signal as well to help us parse these auditory events in the environment on the assumption that many times a visual event is gonna be happening at that same region of space and there'll be some static event that happens at an onset and then something off the offset that we should be attending to. And finally, we wanted to look at the types of um, ongoing information that's transmitted across the sensory system from the auditory to the visual modality. One important aspect of um, processing any type of auditory visual stimulus is this idea of entrainment. And so within the auditory domain, if you were to listen to something like a helicopter, a rhythmic, 
Each time there's that tick sound, you'll drive auditory neurons at the rate of entrainment. The visual system is sensitive to this type of information as well. If you were to look at a stroboscopic light in a, um, in a haunted house, it's going to drive your visual neurons at the rate of that visual entrainment. And so a natural extension of this is do auditory neurons, um, are they entrained by auditory neurons or auditory activity at that frequency of entrainment? To give you a look what this looks like, we presented amplitude modulated stimuli that are going to be modulated at these different frequencies. Try to lower my volume so it's not too loud. So this is going to be an AM sound at 10 hertz. You can hear the rhythmic t -t 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 -t. a faster at 20 hertz and an even faster 40 hertz rhythm. So within the auditory domain, neurons within the auditory system will actually fire at the rate of this neural entrainment. The question is, do visual neurons follow this neural entrainment as well? Did those sounds you actually, As well, you, you can actually turn it up louder. Thanks. Okay. Let me try them again. Is that okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there might, there might be some filtering happening because we actually can't hear the 20 or 40, but we can hear the 10s. It's really oh, funny. okay. Interesting. And so one way we can look at this, it's a measure called intertrial phase clustering. It's just a way to look at the oscillatory phase of neural activity. Um, the specifics of that, I'm happy to talk through in the q and if people are interested. But effectively, we can present individuals, let's say, with this 40 hertz amplitude modulated stimulus, and then look within the neural response at 40 hertz oscillations to see if they're entraining to that stimulus. Within the auditory domain, we can see that there's reliable entrainment to this 40 hertz stimulus. Visual domain, there's no entrainment whatsoever. We can observe onset responses, but just no ongoing response to this entrained stimulus. And so this suggests that ongoing auditory dynamics are not sent to the visual system, only these onset and offset potentials. We've done this at many different AM sounds, all the way from five hertz, very slow frequencies up to high frequencies. Auditory system always entrains, the visual system never entrains. And so in general, for the visual system, sounds can modulate largely these auditory onset and offset potentials, specifically for sounds that are presented in the same region of visual space as the neurons within the visual system that care about those regions in space. So spatial and onset temporal information seem to be incredibly important for sounds activating visual cortex, but not the ongoing dynamics of visual modulations. And so looking at the other side of this system, we can look for how visual information actually modulates auditory processing. I think it's a very different type of mechanism that's happening. It's very, um, it doesn't care so much about the spatial information. It's more about the information that can be extracted from visual dynamics. And so we've started building a model that can account for different types of information related to the visual system. So this video is completely silent. Nothing is wrong with the Zoom audio, but from this video, you can see that he's saying, that's a bad call. Um, but that's not the only thing you can get from this video. You can see him breathe in before he speaks. Every time we see his lip close, we know that that's the boundary of a word, particularly because he's enunciating to try to cue to the ref. And even more broadly, you likely hear a voice while he's speaking. It's not his voice, but it's your estimation of what he sounds. Um, and this is going to be based on statistical priors in the environment. And these basis functions can actually help you hear him better when he speaks, because you have an expectation of what he as an individual specifically sounds like. And so I'll focus on the first and third of these questions today, um, just for time constraints, but happy to talk about some of the others um, later on if people are interested with them. So specifically the idea that the visual system can provide high level extraction of phonemes through lip reading and that visual articulators like the shape of the mouth can provide relative pitch and that this can actually be independent of lip reading ability. And so again, we used intracranial recordings with patients with epilepsy to answer these questions to be able to track neural activity on the fly as individuals are watching these auditory visual movies. And so the first question is, how is the auditory system actually modulated by visual speech? We wanted to look for the different ways in which vision modulates auditory neural processing to then break down which of these functions, uh, mechanisms are actually carrying different types of information. So we presented individuals with spoken movies that followed with a congruent auditory stimulus. The important thing here is before sound onset, you always get a little bit of preparatory visual motion at the onset of a speech stimulus. And so we can look before sound onset, does vision actually change anything about auditory processing? 
And then we can see how does the auditory system change to this visual stimulus after the sound has begun. First thing that we find within this high gamma response, this is what is this correlate of action potentials, bottom up early activity into the auditory system. We find two dissociable patterns of responses. First, and importantly, before the sound is ever presented, we get an increase in activity within the auditory system. So purely having this predictive visual stimulus before sound onset, it starts evoking neural responses in this posterior region of the STG, a superior temporal gyrus and early auditory region. To look at an individual electric response, we can see that a congruent visual stimulus, so this is just where the face is present by itself, starts evoking activity oops, before the sound is ever present. And at other regions, we can see that that visual stimulus actually has a suppression of neural activity, so a dissociable set of responses. In the low-frequency domain, these are the, going to be the top-down responses corresponding to um, cognitive types of predictions, maybe some feedback from other types of auditory information. It, we can see dissociable patterns in beta band activity from 13 to 30 hertz, again with modulations beginning before sound onset, so this predictive cue purely in response to the visual stimulus, and a later response within lower frequency theta band, which we think tracks the ongoing temporal dynamics of an auditory stimulus. And so we can see that there are these multiple patterns of interleaved types of neural modulations, and this is just a replication on a couple of different patients in different using different stimuli, different tasks. It's a pretty robust response that the auditory system um, generates action potentials in response to silent visual speech. But the big question is what information is contained within each of these auditory modulations? One of the easiest candidates, or most intuitive candidates, is the idea that it might be high-level phoneme information through lip reading that's extracted and converted into an auditory representation. One of the important recent findings within the last six years has been this idea of how, or an understanding of how the auditory system actually um, processes phonemes by themselves. There aren't individual neurons within the auditory system that correspond to um, individual phonemes that you hear in the environment. The way we actually hear spoken words just in the auditory modality is actually through a population-coded distributed representation within the auditory system. So these are a number of electrodes within the STG, and it's going to be the spatial pattern, the distribution of activity along this region of auditory cortex that'll correspond to each phoneme that you hear. And there's going to be spectral and temporal components to this as well. And so when you hear different words, you get a different spatial distribution of neuronal activity within the auditory system. So the idea in the model we've been testing is that lip reading may actually refine processing within these same um, neuronal populations to tune them to be able to elicit a, a more precise neural representation for the heard auditory stimulus. And so one way we wanted to look at this question of whether or not lip reading is actually evoking spatial patterns of activity within the auditory system was first using functional magnetic resonance imaging with different types of silent spoken or heard videos. And so the stimuli that subjects are watching, were they going to be mama, papa, or kaka videos, or silence, um, or heard videos without the corresponding visual images? What we first find is that we can reliably decode the identity of silent speech, not only from the visual system, but also from these auditory regions, so that the spatial distribution of activity within the auditory system is actually predicting the lip-read words that somebody is set, um, seeing in front of them. So it's not only the visual system, but also the auditory system that is encoding the spatial representation of a lip read word. And this is just focusing on those specific regions, showing that within the auditory system, you can classify not only words, but also lip read words. Within the visual system, obviously, it's or it makes sense that the um, visual lip reading can be classified, but not the sound, because this is in a bi-directional relationship. We've replicated and expanded this within a cranial recordings in patients with epilepsy as well, showing them different words beginning with either F, B, G, or D. And again, we can find that electrodes within the auditory system can classify not only heard speech, but these lip read silent words as well. What we get with these intracranial recordings is also the temporal breakdown of these responses so that we can see that classification accuracy peaks at a relatively similar time point across these different um, either auditory or visual stimuli. But we don't think that lip reading is the only type of signal that's relayed from the visual system into the auditory modality. 
At the overview, I highlighted a bunch of other types of components, uh, statistical relationships that we think there are between the systems. One of the other important ones is this idea that pitch can be extracted from the visual articulators. And this is going to be a, uh, due to a statistical relationship between the auditory and the visual systems. And so, as I mentioned, we already know that static lip shapes have statistical relationships with phonemes, and this is just lip reading, the shape associated with specific speech sound. But broader than that, not only the phoneme that's being produced, there are relative pitch signal, pitch information that can be extracted from the shape of these visual articulators as well. And so we wanted to test this idea of whether dynamic lip shapes convey additional, additional information. So as an example, what this looks like, we can take the phonemes we and you. And so these are the spectrograms of the phonemes over time. The symbols we and you are, are characterized by relatively stable first and third formants, and the more dynamic second format rises and falls depending on the syllable. If we look at the dynamics of these spectral components relative to the movements of a speaker's lips when they spoke these syllables, we can see that there's a spatial correlation between the, lip, the width of these lips and the rising and falling of these specific features. And we found that the width um, and the spectral components were highly correlated not only with this specific speaker, but with a number of different speakers as well, and across different types of um, words. So the idea that who is gonna have very narrow width and produce a relatively lower pitch stimulus all the way up to Hade, which is going to be a very wide and higher pitch relative to that individual speaker's voice. Um, and then this full gamut will run a high correlation across different width, lip width and the pitch that corresponds. And so this is the idea that we found that lip width is statistically associated with a pitch of spoken words. And so we want to test whether the auditory system is actually using this statistical information that's present in the environment. And we think that the way that this is actually occurring is due to the oral acoustics of your oral cavity based on the types of relative pitches that are produced. And so the way that we first tested this was the psychophysical paradigm where individuals were just trying to discriminate whether an auditory stimulus was rising or falling. And we varied the amount of noise in the background. So it's a relatively challenging task. And with these auditory stimulus, we either have a rapidly expanding or contracting disc associated with this rising and falling motion. And so we find that there's a consistent um, increase in sensitivity to the rising and falling auditory stimuli, depending on whether or not these audit the visual stimuli are expanding or contracting in the, much the same way that the lips would expand or contract with the we versus you sounds. And we don't find that with any of our different controls. And so second, we want to examine whether this can actually help us um, understand spoken speech better. And so the way we did this was to try to filter out audit specific types of auditory information from an ongoing sentence stimulus. And so this is going to be a full sentence. It'll be extremely difficult to hear, um, but then I'll give you a cue on what the actual words are present in this sentence. It'll be a little bit more clear. So what we did is we limited the temporal information or limited the spectral pitch information. This is the original spectrogram. Temporal degradation is we're smoothing over the temporal domain without altering the actual frequency information contained. And it would sound like this. So very slurred speech, very hard to understand. And then the spectral degradation will sound a little bit more robotic, whereas the temporal information has been preserved. And so what we wanted to understand is if we have lip reading as an input to the auditory system, we know that's going to provide some benefit. A lot of research has shown that the temporal information from a visual stimulus, when the lips actually parse, can help you hear better as well. And so we want to see whether this spectral component can enhance um, auditory speech perception above and beyond either, either of these two cues, which we know exists in the literature already. And so to give you an example of what this looks and feels like, this is an example of a spectrally degraded stimulus. I'll turn my volume up. And so it's very hard to make anything out, but you might have the tip of the ear feeling that you're getting close to picking out some of the words. If I add the visual stimulus, it should be a little bit easier. So, sorry, we can't hear this. Um, oh, I don't know okay. if this is 
going on in that the, the, there's a complicated AV system that might be filtering it out or got um, it got it okay that's not it's not important all okay for the spectral oh sorry oh, oh so people can check the recording later uh, that cool. should be better the spectrally degraded is going to be the stimulus where you have the intact uh, temporal information, but we've filtered out all of the spectral components. So it sounds effectively like a robot. So uh, that's my attempt um, of filtering out the spectral, effectively like robotic speech where the temporal information is preserved. And then we can see what information the visual signal actually recovers. And so if we look at just lip reading information, individuals are trying to pick out what words they heard. Accuracy is low, but not 0% when individuals are presented with, with the video by itself and slightly better in the temporally degraded auditory alone condition. So this is the slurred speech example. Adding in vision to this condition, we find significant improvement and this exceeds any types of probability summation models. So vision is going to help us hear better even if it's, um, if we already know how well they can lip read this stimulus. In the spectrally degraded condition, accuracy is again quite low in the auditory alone version. Um, and the boost that they receive from the movie is quite large within an interaction between these two is highly significant, suggesting that there is a, a strong benefit of the information you can get from spectrally filtered and spectrally recovered speech. So all of this means that multi-sensory enhancements in speech comprehension were are present for not only temporal information, but for spectral information. So we're covering different types of feature, temporal and spectral, as well as lip reading from the types of information available to us. And then the final thing I'll just send on it is that it's not just these lip reading cues, the temporal cues, and even the shape spectral correspondences, as I alluded to, that there is speaker specific calibration effects that can happen within the auditory visual interactions as well. So that we know what spe the specific individual should sound like, and we can use those statistical expectations to help us hear them better in the environment. And since the sounds aren't working, I'll just click through these quickly. Um, and we have a lot of ongoing projects looking at these speaker specific calibrations as independent effects for ways that we um, process and auditory visual signals in the natural environment. Imagine yourself walking into a bar and you're looking for a friend, you know what they sound like, and you see a bunch of people speaking, by knowing the specific statistics of their voice, you can actually target the spatial location of that individual more quickly and be able to hear them better because you know what they sound like. Same if you're on the phone with somebody, you can filter out the noise better by knowing this fundamental frequency of the speaker that you're talking to on the phone. Ed. Ed. And so in summary, we know that visual signals help speech perception, particularly when the auditory signal is um, really reliable and noisy auditory signal, or if somebody has speech perception deficits or auditory deficits that occur with aging. You need these visual cues to actually help you survive and um, have better speech perception abilities. And so there are a lot of different cues from the visual system that help us hear somebody better, not only lip reading, but temporal cues about where are the boundaries between different words, spectral cues, and these can be relative cues about the width of the mouth relative to the oral resonance of the mouth, or absolute cues about what is the fundamental frequency of that speaker, because I've heard them a thousand times, I know the exact oral resonance of that individual's voice. And we can use all of these visual cues, contextual cues, to help enhance robust speech perception abilities. And with that, I'll just give a thanks to collaborators over the years and our funding agencies. Thanks very much. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Does anyone have any questions for David? So you can you can yell it out. Actually, I'll let you just come up to the mic and ask directly. If anyone else has questions, they can line up. That one, that one's broken. Yeah, just this one. Thank you for the talk. Um, just a quick question. Um, I was surprised that in a talk on how we coordinate multisensory information, that there was no mention of the cerebellum. And given that it has the greatest number of neurons in the entire central nervous system and receives inputs of all sensory modalities, I was wondering whether or not this was because you do not think it's relevant or whether or not this is a target of ongoing work. Yeah, isn't it? for most multisensory researchers, they've focused on either subcortical systems, including the thalamus and then the cortex. The cerebellum 
has remained um, largely unexamined in the multisensory domain. It does have inputs, but most of the we don't find that there's a lot of critical information transfer happening between this in, within the cerebellum. Subcortical systems are incredibly important for these basic spatially dependent and temporally dependent responses between the systems. And then the cortex is responsive for any other high level top down modulated type of multisensory reaction. The cerebellum much less so, um, at least from research in animals and humans that we've had so far. It's not to say that it, it's not, we just don't know what the information that's being transmitted there is doing. Great, another question? Cool, first of all, very cool talk. Um, I, I might mess up some of the vocabulary here, uh, but the part of the talk where you were talking about how um, uh, sound would sort of kickstart the attention of uh, um, the, the visual attention, uh, but then a prolonged sound uh, would not sort of uh, continue that attention on the visual side of things. Um, I was wondering how binary is that? Um, and, uh, you know, have you or others looked at, for example, if like the pitch changes more continuously, is there some more continuous notion of uh, novelty that uh, is, is triggering that attention? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, pitch less so. There might be a slight uh, non-continuous relationship with pitch that lower frequency sounds might have a little bit of an increased modulatory effect within the visual system. The strongest um, modulating factor is actually the intensity of the sound. So louder sounds evoke a stronger response within visual cortex. And the neat thing is if you're in a dark environment, you can actually push this further. A startling sound can evoke visual hallucinations in individuals. Um, we think about this as a hypnagogic type of experiences, and we can actually evoke it in about 50% of people. Dark, within sleep deprivation, you induce some mild visual imagery. A startling sound, particularly loud sound, will evoke a flash of light for these individuals, cluviform constants of scintillation or a full field visual flash. Most people don't realize this is happening because it happens right before the onset of sleep and you don't encode memories right before sleep. So in hotels tonight, try to see if that ice maker kicking on actually evokes a flash. And for a fair amount of people it does, but we just don't register that it's something to pay attention to. But the intensity of the sound is the strongest modulating factor. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, any other questions for David? Great. Well, since we're running short of time, then I'll end it there. Thank you so much for the very interesting talk. Thank you. Okay, so next we have a break until 3 p.m. or uh, 3.30 p.m. Uh, I've got to go to the poster session, but it's also a coffee break. So I'll see you all later.
Unmute and then let me try it. That was fine, right? Yeah. So, but then, so the problem is, yeah, when you talk, you have to mute. Talk. I guess. So, so what I can do is I'll just mute, mute it when. I'm oh, sorry. I don't, I'll turn off my sound and speak.
Anybody on Zoom can hear us? Yeah, I think they should be able to hear us. Yeah, we are yeah, muted. Just start it right now, right? Okay. Do I need to send you the slides or can I do it with them? You can send my slides. That's that's better. Okay. So is it okay if I send it by five four thirty or so? Um, five thirty. No, no, four thirty. Four thirty. Yeah. So Carl has been working, uh, has a lot of different work. Uh, originally, he was a uh, step behind at Google Research, and also he graduated from MIT in 2017. His research has been recognized by many different awards, such as the Hanson Career Award, the Utah Young Faculty Award, and Amazon Research Award. And also, his work has been widely covered in popular uh, media outlets. So, and he has also worked a lot on the connection of vision and audio, such as speech and also audio cross separation, and also uh, other for related to robots. They need to have very common. So, let's go on top. That's a very kind of question. Um, yeah, so uh, I thought I'd talk about some uh, work that you've been excited about. Um, yeah, that's the problem we've been wondering about, which is the problem that everyone's here in the room is when you go to your health, 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 how do you know that nobody's watching you? You know, there, there's so much, there's so much to do, especially technology now, is like microphones and cameras, and you can use the microphone cameras really small, you know. And how do you know that I can next guess? Who's a guest, right? And you're like, oh, you're in France or the microphone. You speak in the same it's not a good thing. How do you know that the previous guest in your hotel room is doing France or the uh, right, so, try to look, 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 look. Um, so you know, this is the third thing about the problem, right? Like, is there a way to stop someone from finding a And in some ways, it's an academic problem. I mean, probably you go to your work with all the fine things, right? It's really just great. Um, but I mean, it's also not an academic problem in some, some ways. 
Um, just with everything you need to hear about things, right? Um, as well as there's this new term called bot software where you're your bosses are trying to find you right mm -hmm. in this industry is saying you need to keep the product. Um, so you know this is an interesting problem. Is there is there a way to prevent someone from listening to your voice when you don't want them to one way of solving the problem is uh, you know, actually just to like turn on the TV and really loud. Um, and you know, and, and play you, 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 um, and that's you know, okay, you know, everything algorithms you know, are working pretty well, but they're not that great. Right? So if you just turn around the noise and play light noise, that, that's what they think we do a lot of, 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 of things to system to kind of automatically listen to what like you're saying. Um, but let's say that that would be the conversation, right? Um, if you're trying to talk to someone else and you're in your hotel room, you talk to your friend or your spouse or something, right? That would be really, really annoying. You couldn't actually, you know, very long talk conversation with the TV playing a lot of these last time. Oh, uh, Carl, sorry. Um, the the bird to be thinking about this. Um, there's been, uh, you know, there's a few work, two work that I think in the last few years that when you investigate, how do you affect the energy? Um, one of those first work when this um, University of Chicago, um, where they were able to trace the full response the figure from their paper here, where they're wearing this 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 bracelet, this is making the full full response sound. That you can hear, you can hear, you hear it, right? But it basically sounds the microphone in parts of the way, crafted in such a way that it allows the circuit and the microphone to go to the world and transmitter. Um, and so they they never say this, but now it's something that's available. Um, so, you know, this is one, 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 one practical way, right? We can go to, you know, we can basically establish this privacy. But it's also possible to defend against this just by building better hardware, right? Once you know about the type of type of attack, um, or the right way down the microphone. You know, then then my phone is like it's just designed with one of those that we can do. So this is a question we've been thinking about, right? Is, is there is there are there other ways that we can prevent my phone? Fine. Uh Andrew probably I don't know if I have a sale in full. Um we were thinking about the sales in full. There's many other sales in full. So, right, and some examples are, are, are this, this tiny, you know, this, it's a very hard to see noise you add to an image and it causes a thought to fiddle fast fire. Oh, wow. And, you know, the, the field often sees this as, as like a bug, right? So, like a big problem that was known as an architect or the bug that we need to fix. Um, but we started thinking of them as like a feature factor. Right, like this is actually a good thing in this episode of the people because it gives us control. Right? We can use episode example to control when someone should be listening to us and when someone should be listening to us. So, yeah, this is like a feature, actually. It's actually a key feature for private systems. Um, this has also been done in, in, uh, in Vision. Um, uh, this is a this is a full website in fact called tvdazzle.com. Um, and it helps like cut your hair so that they can make it like So, this was a piece of paper that we went to a gallery and we had a little bit of a problem. But this tells me that we basically want to create all these hard versions on the stage for your haircut. And that basically is an advantage. So, the question we're asking here is, you know, can we do something similar here for speech? Can we break the uh, way the jam of the the numbness in the upper room and go to the And basically, you know, help establish some private So, the way we can do this is, you 
Let's assume you have your two party exactly in the class, right? And this is important, right? We want to be able to communicate. And two people want to go to the communicate. Um, I want to have a communication that we don't know where we are. So the two parties, Bob and Alex, and they're a good and the fun 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 one for them is there could be some spy some road microphone that has a moment that can try to see and our goal here is to the table how can we table that without knowing where it is where you know there could be how far away it is so the setup is you know what, what, what we're envisioning here is Bob could you know, take out his phone here, and as a thought, his phone speaker could be producing an adversarial example that will be in the normal. I'll offer you one of that. And if, 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 if Bob has his phone, say this is with the leading, you know, and it's making mind that first, first, first perfect, perfect, right? Then what the spy can hear is the but the very slightest, right? That has a particular one that will disable the neural network to do it. But it's so quiet that the volume on this is so low that Alice will still be able to do that. Okay. So, what's the problem with this? But like why why is this this part part of part of it? This is just applying kind of looking for bad for example we just applying it now taking it up and basically now the the challenge here is that um basically this the exact noise you want to produce is going to depend on what you're saying, right? Um all the maybe best ever so examples in vision, they are drafted knowing what you can do. Right, no, this is the dog. Here's the noise pattern one has with no alarm on your So in speech, this is actually very demanding. The environment is very demanding. Because by the time you finish speech speaking, right, it's too late. Right? There's, 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 there's going to be a delay. Right? If, well, by the time, by the time uh, Bob uh, speaks here and he's speaking here, 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 and the phone tries to play it, it's not going to play until the signal itself is changed. Right? You're basically crafting out of those examples, crafting that, and you can take off the self those examples and everything to change. Play it, but when you play it, it's going to be too, 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 too late. So, practically, you can use this, right? And in the screen scenario, um, uh, this this would this, this, this not not work. So the main idea here is that we can take advantage of these versus models um, that are trying to stay ahead, trying to predict what what's going to happen in the future, and we can use these things for the model in order to overcome the, the fundamental deficiencies in here, um, and basically allow you to apply this voice in your zero profile, right? Um, and the models are going to be really useful here because we're going to be able to anticipate what is the noise pattern that the city could be playing in the future, but that no matter what that person's saying at that time, it's going to be able to be so, so, so Okay, so the problem set up here, and this is very really, this is the main idea, right? The very main idea is, is we can do these certain models to um, yeah, and focus on the fundamental problem in the world where it's always changing, where the signal is always changing. And by the time we're able to sense it and do some processing on it and try to take an action in the world, it's too late because the world will have changed. And so, first, the model is basically providing the window of opportunity, right? It gives us more time in order to do this one. And so, this is just the details of how we close this idea here. So we're going to set this up where the first speaking and our goal is to figure out what is the adversarial example I could play through the future, so we'll go over the air, right? Um, that will be effective in the future. Um, so let's, you know, let's say that um, at C, right, you get to observe kind of the waveform at, 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 at C, and we need to figure out what is the attack we should be playing at X plus delta, so delta delta delta. That's all that's going to be done. We have a 
have a neural net here, which we're going to call that theta, but the size of the test is there with the energy of the neural net or 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 the data. That's going to have a three with the top. That's uh AC plus delta L three delta delta. That when they're come together, right, and you can combine what actually means to be spoken, what we predict to be attached to the is going to be. This is this is basically disabled in my case, our blocking is our system. We have some correct handwriting. We can write down to the last plus 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 you here. Um, Rather than uh, uh, so this is just the two last ones we're going to be talking about off of that. Um, you can you take your favorite last function for a bar 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 system. Basically, comparing what the predicted um, peak is versus what the general peak is over some in the data set. And rather than minimizing this, we're trying to stop it, right? It's maximization. So if you can go off to a plus, plus as high as you plus 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 as you want to make this the most you want to make this the most difficult noise. Um, that 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 that, that can break the case of our system. And so basically, the way that they we model what what the prediction uh, is from the ASR heart heart system is that the composition of the ASR, as well as what our predictive attack is, we have operating on the cap plus what the actual signal is going to be in the future. So this is the way this is the way the speed right? It's the second line here. Right? You're combining what's actually what that happening is just unknown to you, right? And then the real situation, basically, you don't know what your key for stuff, 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 stuff is, right? So you have to, but um, so you're going to predict something that when you do get combined with that, it's going to be stable to full, um, full, full team model. Um, and you can just um, apply kind of a standard sort of uh, tweet on this that you don't want this to happen. Right? We don't we want this to be better than turning on the apply. So we can put something down. So yeah, I mean this is the the, the, the big idea here is uh, you can train this whole 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 system up on um this on this speech, right? You take a standard uh, data set that you have for for a data star um uh, and train 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 and training, you start training up this restricted model and producing these attacks. Um I think what's actually kind of interesting about this is I mean, we all know it's really hard with the two people. You don't actually know what a person's going to say. There's a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen. And this actually, this, this approach doesn't need to say what a person's going to say, right? It doesn't know, it doesn't need to know the exact words. words, words. You just have to adapt to something in the space and what the speaker is. Um, yeah. And the of, of the speaker's voice, you know, some structure of what words, 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 we varied on a bunch of different scenarios, um, and it ended up working very, very well. Um, so it's actually much better than turning on the radio, basically. Yeah, we couldn't just turn on the TV, so we so, so, uh, can track uh, AFR systems much better than that, that much lower volume. So, um, you know, the paper has all of the uh, editions of the bottom here. It's published that I I, I, I shared this year. Um, the uh, paper has all of the kind of full table numbers. Um, the key highlights here are basically the system is struggling the word error rate by four 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 times because of the four x and the word error error rate. Um, and it, we we try this in a bunch of scenarios. So it works in what are called the black box and what 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 is the box setting? White boxes when you assume you know what the, what the supply is. Black boxes when you don't get to see it. You don't know. What the supply is. So it works, works in both those scenarios. Uh, it works even when you apply the CDR system at a failure. It depends the top a little bit, right? But the system still still works um, even when you apply it. So we actually tried to build a practical prototype here. We really wanted to see what this was in it, how this works in the real world. Um, so we don't quite have a final job yet. Uh, hopefully that's something we see. Um, but we actually tried to do it where we would actually speak in the real room. Uh, 
Uh, these are some photos in the last of the Columbia and some uh, lab here is our new office space and the top picture of our, our, our kitchen um, on the bottom here. Um, and so we, we went in and we just spoke in this room. There's reverberation, there's background noise, there's a lot of steam coming. Um, and we just recorded there and we tried to admit the sound right in the jam. Um, and it, 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 it's our, 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 our and it works. So there's three columns here. There's ASR with no attack, uh, with light noise, and with bar attack. Um, so ASR with no attack is basically what a open to stay there or open park system to ASR would, would, would do on the feet. Green means it got the little right, red means it got the right wrong. But ASR is pretty good, right? You need more from the front, right? Um, if you just uh, uh, play white noise, that Kind of an approximate like same volume level as the hard attack. Okay, that's you know it actually doesn't get um uh, uh, yeah it kind of gets a little worse but it's not right. I think it actually cleans up when you say when you say white noise some of the letters I actually improve. Um, so but when you play the attack right, what what happens? It gets straight. Uh, what's on the risk? Right? If you're really blocking the state of our system in real time, you should notice. That you know starts green, right? It's the hard time it all starts green when it turns red. That's because you're 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 uh, it, 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 it's not fully, you know, you can still hear it. You can still hear this attack. Um, uh, but it's, it's like a whisper. It's sort of a, 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 a whisper in that background. Uh, um, and we were thinking about this, like, why, like, should, this, should we actually be able to have this behavior? It's possible that we should have an over there or there attack um, that you just can't, it, it seems you can't hear it at, at, at all. And I'm not sure if I can talk about it. Possible, so we need to be able to attack microphones even that are far away, right? Um, and even if it's kind of, you know, we hear the speaker in the room next door, right? That's down to two traveling. So if we play this low of a long attack, it's not going to go to the level, right? So, okay, let, let me set up and then we try to play a few. Um, so you're, you're going to hear there is, um, what you're going to hear is uh, uh, basically the voice. Um, uh, and then our, and the whisper can sound quite like my attack, but it's like a target, and the transcript is going to as well of the color and shape of right um, Okay, um, Okay, the end of the reverberation is not part of the attack. That's not true. Um, but the uh, you heard the whisper at the, at the very end, so that basically was the uh, 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 so um, yeah, this has you know a huge, huge increase in work. Um, yeah. or, 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 uh, we have another example that maybe it's not worth saying, but what we're looking at is Okay, so yeah, why don't we try muting this? Okay, we're back on. Okay, good. good. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, so we turn, we, we, we analyze this model in a bunch of different ways. Uh, so we're going to kind of look at what this is doing to better understand the like, attack. I mean, I think uh, we said this is a very important problem, right? I mean, we, we sort of like the future of the division, we think it's like a really cool thing. I don't think it's going to change our, our world. So we, we often forget about like the writing part of it. 
Um, so what this plot here is showing is um, each red dot is the different cases of work. So it's a lot of sort of passes, right? Um, and the, the vertical axis is showing accuracy after the attack, and the horizontal is showing accuracy before the attack. So um, basically, because you see everything below the, the, the diagonal, that means our back is effective. Right. And when you drop down below the diagonal, line, that's the same part that we have as a circle. The size of the circle is basically showing the frequency of that word, how often that word appears in the same place. So that really big circle at the top, I think is the word the. Right? That's like the most common word. The the. Right. And what you, you should notice is that's not dropping. Basically, that word is really hard to stop. That's the word that's going to be. But that's actually okay, right? If that word doesn't really much much information about right? That that is very well basically the most frequent word very very the most frequent So what you do see is that the, the words that are less less frequent it is that are represented by the many more smaller dots do have a significant drop. In, and those are the most important words. Right? Those are the words that make you think of names or patients or you know, kinds of things that you guys can do want to hide from this spot. Um, yeah, so here's just more ways of analyzing this, this, this data here. On the left is showing basically each, each, each dot is still a word, showing the word, word count um, versus the change in empathy. I can see a negative report or oasis is like showing the best the winning. Sorry, there's a lot of arguments of scale. There's a lot of arguments of fit differently. Uh, and you see there's the square frames, right? The the um the more common the word 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 it is, the less less uh, impact are um on our our, our word. What we also see is about the word rank here. So on the right side is showing basically the word rank versus the change not happening. And here you can see that the longer the word, the bigger the change in accuracy. Because the longer the word has more control structure to do with it. Right? So if I'm saying the word we're not going to right? It's easier to start saying we're going to learn words to be protected like what's going to happen. So that our time is actually much more effective on the long word. Which again, you know, the way our language works, is the, the frequent word words are often just distorted. Right? So this is all you know, like a good thing. Um, if you're curious uh, to, to what word you should be saying, what word you should not be saying, uh, this is visualizing the words of words and then what, what the accuracy is not to be talking about. So the safest word here is, uh, oh, the safest word on the this here is remember. Uh, so that, you know, before the attack is getting old, the AFR is almost 100% of the thing to remember. After the attack is, is almost zero. Right? So that's, that's the that's the large, largest change. Uh, I think it's a bad one. Uh, the uh, worst words to be saying are says, there's a strong fit. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I think it's like one point here. This is really just a group of concepts. So, what I'm hoping that this work does is that um, you know, most of these more work in this introduction of reading and machine learning. Um, to do the audio privacy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think production systems are, are now ubiquitous, they're everywhere, and now you have phones and cameras and you can see all your phones and watches and there's just a terrible error So it's like the time now to investigate what is that role of privacy in the system. Um, and these are some of the highest field we design it. They are there. Um, so, a lot of those have been developed independently from I don't think they're actually compatible. So, uh, I think it's going to be really, really interesting. You know, like when we get to reach patients um, in the field, that would be compatible with the privacy information. Um, and lastly, I mean, these types of models really uh, are really good at, at overcoming some of the issues, right? So, you know, our role is that you know, you know take, another takeaway point here is. We live in a world and things are, are changing more and more. So, 
the project website you can download um, kind of the close today. It's not quite as an app yet, uh, but it's just going to be the basic model of the project model on the computer. Um, and a little bit of the spreadsheet at the moment. Um, so actually, if you don't want to download that code, um, it is on the ground that you to be. I want to keep the appetite as another work uh, representing that, that CTGDCR about trying to share and use the video uh, to stick together. Uh, this is work I've been by DC student and your DC back there, uh, where I think the app has a code for the building. And it says, we've been for a mile, it says, we know you're doing well. Um, that kind of association with the video. So here's an example of a system where uh, it just, I like guess, here for the audience, where it just, just, uh, just, just, just the music is displayed and it's playing the video that 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 Uh, do you think that it's 
Oh, yeah. So, question is you said pretty words are very uh, hard to calculate and where for are detailed. Now, in our model, we have a pair of these models for working models. So, any specific working models for real world can be made up of very specific working models. Do you think that it's developed for the algorithm or do you feel that it's going to be kind of speak to the algorithm? So we can pair it for um kind of character levels and word level um we saw the um so I guess it was not yeah I don't remember the number of the number of number of the 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 number of Uh, uh, Rohan, hey, the Zoom screen is not shared actually. Uh, not yet. I mean, we can hear you guys, but we can't see the screen. So. Hey, Rohan, can't see the Zoom screen. Is 
since we've been present, we have these conditions for the junction and the generating system. This distribution of one value of the left and right, from slash on the digits on the left before. This distribution is generated by the high level. Here, I'm going to compare how these stocks to the state of the art model. Well, this is just one problem, and uh, we want to check out uh, the screen for In addition to looking at the models, what do they do? I don't know how to put the data in my last problem, which was the head of the engineering scheme. So I think that I'm going to spend the whole process at the same time. And a few of the members in total while being on um, interactive values. If you found that logic missing, feel free to go to the power of the interactive uh, logic page. We need to get an implementation. The video we have extended to the measurement here with the implementation details, uh, some implementation of our work, and some of the uh, details. So, I will do the plot which will have to have some real focus on the year. We invite you to try it uh, because it's uh, very simple. Uh, we'll spend a little of algebra again, uh, where we show how uh, a very second algorithm can be lost in the back. We can just take the standard uh, integer. If you would like to view the model of my work, check out uh, all the uh, Australian videos and values to get models. Well, anyway, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, enjoy this workshop and hope you will have a great day. So, our last speaker is uh, all the videos, so we will be in all the videos in half and five years. Hey, excuse me, uh, the Zoom screen is not shared
In this work, we present a generic method for generating full facial 3D animation from speech. With this method, we can animate identities just given their template mesh. Um, I don't know that I'm a good cook. I enjoy cooking, and so I guess I'll just say that. Oh, the other one is like, I got, in terms like, Overboard. Um, that is a movie that I watched a lot. Oh, the other one is like, Overboard. Um, that is a movie that I watched a lot. an hour on trivia and then I was like playing an hour on trivia and then I was like work for big Finn's businesses they've got no interest in representing the people so I thought right Bin Blue at C3 soon work for big Been businesses have got no
So, for, for, for example, the uh, function location may have bias on reader or audio question. So, how do you deal with this issue? Oh, this is a very good question. Actually, I can actually have all the video facts and all the videos. And uh, for each video, we have a different uh, behavior. And we like to. Uh, uh, we will first infer the policy by cross-validation, and then we will like to uh, form the map up. We do all the things we can do. So um, that is how uh, uh, we suggest the first variable. We have a case that is a product of a class. Indeed, there are potential like a different class from the data. Uh, there are 
Hello everyone, I'm Xian Liu from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I will be introducing our paper, Learning Hierarchical Cross-Modal Association for Cold Speech Gesture Generation in CVPR 2022. When communicating with others, we spontaneously make cold speech gestures to equip the virtual avatars with speech gestures to equip the virtual avatars with such Pretty gestures, we should find their multi-level connections. Second, the dynamic patterns of different body parts are not the same, such as the flexible fingers and the relatively still upper arms. Instead of generating the whole skeleton simultaneously, we should treat each part differently. Ah, that's weird. Let me just skip this one. Motivated by this, we propose a novel framework hierarchical audio to gesture. It contains two modules. The hierarchical audio learner is you.
Okay, so the next paper we're going to hear about is cross model perception is can face geometry be gleaned from voices? You don't use your Mac. Uh, sure, you can use, or you can just join Zoom. Did, did you, did you, did you yeah, go to I Zoom? Do you have the, uh, don't have this, please. Yeah, you can just join Zoom like I just did. Maybe you can just place it. And from my screen. Oh, I just say for Hey, hi, hi everyone. I'm Chong Yu, and I'm presenting my work for cross model perceptiveness and can uh, this geometry be cleaned from uh, uh, be cleaned from voices. So this work, I think ever that when a non speaker start up, so you don't even though or haven't heard yet, you, you might be able to approximate uh, imagine what a person looks like, or uh, after you the person think the one's voice actually matches or it doesn't match it of uh doesn't match it appears perfectly so uh i think this is a long standing problem in human perception uh to what to what extent the voice can change human face human face shape and uh our work uh, aims as the to analyze the correlations between the two uh human perception modality and the previous research has explored uh, 2D representation, not basically for images here. They use important decoder structures or generative serial networks and study whether they can reconstruct the face images from the speech. And uh, however, uh, their image representation inherently, inherently suffered from some potential irrelevant factors. So you can see there are lots of the hairs, backgrounds, or spheres that is generated that is uh, current. Uh, obviously irrelevant to the one's voices and also <laughs> and uh, uh yeah and prior methods show that the latest and there are some other uh, controversial uh, factors such as ethnicity so uh from a uh, previous work in their TSN lab uh, they also did, they didn't show the uh the cluster uh, for different ethnicity before voices. So uh, here uh, from another work is from the cognitive science support that uh, in the recent cognitive science support, they show that the low level of editorial analysis can uh, affect uh, visual analysis here. So that possibly means that uh, uh, per when the person hears speech, then they can approximately imagine what the person looks like and uh, yeah and this is another structure uh map for the human support so that is basically connected to head so that means when the core vibrates uh, the vibration will pass through the whole face structure and uh so uh the latent correlation may, might exist between these two modalities here and uh we try to do a more elegant way in the 3d that seems to leave out some of the uh some of the Irrelevant factors such as background, hair models, and uh, or textures here. And the first, uh, the more direct way is to uh, build a supervised uh, learning, uh, supervised learning study here. And we pass a speech input here and learn the 3D MN parameter. That is 3D, uh, 3D multiple model parameters here. And the 3D MN parameter that can reconstruct the, that can possibly reconstruct the 3D face mesh. 3D face mass shape. So uh, the difficulty here is how to get a pair data. The, 
there's no public asset for a pairs of each and a 30 phase shape uh, data sets. So uh, we try to do that by uh, uh, fitting the, by getting an off the shelf landmark capture uh, and apply that on the images here. So after that, we, we get the one's uh, facial uh, landmark or that registration of faces and we, and we can use a 3 dm fitting by optimization to fit into the to fit the mesh into the uh, landmarks here. So by joining it this way, we can we can construct the data set of uh, Lab 3D since we use the Voxy Lab, uh, the voice from Voxy Lab and their associated images, then we can reconstruct the uh, 3D from the uh, from the images here. And uh, another way is we would try to use a supervised model that uh, a supervised learning model that we use an uh, latent image <laughs> we use an latent image as the uh, uh, we use the latent image as the latent representation here that bridge the 2D and 3D uh, that bridge the voice to 2D and the 2D to 3D representation here. And uh, uh, the lower part is uh, basically again based then based loss that try to synthesize uh, the face images here. And the other part is uh, 2D to 3D representation that uh, try to that try to learn uh, from pre-trained models. And here uh, we try to examine the first examination is that is it a possible task. So this is the result from the supervised learning that directly fit the uh, uh, Based from both to the 3D, uh, 3D parameters here. Here we try to argue that uh, yeah. this is an intuitive and reasonable result that because of voices are inherently very vague information for uh, information to hit a 3D uh, phase geometry. So uh, it matches our our intuition that we can approximately imagine how a person looks like, what a person looks like, but we couldn't uh, imagine the details about bumps or detailed wrinkles on these faces. So uh, we approximately, we show these four types can be reconstructed or can be shown in the uh, three phase matches here. And these are the collection of results from supervised learning. And since our supervised learning results can, uh, can uh, uh, contain both of the latent image representation, and the uh, city phase overlay overlay on the latent images here. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some delays. Um, yeah, sorry, there are some delays here. So, uh, here I next I show uh, this is a coherency test that. Uh, we, we use the near neighboring uh, voice features to reconstruct their city faces and they are coherent. And this is a result from the supervised learning. Uh, okay. And next are some comparison with the baseline method. Uh, we, we build the baseline method with directly concatenating the uh, pre-trained model for voice to face and the phase two and the image to 3D model. Uh, in this direct uh, concatenation with the joint training, we find that they usually predict a, a more monotonous, monotonous uh, phase shape. But with our uh, uh, joint training of the voice and the 3D phase geometry, we can reconstruct more accurate phase shapes based on their uh, phase types here. And uh, uh, for the an analysis or improvement, we find that uh, the voice information can uh, improve most of the year-to-year -year ratio that is basically the face width uh, or head width. Uh, so that's possibly the uh, major improvement or the voice can hear about the uh, face width size. And we also conduct objective tests that we uh, ensure the real uh, results uh, than the baseline methods here. Yeah, so the takeaway message is, is simple that it's possible to reconstruct from one spatial structure, uh, one spatial structure from voices, and such correlation may exist. And but there are much more implicit or subtle factors that may exist, such as when one smokes or when one drunk uh, after drinking, their voice can be changed a little bit. But uh, here we uh, target at the more normal way that uh, when the people, when people talk or when people give a uh, interview and their issues speak in their normal way. So we, so but we couldn't, uh, but we didn't leave out such potential or potential uh, factors that underline this analysis. Yeah.
Yeah, and for please, uh, for more detail, please uh, check our project page and data. And thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so the next uh, paper I'm going to hear about is sound and video representation learning with multiple training, three training tasks. And Arun is going to present it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. okay, yeah. okay. Uh, I am I am Oh, I see. I see. Uh, uh, so this is how I work during my uh, during my PhD at ETH. Uh, so currently I'm um, uh, currently I'm uh, working as a postdoc under Deva in uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, so coming straight to the problem, like um, so self supervised the goal of self supervised learning is to learn from a large collection of data um, and to learn it from itself. For example, like uh, global contrastive learning. Um, which tries to learn at uh, image level features while dense contrast learning that uh, tries to learn at a very dense level. So we can see its advantages and disadvantages. Like, so when it comes to the um, global level learning for uh, global contrast learning, it performs high at, uh, for image classification accuracy. Uh, while when we have the dense co contrast learning, it performs good at um, a dense prediction level task like uh, object detection task. In our work, we focus on um, integrating like multiple self-supervised learning approach uh, so that we get like uh, good performance in diverse set of tasks. Uh, so let us come to like a uh, single self-supervised learning at uh, different. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Am I audible now better? Oh, thank you. So let's come to the uh, single self supervised learning for, for the task of um, uh, in uh, binaural sounds data. So here's the data set like um, we try to use, uh, which has like 360 degree video and uh, four binaural phones, um, uh, pairs of binaural phones. So let, let, let us take the first task as a spatial alignment task. So here we try to learn the spatial features of sound. Um, so we frame this task as like uh, find the um, angular difference between the uh, binary uh, sounds and the rotated uh, video. So, and here we use just the contrast uh, cross entropy loss uh, to find the angle. And second task, it comes to uh, the temporal alignment. So here we try to learn the synchronization between the video and audio. So in the video, it's generally taken uh, in the external environment scenario. Uh, so we use like, uh, we make an assumption that uh, sounds and the motion of objects are closely correlated. So we try to align the motion flow and the audio. Uh, third, uh, the task comes to uh, estimating the temporal gap uh, between randomly picked sound segments uh, from a um, long uh, video audio. So these are the three tasks for um, a binaural sound, single cell supervised task. When it comes to image, I show it in the motiv motivation itself, the global contrast learning and the dense contrast learning. So, so here is the overall um, um, uh, work uh, overall uh, picture of our work. So we try to integrate like multiple self supervised learning tasks, and we try to um, propose multi SSL. And once we uh, pre train this multi SSL, then um, we uh, we estimate the performance in diverse set of downstreaming tasks. Okay, so the different multi SSL approaches we use as like first one is a name method where we just uh, train each of the encoder tasks separately and then. Uh, concatenate all those features. We freeze that, and then we attach the uh, corresponding decoder for the each uh, downstreaming task. Then it comes to the multitasking setting, uh, where we we have a single encoder and we have task specific um, heads for uh, each of the n 
tasks and then we train all them all of them together once we have trained we attach the decoder and the third one is the incremental learning we have a base encoder then we um, incrementally learn each of the task and once finally uh, all tasks are learned we use a, a frozen uh, encoder and attach the decoder for the downstream task so let us come to the result like uh, single ssl task you can see that each of the task um, performs good for uh, different uh, downstream tasks so uh, downstream tasks are uh, semantic prediction spatial sound super resolution and video retrieval um, probably i can explain more in uh, detail during my post session um, coming to the um, so here is the result for the multi ssl so the main conclusion here we can see is that the multi ssl performs better than uh, single ssl ones um, uh, and uh, sometimes it performs like as good as the supervised model as well so here we show the uh, results for three different tasks and we have all different combinations as well and ablation study in the main paper and uh, these are the results for the images both the single supervised and uh, the multi ssl and here also we see the uh, similar performance and here also um, multi ssl performs better than single one and also the uh, supervised counterparts Okay, so the main take home message is that multi SSL performs better than uh, single SSL and uh, sometimes even as good as uh, supervised uh, counterparts, um, as uh, which we see in uh, both of the data sets like Omni Audio data set and the uh, ImageNet data set. Uh, and incremental learning was the one that performs good among the, all the three methods. So these are the, okay, uh, that's all I had for today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the final uh, speaker for this session is uh, Saganik. Saganik is going to present the paper, Active Audio View Separation of Dynamic Sound Sources. Are you going to use my Can we go to the present to Yeah. I just go to slideshow. Present. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, hi, I am Sagning Majumdar, and today I'm going to talk about our paper, Active Audio Visual Separation of Dynamic Sound Sources. Done in collaboration with Ziad Alhala and Christian Grauman. I think this is the. I think it's. Can you just share the other desktop? Yeah, I can do that one. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, so audio source separation involves separating a mixed set of sounds into one or more components of interest. This is also called the cocktail party problem, and we as humans try to solve it all the time. In this example, um, man is uh, in a noisy environment, but he's trying to just listen uh, to a speech of interest. While most current separation models are passive, uh, while most uh, current separation models are passive in uh, that they assume access to pre-recorded videos for separation. In active audiovisual source separation, the idea is to let audio and vision guide an active embodied agent's motion to better separate the latent sound playing at a target source. For instance, in this cartoon, 
the man strains his neck to better listen to a sound of interest. Such an active listening agent could be relevant to augmented reality and mobile robot applications, where a user or robot needs to understand a sound source of interest in a busy environment. In this work, we tackle an active separation setting where all sound sources are dynamic or in other words, time varying in nature. In this example, there are three sound sources where one is the target source of interest, which is denoted by SG, and the other two are distractors denoted by SD. The agent needs to move actively while receiving egocentric views and mixed binaural audio from the environment and separate the latent or in other words, monaural audio playing at the target at every step of its motion. Move to here proposed the task of active audiovisual separation with static sources where the monaural audio playing at all sources is periodic and the agent needs to return an estimate of the periodic target at the end of its motion. However, in our new task, all sources are dynamic, which means that not only does the agent hear a new mixture at every step, but it hears every segment of the dynamic target only once in its motion as part of the binaural mixture. To successfully solve the task, the agent needs to separate the complete target waveform. This makes our task both more realistic and challenging. Here we show an example trajectory of our agent from this new task. Not only does, it, does our agent rely on vision and audio to find spots in the environment whose local geometry helps with the separation, it also makes use of the acoustic and semantic similarities in the dynamic audio for improving estimates of past target segments in addition to producing high quality estimate of the most recent target segment. For this example, the predicted monaural is the time of our meeting drew nigh, Ralph called on me first. The most common question, without asking a first, during this time to Miss Reed. I had a great respect and affection for her, and had some reason to believe. With the ground truth monoral is. The time of our meeting drew nigh. Ralph called on me first. The most common question, without asking a first, during this time to Miss Reed. I had a great respect and affection for her, and had some reason to believe. We next show how our model design helps in tackling the challenges of this more realistic and challenging active separation task. Our model is designed as follows. It first uses a passive audio separator, which takes in the mixed audio as input, and along with the target audio category that is to be separated, and predicts the monaural spectrogram at every time step. Next, we use an, a transform memory to kind of aggregate this predicted audio from the current time step and also from the past time step to uh, make an improved prediction. In addition to that, we have a multi-step prediction mechanism in the transform memory, which uh, helps in improving the audio uh, estimates from the past time step. Next, we take this, uh, the current uh, predicted monaural audio and the current predicted binaural audio along with the egocentric view of the agent and feed it to a policy network, which is an RL policy, and we predict the action that the agent needs to take at the current time step. We train these two mod modules in a cyclic fashion uh, using uh, supervised learning for the audio separator and uh, PPO for the PPO, which is an RL algorithm for the active policy. We use a, a, a dynamic separation reward, which is a dense reward for training the, the active policy. Uh, here is our experimental setup. Uh, so our episode is specified as follows. We have K different dynamic monoral sources of different categories. And among them, one is the target. Uh, the, uh, along with that, we also specify the target audio type and the time budget for the agent. Our action space consists of the move forward, turn left and turn right actions. And for, the, uh, for running our experiments, we use the 3D uh, matter for 3D dataset along with the uh, sound spaces audiovisual simulation platform. We compare against different kinds of models. Uh, the, a few of them are the stand in, like heuristical models, which just stand in place and just rotate or like just hold the initial pose and try to separate. A few others just try to remain close to the target and survey the area. And the, uh, the most important model that we compare against is the previous state of the art for static source separation, which is the move to here model. We see that on both the heard and unheard sound settings, our model is able to outperform uh, both the, the heuristical agents and the state-of-the-art move-to-year model by a large margin. 
in addition to that our uh, model is able to improve uh, past estimates uh, through time using the multi step prediction uh, yeah this is like another result that we see yeah so for more questions you can check out the project page or reach out to us uh, using the email thank you okay let's uh, thank this group of uh, papers and thank all invited paper talks so I think for the sake of time, please reach out to them for any questions. And uh, Andrew is going to invite uh, introduce the next one. Great, thanks. So the the last. Hi, everybody. Hi everybody, um, my name is Hilde Kühne. I'm professor at the Goethe University Frankfurt and affiliate professor at MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. And today I want to talk a bit about multimodal learning for video understanding.
to get started, um, let's actually first think a bit about what video things that are technically dealing more with image related problems like semantic segmentation, object detection, post detection. Uh, we could imagine an intermediate range where people want to do, for example, tracking um, on objects or on posts, um, representation learning, multi object tracking, action classification, and so on. And then on the far end of the spectrum, uh, we would have high level temporal tasks such as temporal action detection, spatial temporal action detection, temporal action segmentation, and things like activity understanding, reasoning and other problems. And um, given the spectrum, you could imagine that um, what's kind of like differentiating those things is the number of frames that need to be considered for each task. So um, on one side, we are more on image based um, kind of like recognition side, where um, we can actually deal with many problems um, by just annotating enough data versus uh, when we are on the other side of the spectrum where we have long range temporal relations to consider, it might get a bit tricky because here um, we have a lot more variation that we need to capture. And in fact, we have um, much less data and as well much less annotations um, just because um, long range temporal video data is still kind of like tricky to get. And um, annotations are also very hard to acquire and very cost intensive, obviously. So um, with this kind of like problem setting, if we want to scale up, especially here on the further end of kind of like temporal analysis of videos, um, we need to kind of like think a bit out of the box. And obviously we cannot handle this with annotations, so we need to get away from annotations. And one way to get away from annotations, and this is what I want to talk about for the rest of the workshop, is actually zero shot learning. And um, in the technical sense, zero shot learning means um, problem setup in machining, where you assume that at test time, you observe samples from classes that you have not seen during training. And um, just to be 100% clear, this is technically not true for the setting that we have here. Um, because um, technically we just pull from a large amount of data, but uh, we actually did a bit of analysis. And in most cases, um, samples from the classes that we are looking at during testing are to some extent available in the training data. And therefore I want to propose a bit of a relaxed definition, at least for the next 25 minutes, um, which means that when I talk about multimodal zero shot learning, I mainly mean that we want to classify data without um, having trained on respective test data sets. And um, technically, the long term goal is that we mainly want to allow for classification without the need for annotation. So as long as those two kind of like are fixed, um, we should be fine. And just to give you an idea of the setup that I'm, I'm dealing with, or that we are usually dealing with, the idea is that we train on a large number of video data um, that come with audio, video, and text, for example, like how 100 million data set, and then um, test on respective downstream data sets, like you could do MSR, VTT, mining YouTube, and cross-task, um, but without finding fine tuning on this data. So we really just use how to 100 million um, trained model and see how well we do on those um, unknown data sets or unseen data sets. Um, the way we do this in general is um, that technically all we want to do is we want to learn an embedding space. And we want this embedding space to have certain properties. Um, first, um, obviously, we want to be able to project different modalities, like for example, text and vision, into um, this joint embedding space so that they all live in one embedding space. Um, but obviously, we don't want to do this just at random, um, but we want to do it in a way that the things that are semantically related, like for example, text describing um, marinating chicken and respective um, visual representations or audio representations are close together in our embedding space. And um, the things that have nothing to do with each other are technically far apart. 
And the reason we want to do this is um, because if we have such an embedding space, we can do pretty cool stuff. Um, so first we can do zero shot retrieval because we can just project, um, for example, a text query into our embedding space and then just check for the closest visual representations. Um, but related to this task, we can also kind of like reframe it a bit and do zero shot classification. And in this case, we just assume that we have a semantically meaningful for class label, uh, which is at the end of the day just text that we can project into the embedding space and then, for example, find um, the video that's closest by. <clears throat> And um, when we can do zero shot classification, then technically we can also do zero shot temporal detection and segmentation, because this just means that we need to um, play this game for every frame or for every segment of the video, and then we kind of like uh, get kind of like a continual um, representation that we can use to detect or segment actions. Um, the way how it works, and I'm pretty sure this has been shown in this workshop um, several times, so I try to keep it short. Um, we mainly do multimodal contrastive learning, which means we assume that we have pairwise features from different modalities, for example, text and video, and um, we mainly want to project them close to each other in embedding space um, if they come from the same source. So meaning they should kind of like capture same content. And if they are kind of like from different sources, we want them to be further apart. And this works for vision, sound, text, um, technically any matching modality. Um, now to the interesting question, how is this um, how is this different from standard self-supervised learning? Because technically, um, the contrastive learning pipeline is pretty much the same. And I want to spend two minutes to actually think about that, because I think it's worth um, to understand the difference here. Um, in self-supervised learning, obviously, you probably all know, um, the idea is that you only have a single modality, like an image, and you augment it in two different ways. And then um, you want to kind of like find similar pairs. Um, but the idea of all this game is that you want to train a backbone on large scale data. Um, so at the end of the day, you want to do representation learning. And for this representation learning, obviously, when you look at the architecture, what you usually do is you mainly focus on the backbone and the projection heads are just thrown away after training. And um, the evaluation methods in this case is um, take the backbone and either fine tuning it, fine tune it on annotated data or do linear probing for classification. Um, but anyway, just take the backbone and do something with it. Now, um, multimodal learning technically is a bit different. Um, first, obviously, uh, with respect to the fact that we are now talking not about a single modality, but two modalities or more. And um, the goal of multimodal learning is um, technically same as self-supervised, you can do pre-training and representation learning. Um, but what you can also now do is actually zero-shot retrieval. And the interesting thing is when you are after zero-shot retrieval, then um, the projection heads are actually the most relevant part of your architecture because those are the ones that will be used for the embedding or for kind of like learning this embedding space. And therefore, in this case, another evaluation can actually focus on retrieval and zero shot tasks. And this is exactly what we are after. So while super self-supervised learning will mainly focus on things that optimize this part of the architecture, in our case, we even kind of like usually fix the backbones for better comparability and try to find ways to learn better projections that actually give us better zero shot and retrieval accuracy. Um, having said that, um, next question is, why do we actually need those zero shot thing at all? Aren't we good with just learning representations? And um, the reason why I would like to, to argue that it's worth looking at those multimodal embedding spaces, especially when you're kind of like interested in video understanding, is actually that um, practically real world video understanding can be a very difficult task. And just to make a point, we have a very great data sets and action recognition, and we have very good architectures that perform very good on even large scale data. Um, but the problem is there is still a kind of like a gap towards real world applications. And um, 
And this kind of like has to do with a set of problems that we have in action classification and video understanding specifically. And those problems is actually that um, technically actions themselves are not very well defined, um, which means that the perception of an action or the label that you get from an annotator usually highly depends on many things like, for example, the duration of the video, um, the expertise of the annotator and so on. And this means that usually if you want to create action data sets, um, your action labels have to be somehow pre-selected or predefined to make sure you get consistent labels. Um, and um, just being able to learn those multimodal embedding spaces would kind of like allow us to get rid of those predefined labels and to start learning without them. Second problem is actually that actions are highly unconstrained. So while um, objects, for example, have a very clear physical outline in the real world, actions can be technically anything that you are doing 24 seven. So when you're sitting on a couch, your action is sitting. When you're lying in bed and sleeping, your action can be sleeping. And um, therefore there is no fix or complete taxonomy for actions. Like we have them, for example, for WordNet or ImageNet. And um, therefore, it's also very hard to come up with a vocabulary that would allow us to capture, for example, your activities 24-7. And um, embedding spaces might actually be a remedy here, as they kind of like just elevate us from the need of having a vocabulary at all. And um, last but not least, um, obviously, we also have the point um, that we will never have enough annotated data to capture kind of like large real world scale. And therefore, embedding spaces are just kind of like an easy annotation free alternative that we could use to, to capture what we want to capture. OK, I hope I made kind of like a solid case for um, embedding spaces. Now let's look at um, how you can actually get there. And the first architecture that we proposed um, that was published on Archive in 2020 and then made it to Interspeech 21 is AVLNet, uh, which is kind of like the vanilla architecture you can think of when you think about um, multimodal embedding spaces. So it's really just kind of like a visual branch, an audio branch, and a text branch. and the idea is to kind of like um, generate features that all have the same dimension and um, take those features from different modalities and project them in a joint space by pulling them close together if they come from the same source and pushing them apart if they are from another source. Um, this is a very fun um, architecture and beside text video retrieval uh, you can do even more funny things like for example audio querying where you can just give either a spoken description or even just a sound or that an object makes like for example sizzling and you will get kind of like back videos where things are frying or you can do a video audio querying where you can have video inputs and you can retrieve audio segments that match those and so on and so on and so on um, but obviously, as it's kind of like a vanilla architecture, it's nice, but we figured out that it has some quirks. And um, one thing that's kind of like not really going along with our idea of having a joint semantic embedding space is the fact that um, for this architecture, we are just training pairwise losses. So um, we are making sure that things from the same modality end up close, to, uh, things from the same source end up close together. But we can, for example, not make sure that everything that's chicken related will end up in one area and everything that's car related will end up in another area. To actually make sure that we get there, we need to put something on top and therefore we thought, okay, um, if we have kind of like spareway stuff, let's kind of like reorganize the space a bit um, in a way that we draw things closer together by simply clustering them. And um, this is the architecture that we proposed at ICCV 21, uh, where we mainly extended the contrastive loss formulation we have seen before by a clustering loss. And um, just to give you an idea, so the upper part of this architecture is what you have seen before. And the lower part is actually how we make sure we learn real semantic embeddings. And to do this, what we do is we just take kind of like the projected feature, and do a mean pooling over all modalities from the same source. So when we have kind of like a batch size of 2000 videos, we will get uh, 2000 triplets, we will get 2000 mean features. We then do actually clustering over those features and from each, and this means that we get a centroid for each input feature. Each, centroid, each mean will belong to a cluster. 
And this centroid will actually be the anchor point then for the single modalities. And um, together with pairwise loss, we will also try to minimize the distance between the single embeddings and the centroid. And by doing that, the hope is that we can actually draw things closer to each other um, when they, for example, have similar either visual representation or audio or text. And um, overall, it turns out that um, this is a very neat idea um, because we can, for example, visualize in TSNE plots that with this um, clustering loss, we get a very nice kind of like um, clusters over time or even continuous stripes over time uh, versus when we don't do clustering, things look a bit more scattered. And um, we can also kind of like make some assumptions about um, what we do. And it turns out that the centroid clustering is actually performing better than just swapping um, label predictions or doing joint pseudo labeling predictions, which has been proposed before. And um, the reasoning why we think it's actually better to have kind of like this drawing things towards a centroid and just predicting um, labels is that um, by defining the centroid, we get some geometrical anchor that things can really group around. Um, some other lessons learned is that um, k-means and synchron clustering technically perform more or less on par. Um, so we went for k-means because it's very easy and neat to integrate, um, but technically just go with whatever is your preferred choice. And um, um, finally, we also showed that um, the resulting system can be used not only for retrieval and classification, um, but also for temporal segmentation. And temporal segmentation, for example, can look like that. Um, so we have here um, some uh, sample from Mining YouTube where we are given a certain number or a certain sequence of actions that we want to retrieve. And um, then the job is to kind of like align the videos with respect to this action ordering. And you can see um, this works very well. And um, this all without ever having seen a single video from Mining YouTube, all just being trained on how to 100 million. So um, that's pretty cool, um, but obviously we want to do better. And um, the way we want to do better is kind of like considering uh, what are the problems that are still left. And technically we have kind of like two things uh, or we had two things that were bugging us all the time. And um, one thing is that technically the, um, the way our architectures were built was that every modality was considered completely separately till the final projection. So there was no way for modalities to actually interact with each other. And um, we have tried several things and nothing worked very well. And um, the next problem we actually had was that um, inputs for those architectures that I showed you always need to have fixed length. And um, this is obviously bad because especially vision and sound can come in different lengths. And we were not really able to accommodate that and just kind of like had um, fixed windows that we sampled over. So meaning we cut off sounds or cut off kind of like videos um, just more or less randomly. And um, the good news is along came uh, transformers. And um, the way we thought we could actually use uh, transformer architectures to help us with those problems is um, not by just putting kind of like cross model layer at the end of everything before projection, um, but actually to kind of like use this um, attention model um, to in, in the lower levels of our architecture to allow features of different modalities as well as themselves to attend each other. And um, the second thing beyond this kind of like attention idea is that um, transformers, especially kind of like the idea of tokens also allows us to process input of any combination and any length. So um, we gain a lot of flexibility here. And then um, to kind of like train that and to keep the flexibility, we propose a combinatorial loss function on top of everything to keep everything more or less stable. So um, to give you kind of like a deeper insight of the architecture that we actually uh, will show at this CVPR. Um, so technically the input is still the same. We have kind of like video, audio and text and um, kind of like uh, extract features. And from the features, we get a set of tokens. And um, but from then we just say, OK, uh, let's just concatenate the tokens. 
So um, the input of our transformer is just kind of like a list of tokens, and we don't give any specific um, knowledge or information which token comes from which modality. We just say, um, let the self-attention handle all that. And the idea is that when we kind of like forward the set of tokens, what will actually happen is within the attention, we will have some uh, weights which will kind of like do self-attention within one modality. We will have other set of weights which will do cross attention and and so on and um, technically we have just used this attention to learn which features on the lower level are relevant either for themselves or across different modalities and after the self attention block we actually split them up again project them and then actually use combinatorial loss to train our embedding space and um, it turns out um, not only that this works very well, so that we are actually kind of like able to improve state of the art numbers, um, but what's more interesting is it actually allows us to look a bit under the hood of our systems and to start um, looking at how modalities interact internally. And um, when we actually look at um, which keys and queries interact with each other, we find that text is actually mainly looking at other text samples, so it's mainly doing self-attention. Um, vision is kind of like attending text features as well as vision features. And audio is a bit out there because audio is also heavily attending text and actually less attending audio or vision features. Um, last one might be quirk because text is technically the ASR transcription of audio. So um, those two signals are very close together. So to a certain extent, it makes sense that audio is mainly attending text because text is just kind of like a different flavor of the audio part. Um, but um, let's say it's very cool to, to at least get an idea of what's kind of like relevant for which interaction. Um, but um, we are curious and we also wanted to go a bit further and understand a bit better um, what we actually do there when we learn those joint multimodal embedding spaces and um, what we actually learn at the end of the day. And um, one way to better understand what's going on under the hood um, is actually grounding. So referential expression grounding is something that has become trendy in the recent years. And the idea is that you're given kind of like a sentence and you need to localize the respective um, referential expression, for example, in image. And technically, we take this idea and extend it towards video um, by looking at spatial temporal grounding for our instructional video data. And spatial temporal grounding mainly means that um, first on the temporal part, we want to find the temporal boundaries of action steps that, we, that are described in our referential expression. <clears throat> And at the second, at the same time, we actually want to figure out the bounding boxes in each frame where the temporal, uh, where we actually kind of like temporarily labeled that. Um, so it's kind of like a challenging task. Um, but the good news is we were not the only ones who thought that this would be a good idea, um, because at the same time as we started or as we actually were uh, finishing our labeling data set, um, a second data set came up, the UCOOK instruction data set. Um, which uh, also provided bounding boxes for, for action grounding in instructional videos, um, but mainly focusing on the spatial part. So not necessarily focusing on the temporal extent, but only spatial. Um, but anyway, a pretty cool data set. And this is actually a um, collaboration between BU and MIT IBM Lab and Brian Russell from Adobe Research, which was published at NURMS 2021. And um, hopefully we will soon in this kind of like sense also release um, our data set that we annotated on grounding YouTube, uh, where we technically followed the same idea. We want to do action grounding with referential expressions in instructional videos, um, with the only difference that we are actually looking for untrimmed spatial temporal grounding. So we provide bounding boxes for a certain period of time and also want you to come up with the right temporal extent of an action and the right spatial extent of an action. Um, 
Having said that, um, obviously you can imagine that this is a pretty decent challenge um, because you once uh, because you actually have to capture two things which are kind of like not necessarily correlated. First, the long temporal range of an action, but also at the same time the single frame spatial bounding boxes. And um, it turns out one architecture that we tried or one flavor that we tried that was actually pretty successful is um, just have two branches responsible for two different different things. Um, one local branch, which is, which is responsible for learning spatial representations, and one global branch, which is actually capturing the start and end frame. So um, just take those two problems and decouple it. And um, it turns out that this is a way that's technically kind of like inspired by um, two systems which are on their own doing either one or the other. Um, but when you combine them, um, you actually get kind of like best of both worlds. So, and the, the reasoning why we think we kind of like get best of both worlds is that technically um, visual information is good at capturing local spatial information, um, but might not be optimal for capturing, for example, start and end of an action, while audio information is actually good at capturing temporal information because the audio signal is very kind of like precise when you have actions that are tied to certain sounds like for example chopping or sizzling and things like that and then technically text can be used in the middle to glue both of them together and um, with that it actually turns out we can actually even achieve pretty decent accuracy even on such a challenging task um, while uh, but what we also see is um, you definitely need to combine those both elements so you cannot go with one alone um, but this is actually a very nice finding. The only question is why should we actually care about grounding? And just to give you one last idea why we think grounding might actually be a good idea is um, one thing that we hope we can actually do with multimodal data is start to learn cross-lingual or multilingual representations, especially for low resource languages where not much text is actually available and kind of like many sources are based on video or audio information. And here we hope that um, multimodal can actually kind of like build a bridge between languages, um, mainly because um, sound may kind of like be different, but objects will always look the same in any language. And therefore, we hope that multimodal information can actually support multimodal data processing here. Okay. Um, Having said that, um, let me actually conclude my talk with some uh, reasoning why I think this is really worth it and why I want to spend my time on this topic. And um, summarize, to summarize, the main reason is um, I actually don't want to have to label any more training data, to be honest. Um, but um, beyond just me being lazy, um, I hope that being able to learn this label free semantic space um, actually will allow us, so people working in video understanding, to work with really large scale data beyond annotation large scale data. And um, also will kind of like free us a bit from those assumptions that we make when we start labeling data. And um, with that, I actually hope that um, this label-free semantic space will allow video understanding to grow a bit beyond the traditional classification setup that we have at the moment. And um, as we have seen here in the workshop, uh, start to explore new topics and applications. And with that, I really want to thank all the people who worked so hard for um, those works to come up, um, the PhD students at MIT, Columbia, UCF, and um, my own Nina and as well as our senior researchers, Jim, Sam, David, and Rogerio. And I thank you for listening. So, uh...
at CMU, uh, and I'll be joining Unit of Medicine uh, starting this fall as an assistant professor. Uh, this talk uh, is going to be about learning to see by listening. This was uh, work that I've done while at, uh, as a PhD student at UC San Diego and uh, some of it as well uh, during my postdoc in Carnegie Mellon. Um, unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to be able to do this talk in person or in Zoom as uh, I'm probably right now still in transit uh, going to CVPR. Um, so uh, if you have any questions about the talk or if you're a student and just uh, want to work in self-supervised learning and multimodal learning, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. I would be happy to chat both in person at the conference or online. So this talk is about audiovisual um, representation learning. Just to motivate this, uh, I will just give you a few examples, right? So here are just six sounds and can you recognize them? Can you uh, try to imagine what the videos would look like as you listening to this sound? If you're like me and many other people, you probably uh, were able to at least identify what was the sound was like, and you could imagine some scenes where this sound would make sense. So the, this natural association between audio and video is prevalent. Um, also, the sounds are uh, can be very distinct of each other, which it can be very informative of um, the visual input. Uh, another characteristic is the fact that all these sounds are uh, represent what's happening right now. Uh, the association between the audio and uh, the visual input uh, is quite immediate. Um, and finally, they are uh, basically everywhere. They are quite abundant, and uh, this association uh, is freely available on any data that uh, any video that you'd be working with. So these examples give you a hint of how we can use uh, audio to learn visual representations. It's by using this natural audiovisual correspondence. In this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, two works that really use this audiovisual correspondence at its core. Um, uh, the first one, it will be on how to learn uh, visual representations using robust learning. Uh, the second one will be on unsupervised visual sound source localization. Unsupervised learning from audio and video is, in fact, a long-standing problem in machine learning, with the earliest papers published uh, in, by Virginia Desa in 1994. In fact, uh, even at the time, uh, the formulation with, with which uh, the problem was posed was uh, very similar. The idea was to uh, really um, uh, uh, learn audio and visual models that could map uh, the inputs to a uh, common representation uh, that is uh, matched in the feature space. Uh, now, uh, for a long time, there was uh, not a lot of progress, but in recent years, with the development of deep learning, uh, this idea uh, surged back, and there has been a variety of different works published in this area uh, using audiovisual correspondence uh, or, or or similar ideas. Uh, for example, using uh, temporal synchronization between audio and video, or even spatial alignment or echolocation. Just make this idea clear. Uh, of how to use audiovisual correspondence. I'm going to just touch on uh, this work a bit since it's my own, but uh, um, a lot of these works kind of uh, use the same type of ideas. Okay, so the, the goal of this uh, project initially was uh, to just learn uh, high quality audio and video models uh, without the use of human annotations and through the use of audiovisual correspondence. So in this work, I introduce a new procedure where the representations are learned by solving two concurrent tasks. For example, from an audio like this one, you can think of a multiple choice task where the network is asked to select what is the correct video. So in this case, uh, the video of the man playing the guitar. Conversely, uh, from a video like this one, the network would be uh, asked to select the corresponding audio clip. To do this, we can train neural network encoders to align the audio and visual representations obtained for corresponding clips, using, for example, the contrastive loss shown here. 
to, to minimize this loss, the posterior should be maximized, which means that the video and the audio representations of the same instance uh, should be as close as possible in this shared feature space, while representations of different instances should be as far as possible. Uh, here I'm representing, representing the features in a sphere because in practice they are L2 normalized. Of course, we can train our models to do anything, but the interesting finding is that by learning to match audio and video, the models uh, learn to group similar videos together, even though they were never told to do so. This slide shows uh, the nearest neighbors obtain, uh, obtained by a model trained with uh, the loss from before. Uh, the first column in each group depicts uh, a random video selected from different categories, also shown there. Uh, and the remaining col columns show the top four retrievals with the closest video representations. As you can see, uh, uh, with uh, these models, uh, can group semantically similar videos effectively, uh, even though they actually look quite different visually. At the time of publication, this work was uh, also outperforming other methods that also rely on audiovisual correspondence uh, for actions like human action recognition. Also, to put these numbers in perspective, I can also uh, we can also compare with fully supervised model that was fully trained on kinetics using uh, human annotations. Uh, and uh, what we can see is that while supervised learning is still ahead, uh, this gap uh, between supervised and self-supervised uh, is uh, closing. And in data sets like HMDB, the performance is already comparable. Now, I was quite excited about the performance of this method, so I set out to uh, improve upon it. Uh, while work on this previous project, I observed that while often correlated, audio and video sometimes are not informative of each other. So see, for example, these two uh, videos. I can ride my bike with... As you can see, people sometimes edit their videos, other times they don't, but the video is naturally silent, like the yoga example. Uh, in these cases, uh, establishing correspondences between the audio and the video clips is impossible, and forcing these correspondences can be detrimental. So uh, in this next project, I developed a robust learning algorithm to tackle these unreliable correspondences. Now, to understand this procedure, you need to take a step back and understand the training dynamics of audiovisual instance discrimination. Suppose that we have an instance of a baseball of a baseball game, as shown here. One question that we can ask is how does the audio affect the video representation? Since we are minimizing this loss, then uh, the answer is given by the partial derivative of the loss with respect to the video representation, which can be written as a weighted sum of all positive and negative audios. Uh, for the positive audio, this indicator function here would become one, which means uh, that the weighted associated with the audio is a positive scalar. This means that the corresponding audio acts as an attraction point for the video representation, which makes sense. More importantly, if this video and the audio representations were to be further apart, then the posterior would be smaller and the attraction force would increase. <clears throat> the opposite happens for negative audios. In this case, the indicator function is zero, which makes the weights associated with these audios to be negative. So the negative audios act as repelling forces for the video representation. And if the negative uh, were to be further apart, then these repelling forces would be smaller. But for negatives that are close together, uh, the repelling force is larger. Again, this makes intuitive sense. So if the models are making larger mistakes, they should just adjust accordingly. However, these updates uh, become problematic when the notion of positive and negatives is not reliable. Let's start with positive pairs. After training an AVID model, I've plotted the histogram of similarity scores between each audio and the corresponding video. The pairs with high similarity tend to be instances where the video and the audio are informative of each other. For example, this case. Relatively clear skies may since the audio and the video representations are close in the feature space, the influence of this positive pair is rather small. Uh, in the top of this table, I'm showing the magnitude of the gradients that are induced by each instance. Here's another example with high similarity. As we get closer to the middle of the distribution, we start to see instances where the correlation is weaker. And for instances at the bottom, uh, at the bottom of this distribution, the audio and the video are uninformative of, his, of each other.
The problem is that since the audio and the visual features are so far in the feature space, the gradients that uh, they produce uh, are significantly larger in magnitude. I call these instances false positives because due to uh, their large gradients, they dominate training, even though their audiovisual correspondences are actually misleading. Now, to see if these examples actually make the models worse, uh, I did an analysis study. I started by artificially injecting uh, faulty positives into a data set by randomly selecting some percentage of the videos and changing the audio to that of a different video. Then I compared two versions of the same model, one that was trained uh, on the noisy data and another that simply ignores the injected faulty positives. And then the models were evaluated on action recognition. As you can see here, as we inject more faulty positives, the performance of the model that uses all the noisy data, the green line, decreases much faster than the model that knows which instances to ignore. This clearly shows that these faulty associations can harm uh, representation learning. Now, of course, in practice, we don't have access, we don't know which instances have weak correspondences, uh, so we have to detect them and effectively reduce their impact. So to do this, uh, I propose an extension of the contrastive uh, learning laws uh, that weighs each instance individually. Ideally, um, this weight should be zero if the instances are faulty and one if not. Now to estimate these weights, uh, we can go back to the audiovisual similarity scores that we saw before. Instances with high similarity should remain untouched, that is with the weight uh, close to one, uh, since they are likely to be good correspondences, and uh, those with low similarity should be downweighted. Uh, this was accomplished by attaching uh, the weights um, to the cumulative distribution of the similarity scores. This is in similar in spirit uh, with works uh, of learning with noisy labels, either by uh, weighting or designing losses that are less affected by outliers. The main technical contribution here is that uh, the realization that once the model is trained by cross-model instance discrimination, um, that uh, we can use the similarity between the two modalities to identify potential faulty correspondences. So uh, how effective is this procedure? Uh, we saw this plot before showing the performance of the AVID model trained on data with injected faulty positives and the performance of the Oracle method that knew beforehand which instances were faulty. After retraining the weighting strategy on this data, the results look like this. Notice that uh, the weighting strategy even outperforms the Oracle, uh, which knows uh, in advance which instances to ignore. The reason is that in practice, large data sets um, that I use to run these experiments already contain faulty, uh, faulty positives, faulty correspondences that were not injected. They were just there all along. And so unlike the Oracle, the weighting strategy is also able to detect and mitigate those cases. Next, uh, we also uh, should take a look at uh, the problem of uh, negative pairs. So consider uh, this video of a guy working out with an Olympic bar. Uh, in this plot, I'm showing a slightly different histogram than the one that I showed before. Here, this is the histogram of similarities between this specific video and the audio of other random clips, so mostly negatives. Now, um, suppose that the video lies somewhere in the feature space. Uh, the majority of the negatives uh, will be from a random instances that have no relation to our video. Their audio representation will be far, uh, and the repelling forces that they generate will be small. On the other hand, um, negatives that are closer to our video are also more semantically related. In fact, in the limit, uh, you'll find many negatives that are from the exact same action class. We call this uh, faulty negatives since ideally we would actually would like to use them as positives because they are from the same class. And the problem is that because they tend to be closer in feature space, then the repelling forces that they are generating are much larger. And so they have also a disproportionately large uh, influence during training. Once again, uh, I conducted an analysis study similar to the one that we saw before to verify that the presence of these uh, negatives is detrimental. So I trained two versions of the AVID model, uh, the standard procedure that uses faulty negatives and the modified AVID procedure that ignores them. I uh, define here faulty negatives uh, as instances that belong to the same class. The results showed that overwhelmingly uh, faulty negatives are indeed quite detrimental.
Of course, in practice, we don't have class information, so we need to detect these false negatives uh, without using these uh, human annotations. To understand how, first note that minimizing this instance discrimination loss, uh, this contrastive loss, is equivalent to minimizing the Kubeck level a Kubeck leveler divergence between the model posterior distribution and the one hot target that flags which one is the positive pair. Uh, this uh, one hot target dictates a strict definition of positives and negatives. In other words, corresponding pairs are positives and thus they have a target value of one, and all other instances are negatives and so they have a target value of zero. However, this does not have to be the case. Instead, um, I generalize this definition of negatives. Uh, by using a soft target distribution over instances. Uh, ideally, instances that are semantically similar in the original video, such as those that belong to the same class, uh, should have higher target values, and unrelated instances should have target values that are closer to Z. Now, to estimate this uh, soft target distribution, we can go back to the histogram of similarities between instances. As we saw before, these scores can give us a good uh, sense of what instances are related to each other. They can be used to define a target distribution as shown here. Under this definition, instances which tend to be similar to the original video, like the two videos of people working out in the gym, uh, are used as weaker negatives uh, or even as positives if this target distribution is evaluated to something close to one. Now, looking more closely at the loss function, we see that both the posterior and the target distributions um, are computed by comparing the base video to the audio of other instances. This means that the target distribution doesn't necessarily contain more information than the posterior of the current model. So as a result, models that are trained under this objective do not improve substantially. Instead, uh, we show that uh, we can leverage other relationships in the data in order to compute a target distribution that is complementary to the posterior. Uh, I won't go into much detail uh, on these alternatives, but it, can, uh, it was shown experimentally that uh, the last one cycle consistent prediction uh, was working better in practice. Now, uh, these are the type of faulty negatives that we can detect with uh, this scoring function. So on the top here, I'm showing examples of base instances, and on the bottom, uh, I'm showing the three most likely faulty negatives that were detected. As you can see, in this case, all instances are from a weather forecasting channel, so that they are indeed faulty negatives. They should actually be used as positives instead. Here's another example, and another, and another, and another. Uh, we do see uh, some detection failures in some cases, but the detection rate was high enough in order to improve uh, representation learning, which is the end goal of this work. See, for example, the case of the retrieval task for action recognition on UCF. The baseline, uh, which is AVID, uh, achieves 75.2% recall. Previously, we saw that weighted AVID, which was tackling the issue of faulty positives, achieved 77.4%. Contrastive learning with soft targets, which tries to address the problem of faulty negatives, achieves 78.1%. Uh, and we can also combine faulty positives and faulty negative detection uh, to further push this number to 79.4. Uh, For example, um, this is much better than what was achieved by uh, prior work uh, that do not uh, fully account for these faulty correspondences. Also in practice, standard data sets uh, that we used in this work are often very well created. And so I would expect uh, these gains to be even larger if applied to real world and curated data. In fact, one uh, type of data where faulty correspondences appear frequently is in videos of daily tasks in egocentric data. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the times the audio and video in these cases are actually very uncorrelated. The exception is when there are interactions that are occurring between uh, human and the and objects while they are performing these daily tasks. Uh, so in actually in a follow-up work, um, which has not been released yet, but it will be soon, so stay tuned. Uh, so in, in this work, we uh, show that uh, by focusing on these moments of interaction, uh, and so uh, try to prevent the use of uh, these faulty correspondences. Uh, this is actually key to learn good representations uh, from egocentric data and for these egocentric related tasks. Big shout out to uh, Imangu Mittal, uh, which was the uh, student leading this project. Uh, 
Okay, so let's now move on to the second part of the talk. Uh, in the first part, the goal was to learn uh, global representations of both the video and the audio uh, that can match to each other. However, in these representations, uh, we cannot uh, locate where the sound is coming from. What are the objects producing the sound? Uh, this second uh, part of the talk will be uh, about just that. How can we localize the sound sources in the video and uh, hopefully being able to do this effectively without using direct supervision for this task? Imagine that you have an image that, for example, could contain multiple objects, could be a complex image um, or a video uh, and the corresponding uh, sound. Uh, the idea is uh, that we should be able to train a model that uh, when given this as input, they should be able to predict uh, what parts of the, of the image are producing uh, the sound. What are the objects that are responsible for that sound? And ideally, we would want to do this without uh, relying on ground truth bounding box annotations or segmentation maps during training. Uh, so this problem is often uh, referred to as unsupervised visual sound localization. Now, um, there's uh, many works that have been trying to uh, uh, develop approaches to this problem. The, and there are uh, several limitations of prior works. Uh, one is uh, that audiovisual correspondence methods, like the one that uh, I presented uh, before, uh, work poorly. And this is uh, simply because the visual representations do not maintain the spatial resolution of the video. New methods try to address some of these problems uh, by using uh, cross model tension before doing audiovisual matching. Uh, this is intuitive, but this presents a paradox because uh, we need to have already accurate localizations in order uh, to learn representations that are able to match the audio to uh, the right regions. Um, and in order to learn those representations, we would be able to already to localize the sound regions. So this is kind of a chicken and the egg problem. Uh, also, uh, this prior work uh, often ignores the fact that most of the audio uh, are often produced by uh, objects. And so we can rely on uh, visual prior that mostly focuses on uh, trying to uh, detect objects in general um, in order to uh, give a strong prior for this task. In this work, we are proposing a method that tries to address these problems. On one hand, we uh, introduce a way of using this object prior. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we propose a new multiple instance contrastive learning objective that uh, really avoids this chicken in the egg problem while still being able to match audio and visual representations with a high spatial resolution. Like before, neural network encoders are used to extract audio and visual representations. However, now we can compute the visual representations for different locations in the image. This could potentially be done using a detection model and ROI pooling, but for simplicity, we just took the output of a convolutional model without global average pooling. Then the audiovisual similarities can be obtained at the different locations to produce the audiovisual localization uh, maps. Now, assuming that the sound source is visible somewhere in the video frame, we can simply align the audio representation with at least one of the local visual representations. This is a multiple instance learning problem where we know that within each bag of visual features, VI here, uh, at least one of the local feature is a positive. That is, it matches with the audio. Hence, uh, we measure the alignment between the sound and the entire video using the maximum similarity to each of the local visual features. Note that because of this max operation, the supervision here is quite sparse, as uh, only one of the visual features participates in the optimization at a time. This is, a, this is unlike traditional correspondence methods that operate on global features, where uh, all the video locations need to be matched to the audio representations, or even uh, it's also not like the current attention-based methods where parts of the frame should match the audio representations. Uh, however, uh, despite its simplicity, we were able to achieve great localization performance on standard benchmarks, uh, benchmark data sets like uh, Flickr SoundNet and VGG sound sources. Here I'm showing the precision of the localization predictions, assuming an IOU threshold of 50% for three different methods. Our method uh, that I just described before is in red. The traditional contrastive learning approaches 
that operate on global features is shown in green. Uh, and an alternative method is shown in blue that maintains a high spatial resolution, like our method, uh, but it uses, um, uh, but pulls the localized audiovisual similarity scores by averaging instead of using the max operation. Hence, all features uh, would also need to be matched with the audio. As can be seen here, the impact of this change on localization performance is quite large. We also show that objects uh, form a strong prior for visual sound localization, as most sounds in nature are produced by objects. These object priors can in principle be obtained from an image alone, as they are uh, not meant to identify sounding objects, they are only meant to identify objects in general. Fortunately, we can leverage existing pre-trained models for either object classification or object detection uh, in order to achieve this without needing to collect extra supervision for the localization of specific sound sources or even without uh, training any other models. We can just use the pre-existing pre-trained models. Uh, at test time, uh, we can then merge these object-guided localization uh, maps with audiovisual localization um, simply by uh, weighted average. Here's a local, the localization performance of a model using varying weighting factors uh, on two data sets, Flickr SoundNet and VGG sound sources. This can be seen, even though object guided localization does not even use the audio information, it can achieve performance that is on par with audio visual localization alone. However, uh, this object bias should actually only be seen as a prior since uh, we can achieve optimal performance by incorporating uh, further evidence from the audiovisual localization. That means for intermediate values of alpha. Also, comparing to the full method, uh, comparing our full method to the current state of the art, we also see impressive gains. Interestingly, we found that object guided localization alone uh, already outperforms prior work. Again, this is surprising since object guided localization does not even use audio in its prediction, showing again the value of uh, an object prior. Uh, here's also a couple of examples of the model in action. The first column here are the ground truth annotations from several humans for the location of the sound source in the video. Uh, the second column is the object prior. The third column is audiovisual localization map. In the fourth column, is the final merged result. Uh, as you can see, all methods were capable of finding the sound sources, but the final merge prediction displays slightly uh, more accurate results. Uh, now, despite these outstanding results, we found several limitations in our work, which uh, also applies to most of existing work. We see that models can easily overfit when uh, trained on audiovisual localization, even with large datasets. And as a result, early stopping becomes a necessary procedure to obtain good results. This is problematic since on one hand, uh, we are not able to fully benefit from scaling up these methods. On the other hand, early stopping defeats the purpose of unsupervised localization altogether since we need to uh, a fully annotated evaluation data set in order to track performance. Second, uh, we found that our method suffers from high false positive rates. That is, uh, it can easily hallucinate the presence of sounding objects, even when none are present. However, uh, current evaluation protocols ignore completely these false positive rates, as all test samples are assumed to contain visible sound sources. This is, of course, unrealistic, and better evaluation protocols should be developed. Finally, we found that our method also struggles with localizing small sound sources. Uh, in my view, we can tackle this problem by using detection-based models instead, uh, which can, better, can be better pre-trained for providing object priors for objects of all sizes. Uh, in fact, in another follow-up work to this one, uh, which should also come out soon, uh, it's not released yet, uh, we try to address the first two problems. Uh, we uh, propose uh, methods to prevent overfitting and to lower these false positive rates. Uh, so here, a big shout out to uh, Shentong Mo, uh, which has been leading the efforts in these two projects on sound source localization.
once again, if I have not been able to join uh, the workshop uh, and you have questions, comments, or ideas uh, that you want to share, uh, please do reach out. Thanks for listening. I just wanted to thank, wanted to thank all of you uh, for coming. It's been really great to see all of you and, and uh, be here in person with everyone. I want to thank all the organizers, uh, particularly Rohan, Daffy, Marcia, Naong, who have been working behind the scenes today, um, dealing with all sorts of, of technical problems and everything that could possibly come up. And uh, I also want to thank everyone who participated, both the invited talks, but especially the people who submitted uh, big papers for the workshop. I was really excited to so much interesting work. So uh, thanks everyone. I'm excited to interact with you throughout the rest of the week.